Side One, Chernobyl by Frederick Pohl. Copyright 1987 by Frederick Pohl. Narrated by Noah Siegel. This book contains 355 pages on 10 sides. If you would like to skip over any remaining announcements or introductory material, place your cassette player and fast forward until a beep is heard. Stop at that point to hear the beginning of the book. Annotation. Novel based on facts tells what it was like to be in the hell that was Chernobyl. It takes the reader into the lives and homes of the people who were there. One sees the reality of the disaster, the heroic efforts of the rescue workers, the desperate struggles of the aftermath, and the human stories of how it happened and why. 1987. From the book jacket. For Simeon Smin, deputy director, the Chernobyl nuclear power station was a source of great pride. For Leonid Sheranchuk, engineer, it was a place where he could put his vast skills to the best use. For Tamara Sheranchuk, doctor, it was a place where she longed to work in order to be closer to her husband. But on April 26, 1986, Chernobyl forever became someplace very different for these three and for everyone around the world. The explosion at Chernobyl created an international wave of fear, political paralysis in the Soviet government, and a cloud of radiation that drifted across most of Europe. How could it have happened? What will be its long-term effects? And what was it really like to be there, then, in the hell that was Chernobyl? No one is better suited to speculate about what really happened during this dramatic and horrifying crisis than Frederick Pohl, a renowned author, scholar, and lecturer in future studies, Paul has visited the Soviet Union frequently and enjoys that country's respect and interest in this book. Now he has created a novel of stunning dimensions based on carefully researched facts, data, and eyewitness notes. With vivid realism, Paul takes us into the lives, homes, and heartbeats of the people who were there. We see through their eyes the staggering reality of the disaster itself the heroic efforts of rescue workers, the desperate struggles of the aftermath, the human stories of how it happened and why. Through people irrevocably tied to this catastrophe, Paul reveals the heart-wrenching day-to-day impact on personal lives, the unknown future toll on the world and the effect it has already had on Russian political policies. Chernobyl is a moving, sympathetic documentation of ineptitude, terror, courage, and love. It is a work as sweeping, sobering, and as important to us all as John Hersey's Hiroshima and John Bradley's No Place to Hide. Here is Chernobyl before and Chernobyl after. Here is the world before and the world after. And here is human drama at its tragic apex. People suddenly locked in a fierce battle for survival now, and survival in the future. About the author... Editor, futurist, and award-winning writer, Frederick Pohl is the author of more than 30 novels and short story collections, including Gem, Man Plus, and Gateway. He has won six Hugo Awards and two Nebula Awards, among others. In 1982, he was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He lives in Palatine, Illinois. Chernobyl is a work of fiction. A number of actual Soviet and other persons are referred to in the work. Information about these persons is taken from the public record, and none of them appear as active characters in the novel. All those who do appear are fictitious characters. They do not represent real persons. This book is dedicated to the hundreds of men and women whose courage and sacrifice kept a terrible accident from becoming far more terrible still. from the revelation of St. John the Divine. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of the waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. The Ukrainian word for Wormwood is Chernobyl, Chapter 1, Friday, April 25, 1986 
At this time, Simeon Smeen is an active, affable man of 64 years who looks rather like a former heavyweight wrestler. He is short and quite stocky. He smiles often, with the kind of smile that other people instinctively return. He could not be called handsome, partly because he has a strip of smooth, almost glassy skin that extends across the left side of his face from his upper lip to where the back of his neck disappears inside his clothes. Still, there is a sweetness to his expression which makes his male subordinates feel free to speak frankly to him, and which women find attractive. That is one of the reasons his wife, Selena, married him, although at the time of their wedding he was nearly forty years old and she was only nineteen. Another reason is that he was a wounded and decorated war veteran, with special privileges in going to the head of queues and opportunities to buy things in special stores. It was also obvious even then that he was on his way up. He has succeeded well. He is the deputy director of the Chernobyl nuclear power station, which supplies the eastern Ukraine with nearly one quarter of its electrical energy. A party member of 43 years standing, and one who has the privilege from time to time of travel abroad. Selena has been permitted to accompany him out of the country twice. Once it was only to East Germany, but the other time gave her five wonderful days when he was obliged to visit the International Atomic Energy Authority headquarters in the authentically western city of Vienna. Immediately after lunch that day, Smin received the three visitors from South Yemen in the plant's conference room. It was one of the showplaces of the plant, with its snowy white bust of V.I. Lenin gazing challengingly down from one wall, and its deep-piled Armenian rug on the floor. His secretary had set up the long birch table with the things appropriate for distinguished foreign guests, who might, the people in Novosibirsk hoped, order an RBMK-1000 nuclear power plant for their own country. Of course, for political reasons, it would be a long time before they ever got one, but still the nuclear power plant authorities wanted very much to have the mask. There were opened bottles of Pepsi-Cola and Orange Fanta, as well as ashtrays and packets of American Marlboros, and in the little refrigerator under the sideboard were unopened tins of Greek orange juice. There was also a bottle of Stelichnaya vodka in the refrigerator's tiny ice compartment, in case the Yemenis turned out to be more Marxist than Muslim. The Yemenis were escorted in by Smin's secretary, Paraska Kandiba, her lined, lean old face impassive. Their translator trailed behind, deferentially seating himself at the very end of the table only after the men in the white robes were already sitting down. I welcome you to the Chernobyl power station. I apologize for the fact that our director, Comrade Zaglodzian, is unavoidably absent. But he joins me in the hope that your visit here can add to the warm and friendly relations between our two countries, said Smeen in his pleasing tenor voice, and waited for the translator to put that into the language of his visitors. It was the standard speech of hospitality and pride in the power plant. Two sentences at a time, and then a pause for the translator. He went right on with it as his secretary came in with a tray of coffee and small cups and a plate of sweet biscuits, which she handed around among the guests. They sipped and nibbled impassively as they listened to Smin's recitation of the virtues of the Soviet nuclear power system, the unflagging devotion with which they were carrying out the decisions of the 27th Party Congress, and their unfailing success in achieving their planned goals. The speech was nearly all true in what it said, though it said nothing of, for example, the stratagems and shortcuts that made the plan at least technically attainable. Nor did it say explicitly what the other duties were that kept the director from the honored Yemeni guests, which were primarily that there were other guests the director thought more worth cultivating than a bunch of Arabs who chose to be born in the only country on the Arabian Peninsula that didn't have oil. Smin could have given a speech in his sleep. Sometimes he almost did. Normally in such conditions he used the 50% of time devoted to translation to study the visitors, Cubans and East Germans. Angolans and Capuchins, Vietnamese and Poles, and wonder what they made of this immense monument to Soviet science and technology. Of course, many of them had nuclear power generating plants of their own, or at least every expectation of having them soon. What they had, however, were generally pressurized water reactors. What none of the foreign guests had were the RBMK-1000s that powered Chernobyl. 
That particular model was not exported to the fraternal socialist countries. The reactors they got were no doubt good enough to produce electrical power, but they were of little use for other purposes. Of course, who would trust Campuchians or Poles with the capacity to create plutonium? Sometimes Smeen tried to guess what the foreign guests would do if they actually ordered and were allowed to receive RBMK series reactors. Sometimes he thought they would tamely return the spent cores for reprocessing inside the USSR without any unexplained shortages. But he didn't think that often. On this day, he didn't play that game anyway. He had other things on his mind. When the leader of the Yemenis took his turn to respond to the speech of welcome, Smin, nodding in thoughtful appreciation at each translated fragment, took the opportunity to write on a piece of paper, experiment on schedule. He passed it inconspicuously to the secretary when she came in to offer the tinned orange juice to the guests. No one seemed to notice what he had done. The head of the delegation was craning his neck to peer inside the refrigerator as the secretary opened it. He turned to Smin and said, Peut-être un peu de vodka? Mais certainement, cried Smin affably. Et alors? Vous parlez français? Très bien. He waved the secretary off and opened the ice-cold vodka bottle himself, pouring a nearly exact 150 milliliters of vodka for each guest. If any of them noticed that Smeen poured nothing for himself, no one commented. Thereafter, the conversation continued in serviceable, if rather elementary, French on both sides. It went much faster that way. Smeen explained that each of the four reactors that made up the Chernobyl plant was rated at 1,000 megawatts and could be refueled in operation, meaning that they were online far more of the time than most Western models. He passed out glossy prints of the turbine room, the containment shell, the arc-shaped control boards with their four or five technicians always on duty, the bound book of aerial photographs taken during construction that showed the immense power plant as it grew, layer by layer. But why are you showing us only these photographs, asked one of the Yemenis politely. Can we not visit these places in person? But certainly, cried Smin. Of course there is a certain amount of climbing to be done. You don't object to stairs and it will be necessary, purely as a precaution, to wear protective clothing. But we can begin at once. And do it very quickly, he added to himself, because the note the secretary slipped into his palm had said, Yes, it is scheduled to begin at 2 p.m. Chernobyl was not merely a power plant. It was nearly a city. Each RBMK-1000 reactor by itself was immense with its tons of graphite blocks that slowed the neutrons, its nearly 1,700 jacketed steel pipes that carried water through the cores, its drying tanks, where all 1,700 tubes met to wring the droplets of water out of the steam and pass the energy-loaded steam itself onto the turbines, its huge macadam turbine floor, where the engines droned or howled away, it's two feet of steel and six feet of concrete that surrounded each reactor. Insurance against the wholly improbable chance that something, sometime, should go wrong. And there were four of the RBMK-1000s already online in the Chernobyl power station plant. And the plant itself was only one structure in a municipality of storage spaces and workshops and administration offices, and a medical center, and baths for the people who worked there, and cafeterias, and lounges for parties and resting after shifts, and everything else that Smin could imagine, and through begging or bribes managed to obtain, to make Chernobyl perfect. That was the job of the deputy director, and the fact that a goal of perfection was impossible to attain did not keep Smin from continuing to try. Against all odds, in spite of all frustrations, there were plenty of those, starting with the workers themselves. If they did not drink on the job, they absented themselves without permission. If they did not do either, then they all too often drifted away to other jobs as soon as they were trained. In theory, that was not easy to do in the USSR, since no one got a job without a report from his last employer, and employers were supposed to discourage vagabonding of that sort. In practice, people who had worked at Chernobyl were in such demand that even a negative report was disregarded. And those were only the problems of personnel. 
If the workers were somehow placated and even motivated, then there were the problems of materiel. Materials of decent quality were always hard to get, for anything, and Smeen was shameless and tireless in doing what had to be done to find unflawed steel and well-made cables and high-grade cement, and even the best and freshest produce from the private pots of the nearby kohosists to go into the kitchens of the plant's cafeterias. Just weeks before, there had been a story in Literaturna Ukraina that had harshly exposed the sordid history of incompetent people and defective materials. It had been a great embarrassment to Smin's superiors, but in the long run, the story had added force to Smin's own dedicated routine of demanding and urging and shaming, and even when necessary, and it was often necessary, bribing. It was not how Smin would have preferred to do his job, but it was unfortunately the only way sometimes, that the job could be done. Because Smeen was in a hurry, he didn't show the Yemenis everything. He skipped the oil storage rooms, high up over the reactors, where the diesel fuel was kept for the emergency pumps in case of power failure. He gave them only a quick peek through the heavy glass windows at the refueling chamber, where the huge spidery refueling machine crept on its massive tracks from fuel tube to fuel tube as needed lifting out the spent fuel and replacing it with new, while the reactor kept right on generating power. He skipped the red room and the cafeteria and the baths, though he was proud of them all for the proof they gave of his constant concern for the 4,000 men and women who worked at Chernobyl. He did not, of course, allow the visitors in any of the four reactor chambers, though he permitted a quick look, again through the heavy glass port, at number one oldest of Chernobyl's reactors and still pouring out energy. With, he called over the noise of steam and turbines, the best safety and performance record in the USSR. He even let them look at the huge pipes of the water system, because they were in their line of travel anyway. And then they turned away, and the leading Yemeni jumped back as he saw the hissing, spitting, eye-paining flames of the hydrogen burner. What is that thing? I thought atomic power meant you did not have to burn oil. Oh, but it isn't oil, Smeen explained reassuringly. It has nothing to do with the steam, simply a way of getting rid of gases that might otherwise be dangerous. As water goes through the reactor, you see, a little bit each time is broken down into the gases hydrogen and oxygen through radiolysis. We cannot have this in the system, you know. It would be dangerous. So we flare it off here and burn it. Then he let them walk through the turbine room itself, with plugs in their ears and hard hats on their heads, because he knew they would not linger in that painfully noisy place, to get to the control room for reactors one and two. While the interpreter was dealing with their questions for the chief shift engineer, Smeen picked up a phone and checked again. Yes, the comrade guests were already gathering to observe the experiment, which was still on schedule. So, he found, checking his watch, was his tour. He had ten minutes yet to get rid of the Yemenis before going to the main control room, and so he approached them, smiling. The shift engineer was not smiling. He turned away and muttered to Smin, They're asking me about Yuba Kovalevska. Smin sighed and turned to the Yemenis. Have you some questions for me, then? he asked politely. The older Yemeni gazed at him. It was difficult to read the man's expression, but he said only, one has heard stories. Smin kept his smile. What stories are those, he asked, though he knew the answer. There have been reports in your own press, the man said apologetically. He put on spectacles and took a paper out of his pocket. From your magazine, Literaturna Ukraina, is that how you say it? An article which speaks of poor design, of unsafe materials, of bad discipline among the workers. Of course, he added, folding the paper. If one had read such things in the Western press, one would understand they are not to be taken seriously. But in your own journals? Ah, said Smin, nodding. It is what we call glossnists. He used the Russian word and translated quickly. That is to say, candor, frankness, openness. He smiled in a friendly manner. I suppose you are surprised to see such harsh criticism in a Soviet magazine. But you see, there is a new time now. Our general secretary, Mikhail Derbachev, has properly said that we need glasnosts. 
We need to speak openly and honestly and in public about shortcomings and errors of all kinds. Mrs. Kovalevsky's article is an example of this. He shrugged in humorous deprecation. It is very useful to us to be called to account in public for any faults. I will not say it isn't painful, but that is how faults can be found in time to correct them. Sometimes it goes too far, perhaps. A writer like Mrs. Kovalevska hears rumors, and she puts them in the newspaper. Well, it is good that rumors should be aired, so that they can be investigated. But one shouldn't imagine that every word is true. Then this report in Literatura in Ukraine is untrue. Not entirely untrue, Smin conceded, the shift engineer scowling as he hung on every word, trying to follow the French. Certainly some mistakes have been made, but they are being corrected. And furthermore, please note, my dear friends, that these things Mrs. Kovalevska lists in so much detail refer principally to matters of faulty construction and operation. They do not suggest for one moment that there is anything wrong with the RBMK-1000 reactor itself. Our reactors are totally safe. Anyone can understand that this is true from the fact that never in the history of atomic power has the Soviet Union had a nuclear accident of any kind. Ah, said the Yemeni shrewdly. Is that correct? Then what about the accident in Kishtim in 1958? There was no accident in Kishtim in 1958, said Smin positively, and wondered if he was speaking the truth. By the time Smeen had his guests out of doors, it was already 2.20. He had managed to find out from the control room operators that reactor number four was still at full power, so the experiment was not yet ready to begin. That meant he had a little more time. He used it to be a gracious host. See this lake, he said, indicating the lake along whose borders they were walking. It is our cooling pond, six kilometers long, and as you see, a beautiful thing in itself. And it is stocked with fish. Our local sportsmen say the fishing is even better here than in the Pripyat River. Why is that? The younger Yemeni asked politely. Because the water is warmed all through the year. But I see ice in it, the older one said dryly. But this is the Ukraine, Smeen said, smiling. Of course our winters are terribly cold. But even in the worst of the winter... The pond does not freeze over entirely here, and the fish love it. And now, see the trees, the flowers. It is spring. He stopped and gazed up at the towering buildings that housed reactors three and four. From here, he said, you can see how large the Chernobyl power station is. Four operating reactors, each one producing 1,000 megawatts of electrical energy, enough to light an entire city of one million people, and we have already begun construction of two new ones, even larger. When they are finished, we will be able to supply a city of seven million. We don't have any cities of seven million, said the older Yemeni. Also, we don't have any lakes. With such power, you can create all the lakes you wish, Smeen said grandly. Come, I will show you where the new reactors are already being begun. And when they were on the lip of the giant excavation where the core of reactor number five would soon go, busy with excavation equipment and dump trucks carting the soil away, the Yemenis seemed still unsatisfied. These also will be RBMK-1000s, the older one asked. No, no. Each will be even larger, 1,500 megawatts electric rated output. But still graphite reactors, mused the Yemeni. Although some people say that this design is not as good as the pressurized water reactor, like those in the West. Ah, the West, said Smeen good-naturedly. His mood improved since he had seen the dark blue Volga car that would take the Yemenis away, creeping cautiously toward them, among the rumbling trucks and bulldozers. You see, in the first place, the Soviet Union also has pressurized water reactors. We have both kinds in service. Each has its own special advantages. The Americans do not have this variety of choice. All of their nuclear energy comes from the submarine power plants. The Yemeni looked puzzled. What do submarines have to do with it? Smeen smiled. Do you know why the Americans stay with the pressurized water reactors? 
it is because they are trapped in their own historical accidents. They are in a rut. The first power reactors ever built in America were designed for their nuclear submarines. Those had to be of the pressurized water type, since nothing else would work inside the confined space of a submarine. Advanced models like our RBMKs simply cannot be used for submarine engines. So when at last the Americans decided to try to generate utility power with atomic energy, they simply built new and larger submarine engines. The RBMK is quite different, and by different I mean better. For one thing, it is extremely responsive. The American generators, like all pressurized water generators, are only good for baseline power. They are very slow to start and very slow to stop. The RBMK is quick to respond. If there is a sudden need for power, an RBMK can be brought online in less than one hour. And, well, I remind you of safety. Three Mile Island was a pressurized water reactor, you know. If all that is so, said the older Yemeni suddenly, then why have you not shown us reactor number four? Smin shook his head compassionately. Unfortunately, reactor number four is about to be taken out of service for maintenance. So no one is permitted in the area because of some slight risk of radiation exposure, you see. It is a precaution very strictly enforced. You see, in spite of Glossness articles in the newspapers, we really are very cautious. What a pity. But perhaps you could come back tomorrow, when things will be tranquil again. Unfortunately, said the Yemeni glumly, tonight we stay in the Dnipro Hotel in Kiev and fly to Moscow in the morning. What a pity, repeated Smin, who had known that all along. And now your car is here. I hope you have had an interesting visit with us here at the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Station, and I look forward to our meeting again. Smeen was still thinking of the Yemenis when he stopped, simply as a precaution, to make sure the experiment was still ready to go before going up to the main control room. But when he heard what the shift operator had to say, he forgot the Yemenis. Cancelled? Why is it cancelled? What are we going to do with all those people? The shift operator sighed. If you figure that out, please tell me. They are still here. All I know is that the power dispatchers in Kiev say we can't go offline now. I didn't speak to them. You'll have to ask the director. What? No, he isn't here. I think he's in the turbine room below. Smink put the phone down, frowning. Now that was a nuisance. There were almost a dozen observers on hand. They had gathered at Chernobyl from as far away as Leningrad. Power plant managers and representatives of turbine builders and electrical engineers for the single purpose of seeing how the experiment in generating extra power from residual heat and momentum after a reactor was shut down would work. The experiment should be beginning right now, which would mean they would all be getting into their cars and bothering somebody else before dark. But now what? The only person who could answer that was the director, so Smin went looking for him. Smeen was meticulous about making sure his workers dressed for their work and set them a good example by putting on the dosimeter badge and the white cap and coveralls and cloth slippers before he walked into the turbine hall. He also fitted the plugs in his ears. The turbine rooms, particularly the big one that combined the output of reactors three and four, were the noisiest places in the Chernobyl power station. Perhaps they were the noisiest places in the world, Smeen thought, but he welcomed the noise. The scream of the steam in the turbines was good news. It meant that the heat of the dying atoms was spinning the great wheels and magically turning steam into electricity to feed the lights and radios and television sets and elevator motors of a quarter of the Ukrainian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, with enough left over to export electricity to their socialist neighbors in Poland and even Bulgaria and Romania. What was less pleasing, he thought, remembering, was that the Yemenis had asked unpleasant questions. The worst was the one about Kishthim. Was there any truth to the story about Kishthim? People had asked him the same question at the IAEA in Vienna. They hadn't been put off as easily as the Yemenis either. They had even handed him a copy of a book by the renegade Joris Medvedev with a worrying story. It said that in 1958 some nuclear enterprise had gone terribly wrong in Soviet Siberia. Nuclear wastes, or something, had somehow unbelievably attained critical mass. 
They had exploded. Lakes were destroyed. Streams were poisoned. Villages were made uninhabitable. And a whole countryside had become a radioactive waste. Could such a thing be true? Smeen confessed to himself that he did not know. Yet even if that story were true, Smeen thought rebelliously, what he had said, most of what he had said to the Yemeni about such questions, was demonstrably quite true. Soviet nuclear power had never had an accident, at least not one that was related to the nuclear reactors, and certainly not at Chernobyl. Even with the plugs in his ears, the vast roar of the turbines made his head ache. He was glad to see the director, Zaglodzian, at the far end of the room. With him were the chief of the personnel section, Khrenov, and the chief engineer, Varazian, talking with a fourth man. Talking was not the right word. The four men seemed to be having a sort of perverted flirtation, there under the towering half-cylinders of the turbine housings. The three high officials had their heads close together, and the fourth man was thrusting his own face in among them, shouting to be heard over the turbine scream. As Smeen approached, the fourth man broke away, and scowling, walked past Smeen to the door. It was Sheran Chuk, the power station's hydrologist engineer, usually a friendly man, but he gave Smeen only a short nod as he stalked angrily past. An engineering work team, taking readings on turbine number six with checklists in hand, was more agreeable. They all gave Smeen a hand wave of respectful comradeship as he passed, and he returned it, smiling. Khrenov noticed the exchange. Smeen was not surprised. As director of the plant's first section, personnel and security, which was to say the section that reported to the KGB, it was Khrenov's job to notice everything. The director, on the other hand, was scowling. He gestured Smeen to go back and all four of the senior officers exited to the comparative quiet of the hallway outside. As soon as their earplugs were out, Khrenov observed, You are very popular with the workers, Smin. Popularity is not what matters, the director said testily. Have you heard, Smin? What do you think the dispatchers in Kiev are telling us now? The grid needs our power. We can't go offline today. I see, said Smin, understanding. The experiment could be performed only when one of the reactors was being shut down. And the observers? The observers, the director said with a glance at the chief engineer, are now Comrade Varazin's pleasure to look after. He has just volunteered to take care of them. God knows how, the chief engineer said gloomily. Perhaps tomorrow I can give them a little tour of the reactor chambers. None of them are nuclear. This is all interesting to them. I'm sure they'll enjoy it, said Smeen, pleased to learn that he at least was not expected to give up his weekend. He added with a smile, At least we will now be able to overfill our plan for the month of April. Director Zagwodian looked at him speculatively, then allowed himself to return the smile. At least, he corrected, I can now leave to catch my plane. Is there anything you would like me to bring back for you from Moscow? Not that I will have time, really, for shopping. He added quickly, in case Smeen intended to surprise him and actually ask for something. My wife would no doubt have a list, comrade director, Smeen said good-humouredly, but she isn't here. Have you orders for me for your absence? Of course Zaglodian had orders. He ticked them off on his fingers one by one. The cement plant has already delivered 500 tons for the base for reactor number five. Well, naturally, we are not ready. And also I think the cement is not up to quality. See to it, Smin. Of course, comrade director. Smin caught the understanding look from Khrenov. He did not bother to comment. All of them knew that that meant that Smin now had the responsibility of either accepting substandard concrete or perhaps delaying pouring the foundation for the new reactor, which added up to a classical case of a no-win situation. How fortunate for Director Zaglodzian that this weekend he was going hunting outside Moscow, with persons very high in authority. And then there is your man, Sheranchuk, the director grumbled. I saw that he was talking to you, Smeen said cautiously. What did he want? What does he always want? He is not satisfied with our power station, Smeen. He wants to rebore all the valves again. 
Smin nodded. It was understood between them that Ferenczuk, the hydrologist engineer, was Smin's personal protege, which meant that the director had and exercised the right to blame Smin every time the hydrologist annoyed him. If he thinks they need it, he is probably right. Why not let him? Why not let him tear the whole plant down and build a new one? The director fumed. Then he calmed somewhat. You will be in charge while I'm in Moscow, he said. Do what you like. Of course, said Smeen, not pointing out that in matters of running the station, he always did. The director was really only nominally Smeen's superior. That was another thing of Gorbachev's, to put the man who really did the work in the second position, so that he could get on with it, while the putative chief of the project was free to entertain visiting dignitaries, represent the organization in formal meetings, go to receptions. In short, to be a figurehead. Only in this director's case, he seemed to want Smin even to conduct parties of Yemenis around the plant. There is also a soccer game tomorrow, said Khlenov, watching Smin. The director lifted his head loftily. He was a little sparrow-like man. All he needed was the little pointed beard to look exactly like the statue of V.I. Lenin that stood in the plant's courtyard. It seemed that he knew it, for Zaglodzin even stood there exactly the way Lenin stood in all his statues and portraits. Eager, chin thrust forward, hands half reaching for, for whatever it was that Lenin was always trying to grasp, perhaps the world. Perhaps, Smin thought, that was what the director really wanted too, in which case it was not likely that he would ever attain it from his present position as mere head of one single power station, and one that was not even located in the RSFSR at that. So, smiled Zaglodzin, you want your best forward excused from shift duty tonight so we can be fresh for the game? Why not, Khyanov? Still, you'll have to ask Smin here, since I'll be away. And then at last the director remembered the afternoon's visitors. How did it go with the Yemenis, he asked. Smin shrugged. They asked about Yuba Kovalevska's story. They also asked about Kishtim. Nothing happened at Kishtim the director said severely. As to Kovalevska and her disloyal stories, that's why I have to go to Moscow, to reassure our superiors that we are not, after all, totally incompetent here. He gazed at Smin. I hope that is true, he said. Before they parted, the personnel man invited Smin to take a little steam in the plant's baths with him, but Smin declined. I'd better get back to my office, he said. Who knows what's gone wrong while I've been escorting Arabs around? As it turned out, nothing much had. Still, there was at least another centimeter of papers added to the stack on his desk that Paraska had brought in while he was lollygagging around with the Yemenis. There seemed to be nothing more urgent in the new batch than any of the other older urgencies waiting for his attention. But the papers would not sign themselves. Paraska, he called. A cup of tea, if you will and began to lower the stack bit by bit. Acknowledgments of orders for structural steel, replacement bearings, fireproof cables, bricks, tiles, generator parts, window glass, double-thick reinforced glass, flooring, piping, roofing compound. Letters from suppliers regretting that extraordinarily the orders just placed could not be filled on the date specified but every effort would be made to ship a month or three months later. Party directives thick with reminders of the decisions of the 27th Party Congress to increase production, and production figures from the suppliers to show how woefully that was needed. Absentee and lateness reports from Khrenov's first department. Not too bad, those, Smin reflected with some complacency. The Chernobyl nuclear power station was one of the best in the Soviet Union in those respects as in most others. He found the little chit that excused Vladimir Ponomarenko from his duties on the four o'clock shift of the construction brigade at reactor number five, and signed it with a little grin. The Ponomarenkas would all be busy practicing for the next day's football game, and after all, it did no harm to do Khrenov's first apartment a small favor now and then. The tea was cold before he tasted it, but he had gotten through almost a tenth of the papers on his desk. He sifted through the remainder. 
there was still nothing in them that seemed more urgent than any of the other urgencies. He sat back, thinking about the weekend. With any luck at all, he and his wife could get away to spend a little time on the plot of land twenty-five kilometers north, where their dacha had been growing toward reality for nearly a year. How fine that would be when it was finished. It was April now, almost the beginning of May. By July at the latest, all the doors and windows would be in, and in August they could almost certainly occupy at least one of the rooms. By fall, certainly they would be spending weekends there, and the ducks of the Pripyat marshes would learn that Simeon Smin knew how to use a shotgun. He lit one of the Marlboro cigarettes thoughtfully, gazing at the old cartoon he had tacked over his desk. It was from an ancient issue of the humor magazine Crocodile. It showed a bolt the size of a railroad car, and a nut as huge as an apartment building, coming out of a plant labeled Red Star Nut and Bolt Works No. 1, and the caption read, And so in one step we fulfill our plan. It was not, Smeen appreciated, an unfair jibe at Soviet manufacturing customs. His workday was nearly over, and he even thought he might get home on time. He picked up the phone and called his wife to tell her so, but Selena Smin had news for her husband. We won't be going to the dacha. Your mother telephoned, she said. She wants us all to come for dinner tonight. She says you didn't come last night, so at least you can come tonight. Do you know what she meant by that? Smin groaned. He did know, but did not particularly want to say so on the telephone. But that means driving into Kiev and back, he said thinking of the hundred and thirty kilometers each way. No, we can stay over in our room in her flat, and then I can do some shopping in Kiev tomorrow morning, she said. Perhaps we can visit the Dutch on Sunday. Oh, also she says she has a surprise for you. What surprise? She said you'd say that. She said to tell you that if she told you what the surprise was, it wouldn't be a surprise, but it's a big surprise. Smeen surrendered. When he had hung up, he buzzed for his secretary. I want my car tonight, he said, but I'll drive myself. Have Chernavzia bring it around and see that the tank is full. Then he can go home. There was one more thing for Smeen to do before he left the plant. In a way, it too was setting an example. It was a visit to the plant's baths. He undressed in the locker room, and taking a sheet and a towel from the attendant, headed for the showers. There had always been showers in Chernobyl because men who worked with radioactive substances needed them. But these baths were not only new, they were Smin's own. The slate slabs for each man to lie on, the shower heads above, the soap dispensers, those were Smin's. He stretched out, turned the water onto a trickle, and soaped himself. He lay back, bare, the glassy scar exposed for anyone to see if anyone had been there. But he was alone in the shower room. He closed his eyes, listening to the squeals and cries from the women's bath on the other side of the wall. Some of the female workers were playing tag and ducking each other in their pool. He wondered absently if they appreciated the luxurious facilities he had provided for them. But after all, whether they did or not, what was the difference? The extra care showed up in the plant's attendance, and the important thing was the plant. When he had rinsed himself off, he wrapped the sheet around his broad shoulders and headed for the sauna. It was almost time for changing shifts. There were eight or nine men in the steamy sauna. Four husky young men were tossing a knotted towel back and forth. One dropped it and kicked it to another, who rescued it and nodded apologetically to Smin. Don't mind me, Smeen said, recognizing them. Just do the job in the game tomorrow. You can count on it, comrade deputy director, said the big forward, Vladimir Panamarenko, the autumn of the four related players they called the Four Seasons. They were two sets of brothers, and their fathers had been brothers as well. They all had the same surname of Panamarenko. Arkady was spring, a slim, shy, diffident man of twenty-three, just out of his army service, who worked as a pipe fitter in Shed on Chuk's department. But on the football field, he was like a flame. Vasily, summer, was a fireman. 
Vyacheslav Winter, a machinist. All of them were on the midnight shift of the plant except for Autumn, Vladimir, the forward. So you are getting ready to practice for tomorrow's game? Smeen asked as he peered through the steam for a vacant place. He was never entirely sure which of the four seasons he was talking to. They were all strong-featured dark men of medium height, none of them yet thirty. Spring was the quick one, Autumn the one armored in muscle, Smeen reminded himself. But the other two... One of them said, That's right, comrade deputy director. Will you be there? Of course, Smeen said, surprising himself as he realized that after all he might as well. They would not stay in Kiev all day, he hoped, and the game was in the late afternoon, so that the players on the midnight shift could get some sleep. A man on the bench before him threw back the towel over his face and revealed himself as Khrenov, the first apartment man. Enough steam, comrade footballers, he said genially. Now cold showers and then practice. And to Smeen, thank you for excusing Autumn from the shift. Why not, said Smeen, shrugging. Absences for footballers to practice were always approved, for encouragement of sport was a directive for Moscow. The Chernobyl plant was not unusual in that respect. In some places, in fact, it was standard practice to give star athletes good jobs they did not necessarily ever work at at all. It wasn't Smeen's own way, of course, but in this he was willing to make concessions, since there were so many others he refused to make. He moved slightly to get past Khrenov, and the towel slipped off his shoulder. Khrenov didn't get out of his way. He did, Smin thought, a very Khrenov-like thing. When Smin's towel failed to cover him in the baths, most men almost invariably averted their eyes. Not Khrenov. The first department man reached out and thoughtfully touched the line of scar tissue at the back of Smin's neck, like an art collector appraising the patina on an old bronze. He didn't say anything about it, but then that was also Khrenov's way. He just studied the scar carefully every time he saw it, although Smeen was quite certain that the personnel and security man not only knew its exact dimensions, but very likely also knew the serial number of the blazing T-34 army tank in which it had been acquired. Smeen shrugged away from Khrenov's touch. So, he said, to change the subject, Will we win tomorrow, do you think? Of course we will win, Khrenov said with pleasure, and began to explain the ways in which the four seasons would triumph on the football field. Smin heard him out patiently. It was a matter of policy with him to be as cordial as possible with the security man, so that the times when confrontations were necessary would be eased. As Gebez went, Garadot Khrenov wasn't so bad. The men who were the organs of state security came in two main varieties. The ones who wanted you to know who they were, like Khrenov, and the ones who did not. The undercover ones were a nuisance sometimes. But as you could never be entirely sure who they were or what they were looking for, the way to deal with them was simply to guard your tongue and watch your actions all the time. The Khrenov variety was something else. They made themselves conspicuous. They were like the militiaman on the corner whose principal job was not so much to catch violators of the law, but simply by his presence, to remind everyone that the law was watching. It amused Smin to wonder sometimes if KGB training included, for people like Khrenov, lessons in how to look all-wise and sinister. Yet Khrenov interfered less than other organs did in other plants, and his interest in sports, if officially directed, seemed also sincere. The personnel man looked as though he, too, could have been a wrestler at some time. He was shorter even than Smin, and not nearly as solidly built. But he had a driving energy that would have been troublesome in the ring. So, Smin said, to cut off the lecture on football strategy, it should be a good game if the four seasons are in form. Why not let the ones on the midnight shift off an hour or two early, so they can get a little more sleep before the game? Khrenov smiled with pleasure. He said, thank you, I'll tell them, and left to find them at their practice. Smin sat down and closed his eyes, inhaling the steam cautiously through his open mouth. He sat with his mind peacefully empty until he heard someone speak his name. 
When he opened his eyes, he saw that it was his hydrologist engineer. Good evening, comrade plumber Sheranchuk, said Smeen. And how are your sticky pump valves? Is it true that you intend to rebore every fitting in the plant? Only a few at present, comrade Deputy Director Smeen. Sheranchuk said gravely. Yes, of course. You've done all the others already. Smeen chaffed him. Sheranchuk was the newest addition among Chernobyl's senior employees, a stubby, red-headed Ukrainian, rescued from an old peat-fueled steam plant that was about to be decommissioned, and now gratefully lumbered with all of Chernobyl's water circulation problems. There had been plenty. Every valve had come from the factory with only a rough approximation of the right dimensions, and Sheranchuk had been busy regrinding them. Sheranchuk hesitated then glanced toward the door through which Hennef had just left. I suppose, he said, you were aware that Director Zaglordian ordered the automatic pump system turned off this afternoon. Smin frowned. He had not known. But he said, yes, of course, to prepare for our freewheeling experiment. Since that was postponed, the shift chief will certainly turn them back on. I suppose so. Then, I am sorry about this afternoon, Smin. Why? Our director sometimes makes me sulky, too. The important thing is that you get your job done. I will come in tomorrow and check them once again, Sheranchuk promised. Smin nodded. So we will be in good shape for May Day, he said, and added judgmatically, I would say that in general you have done well. He felt the hot air almost searing his lips as he spoke. One of the men had been pouring water on the hot ceramics again, and the steam had made the sauna oppressive. Smeen settled the thick, rough sheet around his shoulders and looked for a cheerful word to sweeten his engineer's mood. A joke? Yes, of course. The one he had heard that morning from one of the turbine men. He said, Tell me, Sheranchuk, do you like Radio Armenia jokes? Here's one. Someone calls into Radio Armenia and asks, what was the first people's democracy? And what was the answer, asked Sheranchuk, already smiling? It was when God created Adam and Eve, and then said to Adam, Now select a wife for yourself. Self. 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 Chapter 2, Friday, April 25th. Leonid Sheranchuk is 42 years old and looks like an ice hockey player, which he was for a time 20 years ago. He has two steel teeth in front as a result. Still, he is a handsome red-haired man. Women are attracted to him. As far as his wife Tamara knows, he does not respond even when their interest is made apparent. But all the same, she wishes they could take their vacations together. She is a doctor on the staff of the hospital in the town of Pripyat itself. The town almost touches the grounds of the power plant, but its facilities are separate. This means that her vacations are at the summer resort of the hospital, 400 kilometers south on a pleasant lake. His are taken at the resort of the power plant on the Black Sea. She would like to be transferred to the medical staff of the power station, so they could be together. But the pay is better there, too, and the summer accommodations much nicer. And the competition for such posts is acute. Still, she knows that they are lucky. They have been in Pipiat for only a few months, since Smeen recruited her husband into this much better post. She is aware that they have a good life. With Sheran Shuk's 300 rubles a month and her 180, they are well to do. Their 16 year old son is a dancer an honor student, and a Komsomol. Sheranchuk himself has a shelf of medals from his ice hockey days, as well as all the diplomas and certificates of merit that made him qualified as a hydrologist engineer in the Chernobyl power station. For he is, after all, not a plumber, nor would he smile at anyone who called him that, or at least not at anyone but Deputy Director Smin. Sheranchuk left Smin in the baths, feeling thoroughly refreshed, the hydrologist engineer decided there was no need to wait until morning to get at some of his paperwork. The evening was young, and his wife would not mind that he was working overtime. 
No one forced Sheran Shuk to do that, least of all Deputy Director Smin. Sheran Shuk imposed it on himself. As a senior engineer, he was scheduled to work management hours, 9 to 5.30 on five days of the week. But he knew he had Smin's trust. He wanted to keep it. And spending an evening at home was less important than making certain that the trust was deserved. So, long after 5.30, Sheran Shuk was back at his desk. In the office he shared with two assistants and the plant sports director, writing notes to himself about what he wanted to do when reactor number four was at last down for maintenance. The experiment in getting extra power from the turbines then did not affect him. What he particularly wanted was to get a look at the inside of the great pump that forced the condensed water back out of the heat exchanger and into the plenum under the core of the reactor. According to the records he had inherited, that pump had been long since dismantled and checked by his predecessor. But Sheran Shuk wanted to see for himself. Going over the files on each component, Sheran Shuk paid particular attention to the delivery dates of the parts. A valve fitting that had arrived at Chernobyl in the first week of any month, for example, had probably been turned out by its factory in the last week of the month previous. That was a warning signal. The last few days of any month were the frenzied corner-cutting days of storming the plan. The days when all shifts went on overtime in a last-ditch effort to meet the month's production goals that determined whether or not the workers would get a monthly bonus. Half of any month's production in a factory might easily come in the last few days of the month. Those were the days when machinists rushed their work and inspectors looked the other way. And the brand new parts that arrived at their destinations might have to go right into the scrap pile because they could not be made to fit. Worse, they might be installed anyway. Of course, the previous head hydrologist engineer at Chernobyl had known that as well as Sheron Shuk. Every part had been calipered for tolerances before it was fitted into place. All the equipment had been taken apart and, when necessary, reground or rebored or simply replaced with new parts. Sheron Shuk knew this. All the same, he wanted to see for himself. With a list of fittings to be checked in his hand, he went to see if Deputy Director Smin had perhaps returned to his office. He was not there. The office was dark, as were most of the other offices he passed. Though not that of the first department. That didn't surprise Sheran Chuk. Khenev's personnel and security people were always somewhere about. He thought about going home, where his wife might by now be wondering what had happened to him, but went up to the main control room for reactors three and four instead. Smin wasn't there either. But Khenev was, smoking a cigarette and chatting with the shift chief about how the football practice had gone. Behind them was the long arced wall of instruments that displayed the condition of every part of the power station's systems. Most of the display, flashing lights, and oscilloscope traces had to do with things that did not much interest Sharon Shuk, but automatically he checked the readings on the water and steam pressure systems. The steam system was normal. The recirculation pumps were operating at normal pressure. All satisfactory enough, except that the pumps were under direct operator's control. The automatic systems were still switched off. Sheran Chuk scowled and looked around. Standing by the door, looking dissatisfied, was an operator Sheran Chuk recognized. The half-Lithuanian one named Kalichenko. When Sheran Chuk asked Kalichenko civilly enough that the automatic systems should not be switched back on, the operator said crossly, How should I know? I'm not on this shift. I'm simply wasting my time standing here. Khrenov looked up sharply, then came to join them. Ah, Kalichenka, he said, ignoring the hydrologist. Are you still here? Where else would I be? This is really too bad. I'm on the midnight shift, and here I've been ordered in early for this experiment that isn't going to take place. When am I supposed to sleep? You could sleep said Khrenov silkily, humorously, in your own bed for a change, instead of spending half the night in some other bed. Sheran Chuk saw that the tall, pale man flushed, as though Khrenov had touched a sensitive point. But it was none of his business. Excuse me, Sheran Chuk said. I was pointing out that the automatic pumping system is still switched off. Yes, yes, said Khrenov. I'm sure the chief engineer is well aware of that. The directives say it should be left on at all times, except for special circumstances. You are very diligent in your work, Khrenov said, his tone admiring. 
But these are special circumstances, you see. Chief Engineer Varazin is in charge. He has decided that at least that part of the experiment, which is to observe how the pumps can be kept in order manually, can be proceeded with at least. Do you understand that? If you have criticisms to make of his procedures, I suggest you make them to him. Shiranchuk gritted his steel teeth. It was not Hrenov's business to lecture the hydrologist engineer on technical matters. It was only a way of reminding Shiranchuk, as well as anyone else around, that the personnel man was well informed on every aspect of the work of the power plant, even if he had nothing to do with running it. Shiranchuk shrugged and kept silent. Hrenov gazed at him affably for a moment, then turned to the shift operator. Now, Kolichenko, he said, since you're not on duty here at the moment... I suggest you get some rest, alone for a change, if you don't mind, so that you will be ready for your regular shift. Sharanchuk did not linger to see how Kalichenko would reply. He turned and left the room. He thought that probably Kalichenko wouldn't respond at all, in spite of the fact that his pale face was turning crimson and his scowl was ferocious. Sharanchuk sympathized with the operator, it was, after all, no business of the personnel man's if Kalichenko was anticipating the privileges of marriage before the actual ceremony with one of the town girls. The question was not so much where Kalichenko slept as whether Hrenov slept at all. Sharanchuk knew the man had been there at six that morning. He seemed always to be in the plant somewhere. Did he have a home? Did he sleep there? Did he perhaps have a cot in his office and take short naps there from time to time? emerging to patrol the plant with those eyes that missed nothing. That was a possibility, but no one outside the first department was likely to know it. With any other boss, there would be a secretary or a file clerk to whisper the boss's secrets to some other secretary, and thus it would become common gossip in the plant. Not with Hrenov. Hrenov was first department. It was called personnel and security. But what it was, of course, was the organs of the state. The secretary to Garodot Khrenov would not whisper to anybody. But if a whisper of any kind came to her ear, Khrenov would certainly hear it within the hour, and by the next morning it would be on a piece of paper in a dossier in a file in Zerzhinska Square, Moscow. As Sheranshuk left the reactor building, jamming into his pocket the list of parts to be checked, he was surprised to see lights on the top floor of the office block. That was where the special reception rooms for important functions were located. Most of all, the dining room for ceremonial occasions. It could mean only one thing, Sheranchuk thought as he showed his pass to the guard at the plant gate. The observers for the experiment had not gone away after all. The chief engineer was stuck with the job of feeding them dinner and keeping them somehow entertained until presumably the weekend was over and reactor number four could at last be shut down for the experiment they had come to watch. He put the visitors out of his mind. Entertaining visiting dignitaries was not among his concerns. Sheranchuk's concerns were pipes, pumps, and valves that circulated water in the Chernobyl power station. There was that much truth to the friendly nickname Smin had given him. Sheranchuk's principal responsibility was plumbing. That is to say, almost everywhere that water flowed in the plant... Sheranchuk was in charge. He did not trouble himself with whatever water flowed in the baths and the toilets and the kitchens. He had assistance to deal with such minor things, and already he had made them understand that they would regret any complaints he received on any such score. Sheranchuk's direct concern was the waters that circulated in and around the generators and the cores. There were two main systems, kept quite separate. One was the flow of water into the plant from the cooling pond at its border, that water was pumped in to condense the steam once it had left the turbines and was pumped out again, now a little warmer, back into the outside pond. There were not many problems with that. The other circuit was more complex and more critical. Its water came out of the condensing tank and was forced by mighty pumps into the plenum under the reactor core and then set via hundreds of narrow pipes through the graphite and uranium of the core itself. There, the heat of the nuclear reaction flashed it into steam. As steam, the pipes converged into drying tanks, where the droplets of water were purged out of the steam, and thence used to turn the huge turbines themselves. Thereafter, the spent and cooler but still very hot steam 
entered the condensation tanks, where the looped pipes from the cooling pond turned it back into liquid water. Not one molecule of that water ever reached the outside world. That system was completely closed, and a good thing for everyone nearby, since in their passage through the core, those molecules of water dissolved out particles of metals from the pipes, and many of those particles were radioactive. Only the radioactively clean waters from the sealed cooling circuit went back into the pond, and sometimes, when it overflowed in spring thaws and autumn rains, into the Pripyat River and the drinking water supplies for millions of Ukrainians as far south as the city of Kiev. Sharonchuk's responsibilities ended with the circulating water systems. His concerns, however, did not. He took Deputy Director Simeon Smin as his model, and what Sharonchuk did was what he thought Smin would have done in the same circumstances. For Sharonchuk admired the Deputy Director more than any other man alive. It was not only that he owed Smin gratitude for rescuing him from a dead-end job on a peat-burning power plant almost at the end of its life. Watching Smin, he had seen how a skillful and determined man could overcome all obstacles and find a way around all problems to make this complicated network of systems called the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Station fulfill its obligations. He had learned a lot from Smin, and not the least thing he had learned was that the whole plant was the concern of everyone who worked in it. It was a fact of life with the RBMK-1000 reactor that it was given to fluctuations in its power output. When they happened, they needed to be controlled. There were three basic ways of doing that. One was to thrust into the mass of uranium and graphite that was the core of the reactor rods of a metal that would soak up neutrons and slow down the reaction. That was the classic time-honored way. More than 40 years before, Enrico Fermi had controlled his first ever nuclear pile in Chicago in just that manner. Another was simply to flood the reactor with additional water to slow it down, or cut down the flow to speed it up. Water, too, soaked up neutrons, and the more of it that was present, the fewer atoms would be fractured to release the heat that made the steam. The third method was more subtle. Inside the thick containment shell of the RBMK, the graphite bricks, fuel rods, and water pipes that comprised the reactor itself were surrounded by an artificial atmosphere composed of two gases, helium and nitrogen. This was done for two reasons. One was that the helium-nitrogen mixture kept out the oxygen of the air, and therefore the hot graphite bricks could not catch fire. The other reason was part of the control system. The gases did not conduct heat in the same degree, so that by adding one or the other, the heat transfer capacity of that atmosphere could be changed, up or down as desired. The reactor would obediently run a little hotter or a little colder, and so the small glitches in performance could be smoothed out. Usually. Of course, no human being could watch the instrument readings carefully enough and calculate the necessary measures fast enough to take the right action every time. It is the same with modern high-performance aircraft. If the pilot takes his hands off the controls of a conventional light plane, the thing will continue to fly itself reasonably well, for a while at least. If he takes his hands off the controls of a modern fighter, it will crash. Even if he stays on the controls, he can't fly the plane by himself. That is simply not possible. Too many things must be done too rapidly, and the human brain doesn't work fast enough to do the job. A computer flies the plane, the pilot only tells the computer what he wants it to do. It was the same with the RBMK. The human operators only told the cybernetic system what they wanted. The built-in computers dealt with the moment-by-moment -moment fluctuations. The operators could read the instruments, and they were wonderfully sensitive devices, most of them imported at vast expense from Western suppliers. But in any emergency, the instant responses would have to come from the computers which meant really that they were the ones upon whom the performance of the entire immense complex depended. Many others could help to make it succeed, but it was only they and the handful of operators in the control room itself who could at any moment make it catastrophically fail. Catastrophically fail. Catastrophically fail. Chapter 3 Friday, April 25th Smin's mother, who has been a widow almost as long as Smin has been alive, 
lives in a four-room flat in an apartment building on the outskirts of Kiev. This causes a lot of talk among her neighbors. The official allowance for housing in the Soviet Union is nine square meters per person. And here this old woman, who does not even have a job, occupies nearly 40. It is true that old Aftasya Smin is a party member from the earliest days. But it is also true that she has taken no active part for many years. So the talk of the neighbors is not about Aftasya's status as a veteran of the Civil War, but about the real reason she has such a fine apartment. It is, her neighbors tell each other wisely, only because her son is in a high position. And in this the neighbors are right. When Smin got to his mother's flat, he discovered that the surprise was really a surprise. It was an American, two Americans in fact, for there was a man and his wife. Young Vasily Smin, who had been complaining for two hours about the prospect of sleeping another night on Babushka's folding army cot, stopped complaining when he saw the American and the American's tall young blonde wife in the tailored canary yellow slacks, and the American's digital watch that told the time not only in Kiev but in Los Angeles as well. Smin saw that his son had fallen in love. He only hoped that Vasily would somehow manage to refrain from offering to buy the watch from the American, who, it turned out, was Smin's second cousin. You remember, Smin's mother crowed, I told you about my cousin Yerim, who went to America in 1923. This is his grandson, and this is his wife. He makes for television films about a black man. The second cousin's name was nothing like Yerim Skaschenko. It was Dean Garfield. But he was still family, family enough to have brought gifts for everyone, although he couldn't have been sure when he left Los Angeles that he would find any particular family members to give gifts to. So they were sort of all-purpose gifts. There was a silver tie clip with a Statue of Liberty on it for Smin, a cashmere sweater for his wife. It was too bad that it was so very tight on her, but apparently it had been cut for an American figure. A pocket calculator for Vasily, a box of liqueur chocolates for everybody, even a wonderfully thick, rich silk scarf which went to Aftasia. Best of all, there was a whole box of videotape cassettes for the whole family, and these were not simply American films which others might have. They were copies of the actual network television program Dean Garfield had actually produced. Number three in the ratings, Garfield modestly announced. What made conversation hard was that Garfield spoke only English, his wife just English and a little Spanish. Neither knew anything of Smin's own Russian, Ukrainian, French, or German. Nor were Vasily's two years of English good enough for more than half of what Dean Garfield and his wife Candace said. Smin's mother had provided for that problem. Aftasia had invited a young Ukrainian couple named Dichuk from the flat just below, both teachers of English in the local schools. Smin could see that they were both a little ill at ease in the presence of a senior party member who drove a black chaika with yellow fog lights, not to mention two actual Americans, and he put himself out to be nice to them. While the young woman was helping Vasily's excited questioning of the glamorous American cousins, Smin chatted easily with the man about the relative merits of the chaika over the Zhiguli, which he praised. The Moskvich, yes, a fine car, but it needs too much work to keep it running and the Volga, which he declared in some ways was almost better than his own. The teacher listened intently, and humbly asked Smin's opinion of the Zaporozhets, which he and his wife had thought of purchasing in a year or two. The Zaporozhets was the cheapest car made in the USSR, but Smin had praise for it, too. After all, he reminded the man, it was Ukraine-made and a very good value for the money. Only be sure you get one that was manufactured early in the month, before they storm, he said. The teacher nodded gratefully for the advice, though he did not need it. After all, what Soviet citizen did not know all about the merits of every Soviet car, even if his best hope of owning one lay somewhere in the 21st century? In any case, Dietschuk discovered, he had lost its means attention. The older man was gazing at his wife, and there was half a smile on his face. For when Siliena Smin got a good look at this blonde California goddess, she had taken the first opportunity to disappear into the flat's tiny lavatory. When she came out, her eyelashes were darker, her lips were redder, and she had even touched herself with the scent Smin had brought back from his last trip to Vienna. 
With affection, Smin realized his wife had decided once and for all to show these Americans that Soviet women did not necessarily have steel teeth and hairy armpits. It pleased Smin to observe that although Dean Garfield did not seem to notice any difference, his beautiful wife immediately did. What Garfield was doing was listening to Vasily's stammering attempts to deal with the pitfalls of the English language. As Smin caught a few words of what his son was saying, he frowned. Excuse me, he said to the teacher, and then to his son, Vasily, I do not know English, but I recognize such words as neutron and uranium. What are you telling our American friends? The boy flushed. I was only explaining to them what you do, father. Yes, that I am involved in the management of a nuclear power plant, of course, but what else are you saying? Oh, our cousin Garfield did not understand how it was possible to control a nuclear reaction. So I explained to him what you taught me, that although most neutrons are released at once, there are very few that take a fraction of a second longer, and it is because of them that there is time to adjust the speed of the reaction. Just as you have told me, Father, did I get it right? Perhaps too right, Smin said dryly. I don't think Garadot Khenov would like you to be explaining nuclear matters to Americans. Go help your grandmother, please. She is getting ready to feed us. So Vasily was drafted to put two tables together and find chairs to go around them, and young Mrs. Dichuk to help the formidable old lady put food on the table. In a few minutes they were all seated, one way or another, still talking. Smin wondered what was going through the Americans' minds. The woman was, after all, very beautiful. She seemed exactly like one of those Western movie stars with their remarkable teeth and the figures of young girls. Well, that seemed to be exactly what she was, to be sure. A movie star, from Hollywood, who no doubt lived in one of those sprawling eight-room or nine-room mansions that clung to mountainsides and looked out over oceans, with no doubt a swimming pool in the immense backyard and two or three huge American cars in the garage. What could she be making of his mother's flat with its paper-thin carpet worn bare, its battered furniture, its walls with the paint chipping off in the corners? He realized with resignation that before long there would be more said on this subject. From his wife, who had been after him all along about his mother's Khrushchev flat, thrown up at great speed thirty years ago and decaying rapidly ever since, without even a telephone. You must realize, Simeon, she would say patiently, again, that you hold a very important position. You should live accordingly. Not Brezhnev style, of course. No one does that anymore. But with dignity, even in your mother's apartment, since we often use it. And it would be no good telling her, again, that the way his mother lived was his mother's own choice, because she would simply point out that old people did not always know what was best for them, after all. Smin debated whether it was worthwhile to try to forestall some of his wife's remarks by explaining to the Americans just what kind of a woman his mother was. It seemed a daunting job, especially with old Aftasia sitting there and listening to every word. In any case, the conversation was going along very well without that. Garfield, through Mrs. Didchuk, was explaining to the whole group just why he and his wife had decided it was better to live in Beverly Hills than Brentwood, although, of course, Beverly Hills was much more expensive. In the middle of it, Garfield broke off to stare more closely at what Aftasia Smin had said on the table. Then he grinned and spoke rapidly to his wife, who laughed and replied. Both were obviously discussing the food. What are they saying? Smin asked the male teacher. Didchuk seemed embarrassed. It's funny, but Mrs. Garfield said... He hesitated. Well, she mentioned that she was surprised there were no dishes of cabbage on the table. Smin laughed. Tell her, please, that cabbage does not agree with my mother. Was that all? Oh, no. The teacher paused, obviously searching for the tactful words. Mr. Garfield was saying to his wife what these foods are. He says that those are bitter herbs, and those biscuits are what he calls matzahs. And this is a real... Pardon me, I don't know the word. It is something like crossover. Oh, my mother is at it again, Smin sighed. This is the time of a Jewish holiday. What, the second night of Passover? Please tell him that we are not religious, but my mother... Tell him nothing of the sort, his mother called, setting down a great tureen of soup. 
Even if our cousin from America doesn't know Hebrew, he's a Jew. I asked him. But it turned out, after a good deal of talk back and forth, that although Dean Garfield really enjoyed the Passover ritual, he said he was not much more of a practicing Jew than Smin himself. In fact, was something called a Unitarian, because his wife had been something called Methodist, and they had wanted a Sunday school to send their children to. And then Smin's mother wanted to hear all about the children. The chicken broth was excellent. Smin's mother boasted she had stood in line an hour to get the chicken. Then the food began. Mushrooms baked in sour cream in individual pots. The meat of the stewed chicken that had made the soup. Meat pies. Sturgeon and jelly. When all that was done, there was fruit compote and small cakes with poppy seed filling. The teachers were too timid to eat much at first, but then there was also Georgian wine and Armenian brandy, and at the end, icy cold vodka. By the time of the brandy, and long before the vodka, the teachers were stuffing themselves, and the Americans, though they ate very little, praised everything immensely and drank enough to make up. They even praised Smin's mother's two table spreads, overlapped to cover the round table that was pressed against the long one to make room for eight persons, and did not comment on the curious selection of kitchen chairs, armchairs, and other sitables that surrounded the tables. They obviously enjoyed impressing these relatives, and others, with their prosperity and the high ratings of Garfield's television show. But actually, Dean Garfield was impressed with his second cousin, too. Director of a nuclear power plant, he said to the female teacher. That's a mighty important job. It is the most important job in the Ukraine, Smin's mother said severely, and Smin demurred. There are a lot of people who would be surprised to hear that, he told her. And then, for the Americans, told them what Chernobyl was like. Four billion watts of electrical energy derived from the smokeless, pollutionless power of fissioning uranium dioxide enough to supply an entire city or run a whole countryside of factories. It turned out that the American cousin had some views on nuclear power. He spoke of San Onofro and Three Mile Island, of earthquake faults and the China Syndrome, of children's birth defects and future leukemias. The teachers gamely translated, though they had to consult each other frequently for some of the terms. Yes, put in Vasily eagerly, almost falling off his seat. As the youngest, he had been given the hassock with pillows piled on top of it. But our reactors are different. There was a report in a scientific journal years ago, I read it in school, which said that in the Soviet Union, the problem of nuclear safety has been solved. No, no, said Smin gently, not solved. It is never solved. It is true that we know the solutions and embody them in our daily practice, but the solution has to be applied again every day, every minute. Forgive me. I don't want to say anything against American practices. He waited politely for translation. Go ahead, smiled his American cousin in his turn, and added something that made Dichuk stammer as he translated. I hate the bastards myself. Smin was slightly startled, but he went on with his remembered facts. In America, he said, it is the human factor that causes nuclear accidents. I mention your Idaho Falls in 1961, where control rods were removed by mistake and three people were killed. In our reactor, the control rods are automatically inserted if anything begins to go wrong. In your Browns Ferry in Alabama in 1975, a man looked for leaks in the shielding. To find them, he used a lighted candle. He set fire to the insulation, and most of the safety systems failed because they lost power. Almost that was a total catastrophe. In your sequoia plant in Tennessee in 1981, more than a quarter of a million liters of radioactive liquid were allowed to leak out. Just a few months ago at Gore, Oklahoma, someone heated a container of nuclear fuel and caused it to explode, killing a worker and injuring a hundred others. And Three Mile Island, well, everyone knows that at Three Mile Island it was nearly a complete meltdown. It was stopped with only minutes to spare. Yes, exactly, nodded Garfield. It is frightening. But all of these are human errors, Cousin Dean. We do not allow human errors to occur. Our workers are not only very highly trained. Smin swallowed, thinking of the Literatura Ukraina report. But Dean Garfield would hardly have seen that. 
They are also taught to maintain vigilance at all times. Nor are they allowed to work if they are not fit. It is true, Cousin Dean, that in America, sometimes the reactor workers use drugs on the job. I've heard that, yes, Garfield conceded. I think it was just security guards and maybe laborers, though, not technicians. You don't have grass here. The teacher had to have that explained, and translated it finally as marijuana. Smin shook his head. But, grinned the American, I suppose now and then somebody does drink a little. Never, Smin declared. No Soviet citizen drinks a little. We drink only very much. Pass me your glass. Though Smin himself did not drink at all, not even the wine, there was plenty for everyone else, and even the two teachers were flushed and smiling. Smin's mother told over and over how the letter from America had reached her only that morning, and she had at once telephoned the hotel and sent a car for the visitors. Vasily Smin explained in detail the great importance of his father's work, and how he himself might someday be a nuclear engineer, or perhaps a helicopter pilot, like his elder brother Nikolai, now already a senior lieutenant. Though no one mentioned exactly what country Lieutenant Nikolai Smin was flying his helicopter in, the Americans told how greatly they had been impressed by Moscow. Immense city, like one huge monument, and Leningrad. Yes, really, certainly properly called the Venice of the North. And how this evening was, all the same, definitely the high spot of their trip. And they all agreed that it was a great pity that contact had been established so late, since the Garfields were scheduled to leave for Tbilisi in the morning. In a relaxed and friendly atmosphere, Dietschuk daringly told a couple of Soviet jokes, his eye on Smin to make sure he was not being indiscreet, including the Radio Armenia one about the definition of a string trio, a Soviet quartet that has just returned from a tour of the West. And Dean Garfield responded with one about Aeroflot stewardesses. In America, the hostesses said, Coffee, tea, or me. And on Aeroflot, they said, White wine, cherry juice, or go off in a corner, comrade, and do it to yourself. But that one, apart from requiring much agitated consultation about the translation, made the woman teacher blush. Smin stole a glance at his watch. After ten, and they were still sitting round the dinner table. At least, he thought comfortably, it had been, what, three or more hours now when he had not had to think about the problems of the Chernobyl nuclear power station. He thought with amused sympathy, a little sympathy and a lot more amusement, of the chief engineer and the personnel man, stuck with trying to get rid of the observers who had no experiment to observe. Not for the first time, he thought that his mother's old-fashioned ways were sometimes a convenience. If there had been a telephone in the house, he would have been tempted to call the plant. Since it was out of the question, he could simply relax. It was not even difficult to keep up a conversation. Having explained America to a Soviet family, Dean Garfield was now explaining the Soviet Union to them. They had already done Leningrad and Moscow, had even, Smin was slightly startled to hear, managed to get tickets to the famous emigre Vladimir Horowitz's once-in-a-lifetime piano recital in Moscow just a few days earlier. And how many Soviet citizens would have given a month's pay for such tickets? But of course, in tourists gave first priority to tourists, who could, after all, have heard him any number of times in America, and in Kiev they had seen any number of 10th century cathedrals, and the bones of the old monks in the Lavra catacombs, and the great golden gate Mussorgsky had made famous with his pictures at an exhibition. In fact, they were staying at the brand new Great Gate Hotel, just across from the gate itself on the street called the Hrishatik. Garfield had funny stories about their pilgrimages. So the guide showed us the footbridge to those beaches, you know, the ones across the river in Kiev, and I told her that in New York, we had not only footbridges to islands in the river, but cable cars. Then she showed us that rainbow arch that's supposed to commemorate, what is it? The joining of Russia and the Ukraine. And I told her that we had one that looked exactly like it in St. Louis, the Gateway Arch. Only it's 200 meters tall, and it has little cars inside it that take you right up to the top. Yes, everything is bigger in America, Aftasia said dryly. What? You're not eating the compote? Don't you like it? Then Smin's son, getting braver about practicing English, 
began telling his cousins about the four great football players on the team of the Chernobyl plant, the Four Seasons. And Dean Garfield responded with stories about his own team, something called the Los Angeles Goats, said Dichuk, although Smin could not quite believe that was the right name. Smin yawned as his son went on explaining other things to the guests, until he saw the way the Americans were studying the glassy scars on his face and neck. From the expressions on their faces, distress and sympathy, he knew just what his son was saying. Smin placed a gentle hand on his son's shoulder and addressed Didshuk. Say for me, please, he said, that Vasily, like all boys, is fascinated by stories about war. Especially he likes to boast about his father's heroic adventures. But in fact I was merely trapped in a tank when it burned. It was more than forty years ago. But you received four medals, his son cried, distressed. And I hope for you nothing more than that you should never be in a position to earn such medals, Smin said firmly. Now whose glass is empty? It was turning into a long evening, and a wearing one after all, with this business of trying to carry on a friendly conversation with new-met relatives through translators. Smin was glad when the talk passed from him. The women were talking among themselves. The young teacher, Mrs. Ditchuk, chatting in English with the glamorous American blonde woman, Mrs. Garfield. Aftasya Smin, on the fringes, asked, So what are you telling her? Why, said Mrs. Ditchuk, flushing with remembered pleasure, just that yesterday, when I went to the store, I saw that they had hundreds of rolls of bathroom paper. Imagine all you could want. So I bought twelve, and the clerk scolded me. Can you imagine, saying there is no need to hoard? From now on there will always be plenty. Do you think that is true? I think, said old Aftasia Smin, that that is not a proper subject to discuss with our guests at the table. Then, her eyes suddenly gleaming, I have something else that is interesting. Will you ask my cousin's wife if she will come with us into my bedroom? There is something I would like to show her. She is at it again, said Smin's wife. Frowning after her mother-in-law, she led the female guests away. I suppose she is, said Smin. And when the women came back, he was confirmed in his opinion by the new way the American blonde looked at Aftasia Smin. Aftasia had been showing off her war wounds again. Well, she had a right. Not every old woman in Kiev had fought bravely in the Civil War, as well as owning a party membership twenty years senior to Smin's own. Surreptitiously, Smin glanced again at his watch past midnight, and he had been up since six. Of course, the next day, he thought idly, would not be very strenuous. The experiment with trying to get power from a turned-off reactor would probably not take place on a Saturday. Perhaps they could even defer it until the director came back. It was his baby, after all, but it was just like the director to conceive the idea and then find important business somewhere else, so that Smin was stuck with the responsibility of carrying it out important business, shooting ducks outside of Moscow, when really if Director Zagwodzin desired to kill a few ducks, there were millions of them in the Pipiat marshes, just north of the plant. But of course it was not the ducks Zagwodzin wanted, it was the company. He was hunting powerful connections more than waterfowl. Smin yawned and eyed the vodka bottle, but it was not yet time for the one drink he allowed himself each day. Can I at least have some tea? He asked his mother, just as the male teacher, Dichuk, said eagerly. Can you imagine? Mr. and Mrs. Garfield say that their home is only a few kilometers from Disneyland. So it was a happy enough evening, and an interesting one for all concerned. It took Smeen's mind off, or nearly off, the problems of Chernobyl, and he forgave his mother for her surprises, even for her stubborn decision at her time in life to decide to observe Jewish holidays again. By the time Vasily was yawning and the old grandmother had dozed off in her seat, it was too late to try to get a taxi. Smin drove his new relatives back to their hotel, with Didchuk along to interpret. Until they had crossed the bridge over the Dnieper River, they were almost alone in the streets of suburban Kiev. The officers in roving militia cars glanced at them as they passed, but few policemen would bother the driver of a black chica with yellow fog lights at any hour. Then, as they approached the center of the city, there was activity, even at this hour. In the main square, 
Army trucks with batteries of floodlights made the scene bright as new banners were hoisted into position for the May Day Parade. We will fulfill our plan, and we demand peace and freedom for the world. As they crossed the square where the great old cathedral stood, Smin said to Didshuk, Tell them that services are held there every Sunday. If one wishes to believe in God, one may. I already have, said Didshuk proudly. They were very pleased to hear it. The May Day Parade would go along the Khrushchev, of course. There was no more famous street in Kiev. They had to dodge around the army trucks to get to the entrance of the Great Gate Hotel. Of course, the hotel doors were locked at that hour. When Dietschuk had roused the doorkeeper to let them in, they all got out of the car and stood for a moment in the chilly April night air. I wish, Candace Garfield said earnestly through Dietschuk's translation, that we had been able to get together earlier, Cousin Simeon. It's really too bad that we have to leave for Tbilisi tomorrow. We have enjoyed this very much. And if you ever come to Beverly Hills... Of course, smiled Smeen gallantly, reaching to put his arms around her. In his hug she was even slimmer than he had thought, and there was a scent of France and America that came from her hair. Ah, well, he said to Tichuk as they drove away, there is simply one more duty call we will have to pay next time we are in California. What a nuisance, isn't it? But now that they were alone... Dietschuk appeared to have remembered that he was in the presence of a deputy director and senior party member, and he did not seem to know how to respond to the pleasantry. By the time Smeen was back in his mother's flat, everyone was asleep. He was careful not to wake his son as he poured himself the 150 milliliter nightcap of brandy that was all he allowed himself any more, and gratefully stretched out next to his gently snoring wife. It had been an interesting evening, if sometimes puzzling, what had Dean Garfield meant when he called his wife a valley girl? And certainly it had been a pleasant ending to a day that had been full of irritating worries. When the doorbell rang and someone knocked heavily at the same time, Smin woke up with a start. It was after three o'clock. Siliena was upright next to him, her face strained. No, no, Smin soothed, not having to ask what had frightened her because he knew not having to reassure her that the bad days when a knock at three in the morning meant only one specific, hopeless thing were over, because she knew that, too. He almost persuaded himself to relax as he listened to the voices outside, until his son burst into the room, a blanket wrapped around him, crying, Papa, it's the militia. They have brought an important message for you. You must go back to Chernobyl at once. Chernobyl at once. Noble at once. Noble at once. Chapter 4 Friday, April 25th Leonid Sheranchuk knows very little of nuclear energy. In this he is like most of the engineers and managers in the Chernobyl power station. Sheranchuk's specialty covers piping, pumps, water, and steam, and his work experience has been confined to that outdated peat-powered plant north of Moscow. For most of the others, their experience has been in coal and oil plants, and what they know is turbines, transformers, and electricity. The mushrooming growth of nuclear power in the Soviet Union has gone faster than the supply of engineers trained in nucleonics can keep up with. Though, of course, the problems of a nuclear power plant are known to be very like the problems of any power plant anywhere. You heat your water into steam, and you turn your steam into electricity. And the specifically nuclear questions they are taught, have been solved at higher levels long ago. All the same, Sheranchuk wishes he knew more. He is even enrolled in an evening course in nucleonics at the local polytechnic, though it will not begin for another month. Meanwhile, he reads texts when he can find time. When Sheranchuk got home, he thought of tackling the books again, but he was really tired. Maybe later, he thought. He ate something instead, with the nine o'clock news broadcast going on unheeded on the television set. His wife had, of course, eaten with their son, Boris, long since, but she sat companionably with him over a glass of wine. Did anything interesting happen at work today, she asked dutifully. No, said Sheranchuk. There was no use telling her about the annoyances with the proposed experiment on reactor number four. She was already too likely to worry about the unknown dangers of nuclear power. Some problems with one of the pumps, but it's all right now. He thought for a moment, and then said, 
The deputy director said, in general, I was doing a good job. In general? It's just his way. He calls me his plumber. Plumber? But she knew how her husband felt about deputy director Smin. Then you won't have to go in tomorrow morning, she asked. Because of your dentist's appointment, I mean. I had forgotten all about my appointment with the dentist, Shiran Shuk confessed. Then, grinning, Do you know what she told me last time? She said it's a shame you keep those stainless steel teeth. Now we can make you much better ones, porcelain, even better than your own, so that the girls will turn and look at you. There's no need to have the girls look at you, Tamata said sharply. Not even just to look, if I don't look back? They look at you enough already, his wife said. She began to clear dishes from the table in silence for a moment, then remembered to tell him about the young girl who had come to her clinic that morning for an abortion. Imagine, Yonya. She was only sixteen years old, no older than Baris. At least our son can't get pregnant. Shiran Chuk smiled. It is not a joke. She is destroying the life inside her, and so young. Shiran Chuk said reasonably, But Tamara, what else would you have her do? At sixteen she is certainly too young to marry, especially to have the care of a baby when she is only a child herself. I could never do such a thing, Tamara insisted. You have never had to, Shiran Chuk said mildly. There was no reason she should. She worked in the clinic and had ample access to such things as diaphragms and sponges. But the look she gave him as she turned to get on with her household chores kept him from saying so. It was not an angry look, but it was definitely an exclusionary one, as if to say, you are a man, what do you know, if not something worse? Sharon Chuk turned off the television set and rummaged through their literary library for the works on nuclear energy he had set himself to go through. He found himself yawning as he opened his books. To help concentrate, he put a magnetis dot tape on the player, and the soft sounds of a Vladimir Vyshinsky satirical song made a background while he tried to study. Tamara Sheranchuk paused to listen. She knew the song. It was nothing out of the ordinary for them to play the tapes of Vyshinsky, or of Alexander Galich, or Bulat Akujava, the balladeers who lived in but not of the Soviet system. Their records were never pressed by Milodzia. Their songs had no official recognition, but were known by heart by nearly every Soviet citizen, passed from hand to hand in the furtively recorded tape cassettes called Magnitis Dat. A little quieter, please, if you will, she asked. The tapes were not illegal, but all the same they were not what you would go out of your way to have your neighbors hear you playing. Still, she had met Sheranchuk at an Akujava concert. It was not in a hall or a stadium, or even in a nightclub. The concert had been out in the birch and pine woods, on a spring night not quite warm enough to be comfortable, and not even dry. Little sprinkles of rain came now and then. Still, there had been more than two hundred people out there in the woods, listening to the Georgian balladeer play his old guitar and sing of trolleybuses and the road to Smolensk. All young, and among them had been this red-haired young man who had come by himself. And when he looked at her, he did not smile. But as the listeners moved around under the trees, trying to stay dry if not warm, she had wound up next to him. She had left the little group she came with, and Sharon Chuk had taken her home. Tamara had gotten a cold from attending that concert, but she had also gotten a husband. In order to be fresh for the morning, when he was determined to get in bright and early, despite the dentist, Sharon Chuk gave up his yawning struggle with his studies and went to bed at ten o'clock. But now sleep did not come. He lay listening to the sounds of his wife, ironing Boris's white school shirt for the morning, with the sound of pop music from the television set faint in the background. And he heard Boris come in from his Komsomol meeting, specially called to plan for their May Day celebration, and head immediately for the refrigerator. Just as he was dozing off, he remembered that he had not checked to see if the automatic pumps had been turned back on after the afternoon's aborted experiment. The experiment was not his business. The pumps, however, were. He thought for a moment, then rolled over on his left side, with his elbow under the goose-down pillow, curled up like a fetus in the position that always meant comfort and sleep to him. 
The duty engineers would certainly have restored the pump's operation, he reassured himself. There was no point in lying awake and worrying. He tried to think of pleasant things. Of Tamara in the next room, for instance. He thought of calling her to bed. Perhaps they could make love. And that would make him sleepy. But there was the boy, no doubt eating an apple at the table with his books spread out all around him, studying for his Saturday examination in geometry. If he had thought of it a little earlier, Sheranchuk mused, they could have taken advantage of the boys being out of the house, and it could have been just as it was when they were first married, and in an apartment of their own. He dozed for a moment, and then was wide awake again as someone in another apartment noisily flushed the toilet. He fumbled for the alarm clock and held it in the light from the window. Already after midnight, a new day, and the pumps were still on his mind. Sheranchuk groaned and sat up, his feet on the floor, rubbing his chin. After a moment he sighed, reached for his robe, and went into the living room to call the plant. Tamara passed him in the hall, on her way to the bathroom. What, still awake, she chided. He patted her on the rump affectionately as they passed, but did not stop. But East was already asleep on the couch, and Sheranchuk kept his voice down as he talked to Kowichenka, one of the shift operators. The pumps, he began, and listened in surprise as Kalichenka told him that the freewheeling experiment was, after all, already in progress. Without the director present. But then surely Smin. But no, Smin wasn't there either, and was not missed, Kalichenka said, because apart from small power surges, the experiment was going well. Sheranchuk frowned. What kind of small surges? from six to eleven percent, but that's not small. He listened for a while and then hung up. He opened the refrigerator and poured himself a glass of apple juice. He gazed thoughtfully at his sleeping son as he sipped the juice. It occurred to him that Paris was not likely to wake, and Tomato would probably not yet be asleep in their warm bed. Sheranchuk told himself that it was wrong for him to lose sleep over matters that were someone else's responsibility. He went back to bed, Tomato was already asleep on her side of the bed, and Sheranchuk put his arm around her experimentally. She made a faint, agreeable noise, but then turned away. Ah, oh, well. He turned over and tried to sleep. Half an hour later he sighed, got up and began to dress. At one o'clock he was down on the cold street, for there was no point in being awake at home, worrying about the plant when he could just as well be awake and worrying about it on the scene. He was almost alone at this hour. The trolley buses long since stopped for the night, only an occasional lighted window in the apartment buildings. There was a scent of lilacs in the spring night air. In a way, Sheranchuk was pleased to be a part of the work at the power plant at such odd hours. It reminded him of the special importance of what they did. All over the country, factories had long since shut down, People were turning off their lights and TV sets. Electrical demand was dropping minute by minute. Oil-powered turbine plants would be ceasing operations for the night. Coal and peat steam plants would be banking their fires. The hydroelectric generators would be slowing as the sluices were closed to preserve the heads of water behind the huge dams. But Chernobyl went on. Nuclear power was baseline power. You kept it going. It was a warm night with a few clouds among the stars overhead as he walked through the silent streets of Pripyat. He wondered why Smin was not on hand this night. True, the deputy director made a policy of leaving day-to-day -day operations to the people in charge of them. It was nevertheless also true that Smin had a habit of turning up when and where he was needed. He was a good man. Sheranchuk thought of the conversation in the sauna. When Smin had readjusted the sheet around himself, Sheranchuk could see the wide, pale, almost glistening burn scars that went from the left side of his face clear down his back. They were from the great patriotic war, Sheranchuk knew, but just how Smin had received them he never said. Sheranchuk wondered what it was like to be in a war. He was an infant in the great patriotic war. His own army service had been in peacetime. A general sort of peace at least, not counting a few skirmishes along the Amur with the Chinese. But Sheranchuk had been 3,000 kilometers away from any fighting. Sheranchuk's little flat was three kilometers from the plant. 
But this night luck was with him. An ambulance moved slowly past, and at his hail it stopped and gave him a lift. Sharon Shuk half recognized the doctor as a colleague of Tamada's, and the man knew who Sharon Shuk was as soon as he gave his name. He had just had a call to attend a little girl who had swallowed something she shouldn't have, he explained. Yes, yes, the child was quite all right, only a little sick from having her stomach pumped out. And he was now on his way back to the clinic. But there was no real hurry, and he was glad to go a couple of minutes out of his way for Tamara Shiranchuk's husband. The ambulance circled around a man on a bicycle to take the engineer to the plant fence. He thanked the doctor and got out, fumbling for his papers as he watched the ambulance slowly start away. Although on the other side of the fence, the Chernobyl nuclear power station was almost as brightly lighted as in daytime, on this side it was a peaceful middle-of-the-night scene. The only things moving were the ambulance, the bicyclist, and some early rising health faddist, it seemed, walking with great arm-swinging strides along the road, and not even glancing at Sheran Shuk or the gate guard. The funny thing was, Sheran Shuk discovered, that now that he was actually at the plant, he was beginning to feel quite drowsy at last. He could turn around and go back to bed easily enough. He smiled to himself, his mind made up. No, he was this far, he would go in and see for himself just what they were doing with reactor number four. He was actually displaying his paprushka to the gate guard when the world changed around him. There was a sudden orange-white flare of light, a flower of flame overhead, the shattering, hurtful sound of a vast explosion. In God's name, Sheranchuk cried clutching at the guard's arm as the two of them stared up in horror. The noise did not stop. A siren screamed inside one of the buildings. There was a distant sound of men shouting. But this is quite impossible, the guard bawled accusingly in Sheranchuk's ear. Sheranchuk's mouth was open as he stared up. The great ball of bright flame was floating away and diminishing. But behind it was a sullen, growing red glow. To the other noises was added the patter of a shower, no, a downpour. But it was not rain that was falling. It was bits of stone and brick and metal, pelting down all around them. Yes, Sharon Shuk said dazedly. It is quite impossible. But it had happened. But it had happened. But it had happened. Chapter 5 Saturday, April 26th the Chernobyl power station contains four units, each of them an RBMK-1000 pressure tube reactor. The RBMK is not the Soviet Union's only nuclear power generator, but it is the favorite. Across the USSR, nearly two dozen such units are installed and operational, and the 1000 series models, each of them rated at 1000 megawatts of electricity, are the largest and newest in operation, though even larger ones are beginning to appear. The fuel is uranium dioxide, which is encased in steel and zirconium tubes and inserted into a huge mass of graphite blocks. The purpose of the graphite is to be a moderator. Nothing is needed to make uranium atoms fission, that is to say, break apart. And when they do that, they produce atomic energy in the form of heat. They do it naturally all the time. That is why uranium is called radioactive. As each atom fissions, it releases neutrons which strike the cores of other atoms and cause them to fission too. However, the naturally released neutrons whisk through so fast that they only rarely cause fission in another atom. They need to be slowed down to make a reaction go at the right speed to be of use to human beings. Graphite, along with a few other materials, has the capacity to moderate or slow down these escaping neutrons, and so in a reactor the speed of the reaction can be controlled. Along with the fuel tubes, the slab of graphite is pierced by nearly 1,700 pipes containing water. As the uranium fissions, it gives off heat. The water carries away this heat, thus preventing a runaway meltdown of the uranium, and also providing the steam that turns the turbines that generate the electricity. Like every other nuclear reactor in the world, the RBMK-1000 is designed to be totally safe. And it is, as long as nothing goes wrong. At ten o'clock that Friday night, Bodan Kalichenko was also trying to get to sleep, under circumstances less favorable than Leonid Sheranchuk's. He was in a bunk in the fire department of the Chernobyl nuclear power station. Kalichenko had borrowed the bunk from a fireman friend. 
well, definitely a fireman, and at least a sort of a friend, named Viskerdis, who was a member of the plant's fire brigade number two. The bunk had been constructed for someone a lot shorter than a man with Lithuanian blood like Kalichenko, or like Viskerdis himself, for that matter. Kalichenko had difficulty in composing himself comfortably in it. It wasn't merely the bunk. It was his job, his boss, his boss's bosses like Hrenov, his girl, his approaching wedding. It was also the fact that before being allowed to get to sleep, he had been wheedled into two hours of cards with the rest of the firemen. Now he was eight rubles, fifty kopecks poorer than he had been that afternoon, and his fiancée, Raya, was sure to find out that he had been gambling again. He pulled the thin, sweaty blanket over his head to shut out the noise from the card game. It didn't work. It made it dark for him, but also hot. It did not keep out the men's voices from the next room, or even the reek of tobacco smoke from the game. It was Kalachenko's pride that he did not at least smoke. In fact, he was quite intolerant of people who did, like his fiancée, except that in her case, it was useful to have her possess at least one vice he did not. It would be particularly valuable after they were married, he thought gloomily. At least that was when he would need it most. The idea of getting married was not all joy for Bordan Kalichenko. Sooner or later, of course. It was what one did. But he was not ready for that sort of surrender, especially since he considered that it was entirely Raya's fault that she had become pregnant. Of course, he reminded himself, when they were married and had a room to themselves in the family's hostel, it would be quite nice to share a bed together every night, at least until the baby came when one room would no longer seem quite enough for the three of them. And even in Pripyat, there was a three-year waiting list for flats. To be sure, first there would be the honeymoon. But even that, Kalachenko told himself sourly, would not be without its drawbacks. Raya was determined to go to the Black Sea. Neither of them had enough standing to get the plant of the Union to get them into one of the special sanatoria, so that meant paying seven rubles a day to some Crimean robber, and lucky if they didn't have six other beds in their room anyway. He pounded the pillow, threw the blanket off, and sat up angrily. How could these other men sleep so soundly here? There were at least half a dozen bunks filled, and gentle snores coming from most of them. From the nearest bunk, not so gentle. Kalichenka knew that the fireman there was the football player they called Summer, the best scorer of the four seasons. Kalichenko was still trying to make up his mind whether it was worthwhile to lie down again when Vizgerdis poked his head in the door. Kalichenko, telephone, he said. When Kalichenko mumbled a question about who would be calling him here, Vizgerdis only looked upward and jerked a thumb toward heaven before returning to his card game. That could mean one of two things, either God himself or the organs, the Gebe. And what in hell could he want? Sure enough, the voice on the other end belonged to the personnel and security chief, Khrenov. Operator Kalichenko, he said. Voice warm and intimate. How nice that you sleep alone for a change. But if you can bring yourself to report to work a bit early, we need you. The thermal output on reactor number four is dropping fast. With pleasure, snarled Kalichenko, looking at the clock. It was not even eleven yet. As he dressed, he helped himself to half a cup of the concentrated tea the firemen kept for times they needed to wake up in a hurry. He pulled his clothes on rapidly. How like Hrenov to seek him out himself, instead of letting the shift chief do it. It was not that Hrenov interfered in the technical work of the power station. Exactly. He was careful always to stay within his own sphere of authority. But where did that sphere end? Kalichenko didn't waste time resenting Hrenov's issuing orders, or in wondering how the personnel man had known where to find him. Of course, Hrenov knew where to find anyone, all the time. What he did resent was Hrenov's continuing nagging little jokes about Kalichenko's relationship with the woman whom he was pledged to marry. Surely that was none of even the Gebe's business. It did not occur to Kalichenko to complain to anyone about Hrenov's actions. Who was there to complain to about the KGB? Vizgerdis took time out from the game to look in on Kalachenko again. What's up, he asked. There's a story that they're doing something strange with the number four reactor tonight. Kalachenko paused as he pulled a boot on. Oh, of course, he said, remembering. 
No, it is nothing strange. Simply a test of a new energy conservation measure. They were friends of a sort. Viskerdis was half Lithuanian, like Kalichenko himself, and so they both stood out as tall and pale among the stubby Slavs, which had made them at least acquaintances. Nevertheless, Kalichenko never forgot that he was an accredited power operator, while Viskerdis was only a fireman. So he said in rough comradeship, a technical matter, nothing important. But, he reflected, the trouble was that when something like that was going on, they would be busy all night. That was a nuisance. Normally, Kalichenko actually preferred night duty. After all, the Chernobyl power plant pretty well ran itself. All the operators drowsed off from time to time on the midnight shift. Oh, they were careful to see that there was always someone watching the boards and listening for the telephone in case of any messages from the load dispatcher in Kiev. But really, there was not that much to do at night, when the bosses were all tucked away. But tonight would be different, he thought glumly. Reluctantly, he left the fire department's comfortable little quarters, waving thanks to Viskerdis, already back at the card table. The power plant was not quiet. It was never that, with the turbine scream always in everyone's ears wherever they were in the structures. But it was almost deserted. There were hardly more than a hundred people anywhere on the vast expanse at this time of night. Construction had stopped for the weekend, and the three thousand workers who swarmed around the plant in the daylight hours were all back in their homes. When Kalachenko got to the control room for reactors three and four, it did not look deserted. It was full. The four to midnight shift was still there. So were some of those who would take over at twelve, though it was only eleven thirty by the big clock. And so was Khrenov, gazing thoughtfully at Kalichenko as he came in. And so, for a wonder, was the chief plant engineer, Vitaly Varazin. The security chief gave him one of those intimate, understanding looks. Are you just out of bed then, Kalichenko? he asked. It was his way of showing he was in a good humor. But what was he in a good humor about? Did you also manage this time to get a little sleep? With someone like, say, Smin, Kalichenko would have managed some sort of retort to the effect that it was none of anyone's business whom he slept with, or when. Not with Khenov. In a quite civil tone, Kalichenko said, Thank you, yes. He did not prolong the conversation. He relieved the other operator and took his seat before the big board frowning as he saw that the main pumps were still disconnected. He called to the shift chief. Shouldn't we turn these on again? It was Chief Plant Engineer Varazin who answered. Not at all, Kalichenko. We've been allowed to take number four offline after all, so now we are able to proceed with the planned experiment. And Khrenov, standing behind Kalichenko, said pleasantly, Aren't you pleased? Kalichenko didn't answer. He didn't have to because two more men were coming into the main control room. They were strangers to Kalichenko, but obviously not to Khrenov, who turned away at once to greet them. Kalichenko scowled at the board. The best things about his job were that there was so little really to do, and that little could be done in comfort, without people standing around to watch you. This night was all different. Another stranger had just come hurrying in, looking as rumpled and sleepy-eyed as the first two. The shift chief whispered to Kalichenko that they were observers, from the turbine factory, from other power stations. But whoever they were, they were not welcome to Kalichenko. Nor was Khrenov, who certainly had no business being present at this purely technical matter. As for chief plant engineer Varazian, well, certainly the man had every right to be anywhere on the plant he chose at any time. Still, Kalichenko had never before seen him in the control room after midnight before. With all these people present, there would be no good chance to disappear for half an hour or so for a little rest from his duties. Both Khrenov and the chief engineer looked freshly washed and shaved, and humorously apologetic to their guests for getting them out of bed at this uncultured hour. Still, now you can see how hard we work here at Chernobyl, Varazin said affably. In any case, you're just in time. We've already begun to produce power on reactor number four. Excellent, said one of the visitors politely, glancing around. And the director and deputy director? The director has left the entire matter in the hands of chief plant engineer Varazian. Khrenov smiled. As to Smin, I tried to call him, but he is off on some private errand. 
so when they come into work on Monday, we will be able to give them both a pleasant surprise. Exactly, Varazin agreed, rubbing his hands together. Now, as designated test leader, I must give a briefing. He stepped toward the board and raised his voice. May I have your attention, please? As provided by the regulations, it is my duty to brief you all on the experiment we are conducting. But don't stop what you are doing. Continue to reduce the power. We don't want to be here all night. Kolichenko listened with half an ear. Most of his attention was on the tricky business of lowering the temperature of reactor number four. Though what the chief engineer was saying was certainly interesting. Kolichenko almost forgot to be sleepy as he heard the plan. The basic intention of this experiment, Varazin announced, was to see if useful power could be generated from the heat usually wasted while a nuclear reactor was down for maintenance. The reactor never stopped being hot, of course. It never would until at last the plant was finally decommissioned, somewhere in the next century, and probably not for some time even then. But it was not the practice to try to use that heat while the reactor was being serviced. Now perhaps Chernobyl could lead the way to new practices. By the time he got to the new practices, more of the observers were drifting in, looking sleepy. Varazin nodded affably to them and added, This is how we will lead the way for our colleagues all over the Soviet Union. Also, he went on, looking serious, these measures could be of great importance under catastrophic conditions. They could ensure a steady supply of power to keep our operations stable until, for example, the auxiliary diesels could be started. Are there any questions? The shift chief raised his hand. I do not quite understand what catastrophic conditions we are preparing for, Vitaly Alexandrovich, he called. Who can say, smiled the chief engineer. A very bad storm, an earthquake, or, he frowned meaningfully at them, a sudden nuclear attack from our enemies, perhaps. Ah, said the shift chief, enlightened. Of course. But there is still a question in my mind. Why don't we simply shut down the reactor instead of trying to lower the output? Because, said the chief engineer severely, we must be quite sure. We will do this test a number of times, keeping careful record of the results each time. It is a matter of safety, after all, and we can't be too careful in a matter of the safety of the Chernobyl power plant. Kolachenka groaned silently. A number of times. They would be at this all night and likely enough well into the Saturday morning shift, too, the way things were going. With resignation, he bent to his work. The normal night shift in the control room was only half a dozen men, just a skeleton crew to keep things going. There was not much need for electrical power in the late night hours in the Soviet Union. Good Soviet citizens went to bed at night so they could rise, bright-eyed and refreshed, for the next morning's work. Tonight was different. Besides Kolachenko's own crew, there were four men left over from the late evening shift, looking oppressed at being kept on overtime, for which they were not likely to be paid, plus the observers, the chief engineer, and the personnel man, Khrenov. To lower the power on a reactor like the RBMK is not like turning down the gain on a radio set. To shut it off entirely is much easier. You simply thrust home all the boron rods, 211 of them, piercing the graphite core from top and bottom and in all its parts. The element boron is poisonous to nuclear reactions. Boron soaks up neutrons. They cannot go on to make another atom fission, and so the reaction stops. That is the easy way. To slow the nuclear reactor down is another matter entirely. There are three separate ways to do it. First, for a rough approximation, you shove a few additional rods into the core. Not too many. You don't want the reaction to die. Once the reactor stops, waste products begin to accumulate. The element xenon is the worst of them, since it is a worse poison to nuclear reactions even than boron. Then it is impossible to start again until weeks have passed and the xenon has decayed away. Then there is a certain measure of fine control that can be attained by varying the mixture of gases in the sealed space surrounding the core. Some of the gases soak up neutrons in the same way that boron does, though not as strongly. To slow the reaction a bit, you simply add more of those gases to the mix. Finally, there is water. The water that flows up through the core to turn to the steam that drives the turbines also has the neutron-absorbing characteristic. 
as long as it is water. Once it is turned into steam, which is less dense, it soaks up fewer neutrons, and thus the nuclear reaction picks up speed. This condition is called a positive void coefficient, a technical term which means only that the more steam there is in the tubes, the faster the reaction will go. This also means that the faster the reaction goes, the more steam will be generated, consequently adding to the voids, consequently adding to the speed of the reaction, consequently adding to the steam. It is a delicate balance to keep a reactor, any reactor, poised between dying and running away. And so controlling a power reactor is a constant dance of rods and pumps. When things were going well, Kalichenko enjoyed his part in the dance. Most of it was automatic anyway. There were heat sensors all through the reactor core. The optimum running temperature of the 180 tons of uranium fuel was hundreds of degrees hotter than the ignition temperature of the graphite slabs. Graphite is carbon. Carbon burns. But it couldn't burn without oxygen. And oxygen was carefully excluded from the mix of gases in the surrounding jacket. If the temperature of the reactor climbed too high or fell too low, there would be a signal from the expensive imported Western instruments that monitored it. Then the operator would engage the motors that thrust a few rods farther in or took them a bit less steep. If it climbed drastically high, the operator would not be involved at all. Automatic pumps would rush floods of new cold water into the core to cool it down. That could not happen this night, because the automatic system had been turned off hours before. But then no one ever wanted to let things get so far that the automatics were tripped anyway. Another thing no operator wanted, at least Kolichenko certainly didn't want it, was to try to lower the temperature slowly. That was a sweaty business, because at low power levels, the RBMK was notoriously hard to control. The trouble was that it was so big. The temperature sensors could not be everywhere. One part of the core could be at exactly the temperature desired, while another, an arm's length away, could be soaring to dangerous levels without warning. So Kolichenko did sweat and swore under his breath because the bitch was obstinately rising and falling, down to 10% power, then up to 30, slowly down again as they inched a few rods back in, then almost dying on them, down to the range where xenon began to form, until they had withdrawn all but six of the rods entirely and were coaxing it back to life. When Kolichenko took his eyes off the board long enough to glance at a clock, it was only 1 a.m., he wasn't sleepy anymore. He was simply exhausted. Only one, and he had worked harder than he usually did in a full shift. And everyone else was on edge, too. Even the Gebe, Khrenov, had lost his warm, hooded look. Just behind where Kalichenko sat at his board, Khrenov was quarreling softly with the chief engineer. What is the matter, Varazian? he demanded. Can't you control this thing? Must I find Smin and bring him here? Varazin flushed, glancing at the observers. I am chief engineer, not Smin, he whispered fiercely. And I am responsible for personnel. Perhaps I have been deficient in my duties. It may be that I have not screened this plant's personnel with sufficient care. Varazin flinched, but said sturdily enough, If you have complaints in that respect, comrade Khrenov, there will certainly be time to discuss the matter. This is not the time. May I remind you that I am in charge here? Khrenov looked at him thoughtfully for a moment, then gave a long sigh. He turned to the observers with a smile back on his face. What a pity, he said genially, that this operation should take so long. Since most of you are, after all, more interested in the turbines and the steam generation than in the nuclear aspects of the operation, perhaps we should take a look at some of the other systems. Can we take a look at something to drink? One of the visitors grinned. We can do our best. Let me see. It's one o'clock. If we come back, say, at two, I think things will be in order. Don't you think so, comrade Varazin? I hope so, said Varazin. At least with Khrenov gone, everyone breathed a little more freely. But the job didn't get easier. It got worse. With great difficulty, they managed to stabilize the power output of reactor number four at 200 megawatts electric, a fifth of its normal capacity. Kalichenko called out the reading and reached for the switch that would maintain that level. Shall I engage the automatic systems, he asked. 
finger poised. Certainly not, snapped Varazian, looking frayed. It is far too high. Cool the reactor a bit. There are six pumps already going, the ship chief reported. Engage a seventh. Kalichenko marked the time when the seventh pump was cut in, three minutes after one, and indeed the temperature of the core began to respond. It was not the cooling of the water that made it happen, but the added liquid water in the system absorbing a few more neutrons. The atmosphere in the control room was excited now, with the engineers and operators calling the numbers back and forth to each other, like spectators at a football game. Even old Varazian was shifting from one foot to another, as he watched the readouts with them, and Kalichenko began to think about what all this meant. If this experiment succeeded, it could well be a model for every nuclear power plant in the Soviet Union. There would be commendations, perhaps cash awards. Perhaps they would be written up in Literaturna Ukraina, even in Pravda. Well, no, he cautioned himself. That was not likely. This sort of thing one did not advertise in the open press since the West had no business knowing what went on in critical Soviet industries. But it would be in the records. Even if Fyanov would not fail to list all the people who had contributed to such a success somewhere in his file folders. It is still too high, Vrazin announced. Add another pump. It was seven minutes after one, and all of a sudden, without transition, Kalichenko's bright mood vanished. He began to worry. The first indications of trouble were the pressure readings in the water system. Pressure is dropping in the drying drum, reported one of the engineers. The shift chief glanced at Barazin, who said impatiently, Yes, of course, carry on. But he looked nervous, too. With two extra pumps forcing water into the system, the steam generation had slowed. There was more water coming in than the core could boil into vapor at once. And so in the great drum, where the steam was extracted to feed into the turbines and the remaining water pumped back into the circulation system, pressure had begun to fall. Paradoxically, that meant more steam there, as the water that had been squeezed liquid found room to expand. Kalichenko listened and thought he could hear, in the distant throb of the pumps, a laboring sound as they tried to pump vapor instead of liquid water. Then the state printout computer flashed a warning. Reactor should be shut down at once. Chief Engineer Varazin, Kalichenko cried. The old man was looking strained now, but he said, Yes, of course. We are operating under unusual conditions, which the program is not designed for. Then shall I... Certainly not, said Varazin, biting his lip. Comrade Khrenov and our guests will be back at two, and I don't want to have a dead reactor for them. He glanced at the clock. It was twenty minutes after one. Close the stop control valve, he ordered. Kalichenko looked at the shift chief for confirmation before he obeyed, but the man only nodded. His face was pale. Reluctantly, Kalichenko switched the stop control valve off. It was the last of the automatic safety features. Then it all went sour. Temperature's rising, screamed the shift chief, and everyone stared at the thermal readings. From 7% of normal power, already at 15 20. In ten seconds it went to a full fifty percent of normal power. And in Kalichenko's mind, as he gazed awestruck at what was happening, there flashed a picture of the interior of the reactor core, with each of the 1,661 tubes filled with water. Only the pressure was dropping, and the water turned prematurely into steam, steam that was not dense enough to soak up neutrons, that let the reaction pick up speed. There was a distant thud. What was that? Varazin cried. And then in the same breath, Insert rods! Fifty percent rods immediately! But the rod operator was reporting that the control rod motors were not responding. The rods would not penetrate the core. Emergency shutdown then! At once! Varazin shouted and held his breath. But the rods would not go in. Something is blocking them! The rod controller shouted, his voice shaking. Kalichenko heard the words incredulously, for that was impossible. There was nothing to block the rods in their sockets. Why, it would mean that the interior of the reactor itself had suddenly become warped, or shrunken, or broken. The next explosion was much louder. The walls shook. 
Dust sprang out from the walls, hanging like a sudden shimmer of ice fog in the air. The lights went out, all of them, even the lighted meters and dials on the full wall instrument board. Oh, moaned Verazian. My God. Emergency circuits, cried the shift chief, and the man next to Kalichenko, muttering oaths, reached for the switch. At least then the instrument lights went on again. But what they said was insane. Temperature readings simply off the scale. Radiation levels that could not be believed. And the noise did not stop with the explosion. There was a rumbling thunder of walls going down, a patter of something hard falling on the roof, a crackle that could only be flame. Go and see what has happened to the reactor, ordered Varazin. It was at least an instruction to follow. Most of the men in the main control room jumped up to comply. Even Kalichunko rose from his useless board. But as he started through the door, he caromed off one of the other hurrying men, who swore and thrust him out of the way. Kalichunko fell heavily. By the time he got up, most of the men had rushed out to peer down at the reactor chamber. Kalichunko's arm hurt where he had fallen on it. He hesitated, rubbing the arm, then turned and went the other way. It was unquestionably a cowardly act. It also saved his life. His life. His life. His life. Chapter 6 Saturday, April 26th There is a difference between the nuclear reactions in a power plant, even a plant with a positive void coefficient, and an atomic bomb. The difference lies mainly in the fuel. Power plant uranium is slightly enriched with the touchy isotope U-235. Bomb uranium is very much so. This governs the speed of the reaction in which one fissioning atom releases a neutron, which strikes another atom and causes it to fission, and so on in the familiar chain reaction. The links of this chain happen very fast in either case. In a bomb, there can be a hundred million successive links in a single second. In a power plant, only about 10,000. For a human operator, the difference doesn't really matter much, because he can't react quickly enough to intervene in either case. But within the core, it is the difference between a nuclear accident and a bomb blast. If the core of reactor number four had been of weapons-grade uranium, the nuclear reaction would have gone on to involve far more of the fissionable material before the force of the explosion had time to blow it away. Since it was not, the nuclear explosion blew itself out. Its kinetic force scattered its own fuel elements, and in the process, destroyed only part of one building instead of an entire city. The later consequences, however, were of course another story. In that first moment, the shift engineer, Bordan Kalichenko, had saved his life by running away from the reactor. On the perimeter of the plant, the hydrologist engineer, Leonid Sheranchuk, saved his by running toward it. When he saw the great fireworks display blossom terribly overhead, he stood transfixed. Flaming debris rained down on everything, on the ground, on the buildings, on the man with the bicycle, on the man on foot twenty meters away, even on the roof of the ambulance that was slowly turning around to return to the scene of the explosion. A huge chunk of something the size of a football fell only meters away. It blazed blue, and he could feel the heat of it. Graphite. Could it be graphite? From the core of the reactor itself? He couldn't tell. Really, if that were the case, he didn't want to know. But none of the debris fell on Sheranchuk. At first he was shielded by the guard's cabin. Then he ran for the nearest entry to the plant, not because he reasoned out that that was the right thing to do, but because the plant was in mortal peril and he could not do anything else. And it happened to be the door to the section of the building that contained the main control room for reactor number four, on the far side from the blazing, spitting inferno that had been the reactor itself, with the whole turbine hall between... Even as he entered, he heard the clanging alarm that ordered evacuation. But that was wrong. Shiranchuk knew instantly that it was wrong. You didn't run away from a nuclear plant because there was an accident. You had to do whatever you could, whatever that might be, to keep the accident from becoming terribly worse. Stop, he yelled, trying to bar the door with his body. But someone roughly pushed him aside, 
and someone else stumbled past to the red-lit outside. No, wait, he cried. What are you doing? Go back to your stations. You can't leave the plant untended. Some swore at him. Some did not hear. Some he seized by the shoulders and turned around by brute force. There were too many for him. Shift operators, maintenance workers, radiation monitors. Two older men he thought were observers from another plant. He even caught a glimpse of two men wrangling as they trotted away along another corridor that looked like Khyanov and Chief Engineer Varazin. Then the alarm bell stopped in mid-clang. From outside, almost drowned in the hideous crackle and crash of the burning reactor building, Sharanchuk could hear the lesser sirens of the plant's fire brigade racing to the disaster point. Do you hear, he yelled. The firemen are coming. Help them. Get back to your work. Make sure the other reactors are safe. And then, abandoning the effort, he pushed past the dazed ones and hurried through choking smoke and alarming sounds of crash and rumble to the stairs. He was hardly aware of the long climb, and when he reached the control room for reactor number four, he could not believe his eyes. Below the window, the entire turbine room was in flames. The top of the reactor building was simply gone. He could not see the burning core itself. That saved his eyes, as well as his life. But there were fires everywhere, everywhere, and the world had without warning come to an end. What went wrong at 1.23 a.m. on that Saturday morning in Chernobyl occurred in four separate stages, but they followed so closely on each other that they were only seconds from beginning to end. First there was the power surge in one little corner of the vast graphite and uranium core, Although the reactor had been throttled back almost to extinction, a small section went critical. That was the atomic explosion. The second stage was steam. The nuclear blast blew the caps off the 1,661 steam tubes. All of them blew out at once, and the broken tubes of water were exposed to naked, violently hot fuel material. The water squeezed under 65 atmospheres of pressure was suddenly under no pressure at all. It flashed into steam and the steam explosion shattered the containment vessel. At that point, the disaster was completely out of control, and everything that followed was inevitable. The next explosion was chemical. The terrible heat and pressure caused the steam from the ruptured pipes to break down into its gaseous elements, hydrogen and oxygen. The zirconium in which the steel pipes were clad helped the process along as a catalyst. That produced a hydrogen-oxygen explosion, the powerful reaction that drives spacecraft into orbit. The wreckage of the immense steel and concrete containment box was hurled into the air. The refueling floor just above the reactor was tossed aside, along with the 40-ton crane that transported the fuel rods. Fiercely radioactive material was thrown in all directions. Anything nearby that could burn was ignited. Major fires began on the tarred roofs of the building complex, and that was the third stage. All of those things happened in an instant, and then the fourth stage completed the Holocaust. The graphite that contained the core was now exposed to the open air, with its containment shattered. Graphite is carbon. Carbon burns. Even, though with more difficulty, when it is in the dense, poreless form of graphite. Moreover, thick steam from ruptured water pipes now roiled over the hot graphite, this is a classical chemical reaction that is demonstrated every day in high school chemistry labs all over the world. It is called the water-gas process. Chemistry teachers write the equation C plus H2O equals CO plus H2 on the blackboard for their students, meaning that the carbon and the water combine to produce carbon monoxide and free hydrogen. The carbon monoxide is quite combustible when exposed to air. The hydrogen is explosively so. At that point, the basic event was complete. The edge of the graphite blocks had begun to burn. All the fires together produced a vertical hurricane of hot gases that carried along with it a soup of fragmentary particles and even ions of everything nearby, including the radionuclides of the core. Lanthanum 140, ruthenium 103, cesium 137, iodine 131, tellurium 132, strontium 89, Yttrium-91. They laced the soot of the smoke, mingled with the plutonium and uranium of the fuel elements, spread out in a cloud that ultimately would cover half a continent. 
The first three explosions wrecked reactor number four of the Chernobyl power station, but it was the fire that carried the calamity over a million square miles. There was no longer anything that anyone could do in the main control room for reactor number four. There was nothing left of reactor number four to control. The wall of meters showed readings that were reassuringly stayed or wildly impossible, but they were no longer registering any reality. The only person left in the room was the shift chief, who said, There's nothing to do here. Everybody else is gone. You might as well get out, too. But then why are you still here? Sheran Shuk asked. The man did not look well at all. He was sweating and rubbing at his mouth. Because I haven't been relieved yet, he said. Halfway down the stairs again, it occurred to Sheran Shuk that he could simply have said the words, I relieve you then, and the man might have accepted the release. But after all, he was as safe there as anywhere else, Sheran Shuk reasoned. In any case, he would not go back. At the ground level, he could not resist another look outside. There were plenty of firemen present now, from the town of Pripyat as well as the plant's own brigade, and yellow militia cars were arriving with their green lights flashing. Searchlights paled the flames from burning debris and picked out the shapes of firemen on the roofs of some of the buildings. Beyond the milling firemen on the ground was the dark hulk of the plant's office block, looking curiously deserted. Because, Sheranchuk saw, all of its windows had been blown out in the force of the explosion. Somebody was shouting at him, a militiaman, face black with smoke and sweat. Hi, you there. Are you all right? Give a hand with these people. Sheranchuk did not stop to think about whether that was what he should be doing. He simply obeyed. He was glad for the order, because an order to follow was better than helplessly trying to decide what to do. For what that was, he simply could not guess. He helped a fireman to stumble toward the waiting ambulance. The man limped and held one hand to his face. He was not the only casualty already. The doctor who had given him a lift was loading a bundle of charred rags into his ambulance that Sharon Chuk would not have thought human if it hadn't been cursing steadily in a faint, high-pitched voice. Three other firemen were coughing as they sat on the cement roadway, waiting for someone to bring them oxygen, or better still, new lungs to replace the ones filled with smoke. Why weren't they wearing respirators? Sharon Chuk asked himself. But for that matter, why wasn't he? Glazova, the tough old woman who ran the plant's night coffee stand, had managed to stay together long enough to help two of her customers to safety. But when Sharon Chuk saw her, she was collapsed under the plaque of linen at the plant entrance, sobbing helplessly, not responding to anyone's attempts to talk to her. A militiaman lay stunned on the ground, his hair scorched where a bit of flaming debris from the sky had knocked him out, and likely enough cracked his skull. There was room for only two in the ambulance, but the doctor promised to send more from the Pripyat hospital as he got him to drive away. And hurry, please, Shiranchuk shouted after him. The next ambulance to arrive, though, didn't come from Pripyat. It was from the town of Chernobyl, 30 kilometers away. And with it came half a dozen new fire trucks. There were more than a hundred firemen on the scene already, the stentorian throbbing of pumps adding to the shouts and the ominous thuds and snaps and crackling sounds from the fires. And in the center of it all, stark and incredible, the splintered walls of what had once been reactor number four, Burns, bruises, cuts, contusions, smoke inhalation, heat fatigue, simple exhaustion. Put them all together, and there were forty or fifty people lined up to be taken away in the ambulances shuttling between the Chernobyl nuclear power station and the hospital in Pripyat, just a few kilometers away. Sheranchuk thought it strange that when the ambulances left the plant, they went without sirens or bells and seemed to take a roundabout way that circled the town before heading directly for the hospital. Was it possible they were being considerate about waking the townspeople up? He stood amid a tangle of hose lines, his mind weary of questions, pondering that irrelevant one. Hi, you! Get back behind the lines! You're just in the way here! A brigade commander was shouting at him as a new fire truck from one of the farm villages tried to inch its way through the congestion to take station with the others. Sheran Shuk shook his head, trying to clear it. What was the thing someone had said? People still unaccounted for, somewhere inside the plant. 
Well, that at least was something he could do. He retreated toward the gate slowly until the fire commander wasn't looking at him anymore, then hurried to the nearest entrance to the plant. Exactly why he did that, Sharon Shook would have been unable to say. It was partly to see if there was anyone who needed help getting out, partly because he just couldn't stay away. Inside the building, the noise from outside dwindled, but there were new and worrisome sounds. He could hear the creaks and thuds from what was left of reactor number four, and an irregular throbbing that bothered him. The building he was in was attached to the turbine hall shared by reactors three and four, and it had not been left untouched. The walls were seamed with huge cracks. In places, whole sections of paneling had fallen out, and these he had to dodge around. The floor of the hall he trotted along bulged in places and was littered with fluorescent light fixtures, fire extinguishers, fire extinguishers, and odds and ends of unidentifiable things that had been shaken off the walls and ceilings by the blast. Most of the windows here, too, had been blown out, and broken glass crunched under his feet as he raced from door to door in the halls. A nasty, choking, chemical smoky smell was everywhere. It made him cough as he trotted along, stumbling in the gloom because only a few emergency lights were still going. Most of the doors were tidily locked for the weekend. When he flung others open, he shouted inside to see if anyone were there, but there were no answers. He was on the fifth floor of the building when he began to think he was accomplishing nothing productive with his time. He stopped and considered. It did not occur to him that he was being courageous, only that he might be doing something that had no purpose. The irregular throbbing was still there. He listened, frowning one hand against the vibrating beige wall of the corridor. It took a moment to recognize that what he heard was the sound of turbines still running in the hall that served both reactors three and four. Its control room was only two stories away, and Sharon Shook took the stairs on a dead run, arriving breathless in the room. There were only three men there, the shift chief and two operators, and they turned to greet him with angry expressions as he burst in. He stared around the room incredulously, the immaculate control room was dirty. When he gripped the back of a chair to steady himself, sooty dust came away on his fingers. What's going on here? he demanded. The devil knows, the ship chief snarled, waving a hand at the instrument wall. The lights were flickering, but Sharon Shook could read the indicators. Startled, he shouted an obscenity. Be careful. You'll have this one off, too. The supervisor rasped furiously in return. Screw God and your mother both. What are we supposed to do? First that cow number four blows up. Then we try to stabilize our own reactor. Then we get the order to evacuate the whole plant at once. So we begin to shut this one down. Then they countermand the order, and it's keep the working units working, boys. We need the power. But turbine six, Sharon Shook began, waving a hand at the hydraulic pressure meters. Turbine six, your mother's ass. They've all gone mad. Your pipes have sprung a leak, plumber. Instinctively, Sharon Shook picked up a phone to call the pump control room. But of course there wasn't any sound from the instrument. Its cables, too, like most of the others in that building, had been fried somewhere along the line. Sharon Shook didn't wait to argue. He went down the stairs faster than he had come up, nearly falling half a dozen times in the gloom. When he reached the pump control room, he almost expected it to be empty. But at least one of his people was there. The pipe fitter they called Spring. Arkady Panamarienko. You're not an operator, Sheron Shuk said accusingly. There's no operator here, the football player explained softly, shy and deferential even now. I was told there was damage to the pumps, so I came to take a look. Look, Leonid, the pressure is dropping. I've tried to cut in another pump, but still it falls. We have to have pressure, Sharon Shook snapped. Here, let me see. He shouldered the pipe fitter roughly out of his way, glaring at the intractable pressure gauges before him. But Spring had been right. Of the main pumps, all were already engaged, though three of them did not seem to be operating at all, and the pressure in the system was slowly creeping downward. Sharon Shook rubbed a fist across his eyes. Outside he heard someone shouting, but he paid no attention. We'd better have a look, he said. There's probably no power down below. Is there a light here? 
I've already got it out, said Spring eagerly, holding out a hand torch. Come on, then. But just outside the door, a fire brigade commander was hurrying toward them, shouting. Is this the place where the plumbers are? Look, you two. We've got some kind of flame going that we can't put out. Somebody said it's yours. Flame? Shedanshuk repeated. Then, understanding. Oh, the hydrogen flare. Yes, of course, it only needs to be turned off. Then come along and do it, yelled the fireman. I'll do it, the pipe fitter volunteered. It's only a matter of turning a valve, after all, and then I'll come back to help you. He didn't wait for permission. He simply pressed the torch into Sheranchuk's hand and loped away with the brigade commander. Sheranchuk put the matter out of his mind. It was the hydraulic system that was his business, not a simple flame that only needed to be shut off like the stove in his wife's kitchen. Five minutes later, he was standing on the bottom step of the flight that led down to the basement, shining the light into a steamy gloom, appalled at what he saw. The hydraulic shock of the explosion had gone completely through the return water system. Every pipe on the floor had been neatly severed at the joints. The flanges that linked the units together opened like flowers. The water that should have flowed through them back into the systems of reactors three and four was pulsing slowly out of the open joints to add to the steaming centimeters-deep pond on the floor of the underground pipe hall. Sheranchuk's first rational thought was that reactor number three had to be shut down. If the return water system was breached, at some time not very far in the future, the pumps would have nothing to send through the core of number three but air, and then number three would join number four in blowing up. His second thought was that the person with the authority to order the shutdown was Chief Engineer Varazian, wherever Varazian might be. He reached those conclusions slowly and painstakingly, but his body acted without waiting for a formal decision. Long before he had concluded that he must find Varazian, he was already out of the building, running along in the dark night away from the hullabaloo at the fire, heading toward the door of reactor number two. The door was more than a hundred meters away, and even running, Sheranchuk had time to notice that there were bright stars in the sky and a scent of something green and flowery, lilacs again, in the air. At this end of the great joint structures, the smoky smell was gone, sucked away by the strong wind. There was nothing, Sheranchuk thought detachedly, to keep him from going on running straight ahead, over the fence if he had to, and away. Of course, he did nothing of the kind. When he came to the door, he grabbed for the knob. The door was locked. Sheranchuk shouted angrily, but once again his body acted without waiting for instructions from his rational mind. The door at the end of the block would be open, though with a guard to keep intruders away. The door was indeed open, and with no guard in sight. Sheranchuk pounded up the stairs, pausing only at the fifth level to cross quickly over to the number one turbine room. No, no one there, though the turbines were howling peacefully away, and to peer into the refueling chamber over the number one reactor. It was empty, too, and quite normal in every way to the eye, with the great crane squatting silently in one corner. No one was in the crane's control room, either, but Sheran Shuk had not really expected to find Varazian there. He was breathing quite hard by the time he got back across the building and up to the main control room for a number one reactor. Varazian wasn't there, either. The six people in the room were the normal nighttime crew. They looked pretty strained, not to say scared, but they were carrying out their duties in the business-as-usual way. But Ozian? No, said the ship supervisor. Someone said that when last heard from, he was heading for Pipiat, but I didn't see him myself. Could he be in number two? Sheranchuk fretted. I'd best run over there and see. The ship chief looked astonished. As you wish, but wouldn't it be better simply to telephone? Telephone? Sheranchuk blinked at the strange idea, then recollected himself. And indeed, the phone in control room number two was picked up at the first ring, though Varazin was not there either. The shift chief for number two volunteered that Khenov had stopped by a little earlier to urge them to stay at their posts, but Khenov was no use to Sheranchuk. On the chance, he tried to ring number three, but its lines were still out of order. I'll have to go to number three, he groaned, and was gone before anyone in the room responded. At the stairs he realized there was an alternative to seven flights down and seven back up again, 
The alternative was to cross the roof of the building. But that was not to be either. As soon as he opened the door to the roof, a fireman shouted at him to go back. Indeed, there wasn't any choice. All across the broad expanse of roof joining the reactor buildings was a spattering of bonfires, some tiny, some huge. Firemen were limping about in the softened waterproofing of the roof, trying to get hoses on them all at once. But as soon as one fire was out, another would start up. At the entrance of the stairs for number three, Shiranshuk saw a curious sight picked out in the searchlights of the firefighters. A sort of black fountain, half a meter high, dark droplets flung up and cascading back down to the source. Smoke was rising from it, and as he watched, it burst into flame when the chunk of white-hot graphite that had buried itself in the bitumen finally ignited the stuff. It would have to be seven floors down and seven back up again, after all. Only now, because he had made the extra climb to the roof, it was eight each way. When at last, sobbing and coughing for breath, he got to the main control room for reactor number three, he saw that the two operators had become six as volunteers came in to replace the absent ones. But the shift chief was obstinate. No chief engineer Varazin was not here, nor had he been since the explosion. Yes, granted, there was something wrong with the turbines and the water system. But no, positively no, he would not shut his reactor down. Do your mother. You must, Sharon Shook gasped. Are you crazy? Do you know what will happen when the water runs out? But the engineer, his face a frozen mask, was shaking his head. We have no orders, he said. Orders? I order you, Sheronchuk shouted. In writing, then, if you please, said the engineer, ludicrously firm, for I will not take the responsibility of failing to fulfill our plan, with only four days to go until the end of the month. And incredibly, comically, Sheronchuk found himself scribbling a written order for which he had no authority at all. I direct that unit number three be placed at once in standby mode before the man would stand aside and allow the operators to get on with their work. Only two operators now, Sheranshuk noted. The others had fled. The two remaining, cursing and swearing, labored over the boards until a series of thuds, almost lost in the constant noise of fire and firefighting, told them that all the boron rods were firmly socketed. What are you doing, Sheranshuk? asked a gentle, sorrowing voice from behind him. Sheranchuk knew before he turned that it was the director of the first department, Garadot Khyanov. I am helping shut down this reactor, he said. Yes, yes, Khyanov said absently. The liquid brown eyes seemed clouded, and the man's expression was detached. You appear to have given orders in matters that don't concern you, he observed, gazing around the room. The operator stood watching the encounter. He only told us to do what we have orders to do anyway in such a case, one of them called. Khyanov's eyes swept over the man, whose face stiffened. Sheranchuk spoke up to draw the fire to himself. The ministry must be notified at once, he said. Khyanov's eyes widened, but the operator spoke again. That's been done. I telephoned a report to Moscow myself. Ah, said Khyanov, nodding. Someone else who takes responsibility onto himself. And what did you report, then? That reactor number four had exploded, of course. I know, the shift man added apologetically, that that is the duty of the chief engineer, but I couldn't find him. Khrenov said thoughtfully, Chief Engineer Varazin felt that he had the obligation to make sure our guests were safe. I believe he is in Pripyat with them now. Well, let us get on with controlling this accident. And remember, at all costs, we must avoid panic. Avoid panic? Yes, of course, Sheranchuk kept telling himself. That was absolutely essential. But it was also impossible. A dozen times there flashed through Sheranchuk's mind a school day's parody of an English poem. Was it by Rudyard Kipling? That went, If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, then you probably simply haven't understood what has been happening. The difficulty for Sheranchuk was that he understood what was happening all too well. It terrified him in ways he had never expected to feel. It was not simply that he himself might have been in danger, 
It was the ending of an age. Helping once more with the endless task of aiding the casualties to the never-caught-up shifts of ambulances, he could hardly remember that peaceful time, not yet six hours ago, when he had in calm and leisurely fashion left his flat to look in on the Chernobyl nuclear power station. There was no calm at the Chernobyl station now, nor leisure either. Sheranchuk was astonished as he passed by a cluster of fire brigade commanders to learn that they had declared the fire officially out an hour before. True, little blazes were springing up now and then, where hot bits from the core continued to try to ignite whatever they touched. Certainly the core itself was not out. Looked as though it never would be out as its blue-white glare starkly illuminated the charred walls around it. And certainly nothing seemed to halt the steady trickle of wounded and sick men. There were still burns, still sprains, and worse, as the firemen slipped and fell on the sticky, slippery roofs. But more and more of the men were simply exhausted, pale, sweating, sometimes vomiting uncontrollably. One of them was the man from his own department, the pipe fitter called Spring. Sorry, he apologized as Sheron Shook spoke to him. I just feel sick. But I got the hydrogen flare out for them, Leonid. I was certain you would, said Sheranchuk, and gazed thoughtfully after him as he climbed by himself into an ambulance and was taken away. But there were others to claim his attention. A tall, slender man was moaning as he sat clutching at his burned feet. For a moment Sheranchuk thought it was the operator, Kalichenko, but it turned out to be a fireman named Viskerdis. As Sheranchuk turned away, someone grabbed him and shook him roughly. He did not recognize the woman at first. Fool, she was screaming at him. Where is your protective clothing? Do you want to die for nothing? He had forgotten about radiation. And it was not until he was pulling the hood over his head that he realized that the woman had been his wife. Really, there was not much left for someone like Leonid Sheranchuk to do. The professionals had taken over. But he could not help trying to do something anyway. When there were enough trained medical personnel on the scene to do a better job helping the injured than he could, he went back inside the buildings, once more looking for any possible wounded or simply dazed people who might have crawled away into one of the storage areas or workshops. There weren't any, as far as he could tell. He was alone. It was hard and hot work, and not without danger. He searched the entire building of reactor number three. Inside it was dark, and even with the flashlight he had managed to cling to all this time, he was constantly stumbling over debris. Only a wall was between him and the fulminating ruin of number four, and number four sounded at every moment as though it were trying to come to him right through the wall. Even the cracked walls radiated heat, soaked up on one side from the 4,000-degree graphite and sent on to him from the other. He peered out at the roof, where there were no visible fires anymore, but still plenty of firemen, almost ankle-deep in the syrupy bitumen, still playing hoses on the smoldering embers. Sighing, he made his way back down to ground level. He wondered if anyone had told those firemen that it was not only heat and smoke and burns they faced, but the invisible, lethal storm of radiation that billowed up at them with the smoke. In the four months Sheron Shuk had been at Chernobyl, he had diligently studied all the literature on nuclear power plants. He had understood the special dangers of a core meltdown and the particular risk of a graphite fire in an RBMK. After all, there had been experience of it abroad. The British had had one of their own at a place called Windscale decades before. But nothing in his reading or imagination had prepared him for this. It occurred to him almost to wish that Smeen had never telephoned him with the unexpected job offer. Certainly nothing in the burning of peat could have produced this particular nightmare. But he had no time for such thoughts. No one had time for anything in this endless night in which every second was filled with a new alarm or a new task. Yet Sheranchuk never forgot that he was Simeon Smeen's comrade plumber. He kept an eye on his own special charges whenever he could spare a thought from the urgencies of his rescue work. His pumps and pipes and valves were still doing as much as possible of their job. Cooling water still flowed out of the pond. In the two working reactors, the circuits were still pumping through the cores. 
Firefighting was, after all, a matter of plumbing. When he saw the huge hoses that were sucking water from the pond for the firemen, swearing men holding the intake ends of the hoses under water, he almost wondered if they would pump the pond dry. But that was only a fantasy fear. The locks to the river were wide open, and they would not pump the pipiate empty in a thousand years. There were firemen there now from, it seemed, scores of communities. Even Kiev was not the farthest. There were militiamen to reinforce the plant security forces from as many. Ambulances from he could not guess where were screaming in with doctors and medical assistants and roaring away again with the injured. Tank trucks of gasoline were refueling the firemen's pumpers as they worked, and the noise was endless and indescribable. At some point, someone thrust two tin cups into Sheranchuk's hands. One cup was of hot, concentrated tea, the other pure vodka. Sheranchuk slumped to the ground for a moment as he swallowed them both, turn and turn, gazing upward. He had not paused to see what the pyre looked like before. What it looked like was terrifying. A red-bellied smoke cloud was shooting straight up from the burning reactor, only bending away toward the north and east when it was so high that it was almost out of sight. The stars were gone. The smoke obscured them. But Sheran Shuk had no time to gaze. Already someone was shouting for him, waving him toward the perimeter fence, where the latest batch of injured firemen were groaning on the ground. These, he saw, had been fighting the fire from the top of the turbine building next to the shattered reactor, and they, too, had been grievously harmed by its smoldering tar surface. He helped carry two men with severe footburns away, and as he deposited the second one at the foot of a thick, short man in enveloping hood and coveralls, the man said softly, Well, Comrade Plummer Sheranchuk, we've made a mess of it this time, haven't we? And he saw the man was Simeon Smeen. 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 Chapter 7 Saturday, April 26th. Simeon Smeen's wife, Silena, could not be said to be a bad woman. No one would deny, however, that she is a collector. A humbler Soviet woman would be the kind who never left home without her little string bag, the Avoska just on the chance that she might happen somewhere to find something worth the trouble of buying. Silena, as the wife of the deputy director of the Chernobyl nuclear power station, does not have to do that. She gets what she wants, or nearly, more nearly than most. She has special stores to shop in, though she must go to Kiev or Moscow for the best of them. She even has the distribution, that special perk of the high in rank that allows her to order food over the telephone. And not just what the local gastronome might carry, but high-quality food from the listed stores, and have it delivered to her flat or dacha. This is a source of great pleasure to Selena, who was a not-quite-successful dancer when she married Simeon Smin. There were no such luxuries in Selena's early life. She has eaten well since then, and if she no longer has a dancer's figure, Smin does not seem to mind. Selena has a job of her own, of course. She is in charge of cultural and physical fitness matters at the Chernobyl plant, and often at eleven in the morning and one in the afternoon, when the handsome young couple in leotards do their daily exercises on the television to the accompaniment of a pianist and the orders of a trainer, Selena joins the workers and leads their calisthenics. Her position technically puts her in the first department of the plant, under the direction of Garadot Khrenov, but Khrianov never interferes with the wife of the deputy director. He only makes sure that the deputy director knows that. There was not much sleep on that Saturday morning for Siljana Smin. At six she got up and dressed slowly, wondering what the urgent summons from the plant had meant. At seven, while she was having a cup of tea with her mother-in-law, there was another knock on the door, and this time it was a telegram. Remaining here... Request you and Vasily stay in Kiev for weekend. Smin. But I can't do that, complained Silena. I have things to do, and the boy should not miss his school. He has missed it already, said old Aftasia Smin practically. That was true enough. Vasily was still curled on the couch, blonde head buried under the blankets as the women talked softly. But still, remain in Kiev to do what? 
without a car, without even a telephone. I can't even call him to find out what this is all about, she complained. You can do as I do, Aftasia said. The Dichuks have a telephone. The Dichuks have one, and we do not. I will certainly speak to Simeon about this again. Siliana thought for a moment. And which apartment are they in, then? she asked. It was only one floor below. Two minutes later, Siliana had descended the dark stairs and knocked politely at their door. The Dichuks were at home, all of them, for it seemed that there was a child and a couple of grandparents in the flat as well as the teachers themselves. They were all awake. They were not fully dressed. The woman had her hair in curlers. The man was wearing a robe over his trousers. But they were, of course, quite polite, even welcoming, and certainly she could use their telephone. But then it seemed she could not really, because all of the lines to the plant were engaged. They remained engaged, were engaged on the first time she tried them and on the fifth. The Dichuks politely went about their morning business, stepping around her when they had to come into the little living room with its small TV set and worn brocaded couch and window that had thin, bright drapes. The old father greeted her in a mannerly way on his way to the bathroom. The old mother came out of the kitchen and offered her breakfast, which she declined graciously, but accepted a cup of tea, brought to her by the ten-year-old daughter of the teachers. Even the telephone in her own flat in the town of Pripyat did not answer. It was not engaged, but it rang uselessly until she put it down. So Smin, wherever he was, was at least not at home. Well, what a nuisance, she declared, smiling at the young woman. But what pretty drapes! You have done so much with this room. The woman said modestly, It is difficult when we both work. For me, too, Siliana agreed, and chatted amiably with the young woman and her tiny blonde mother-in-law, while in her mind she tried fretfully to decide what to do with this day. A day in Kiev with the car, yes, that was always quite useful. In fact, it was a treat. There were places to go and stores to visit. And then one could count on finding a friend or two at the club for lunch. But without the car... The thought of the club gave her an idea. One more call, if you don't mind, she begged prettily, and dialed the Great Gate Hotel but the operator could not find any Mr. and Mrs. Dean Garfield from America on the roster. You must have a room number, the operator explained. One cannot complete a call without a room number, of course. Siliana exploded. What nonsense! I am Siliana Smin, and I am making this call for S.M. Smin, the director of the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Station. The operator retreated. For quite a while leaving Siliana to hold the whispering, hissing phone while she thought wistfully how nice it would have been if she could have invited the Americans not merely to lunch at the club, pleasant though the club was, but to their own home in Pripyat, to see how a decent Soviet family lived in a decent home, not this Khrushchev tenement. But of course that was only a fantasy, since one did not invite foreigners to Pripyat. And then when the operator returned, she said only, with some satisfaction, the Americans you speak of are no longer in the hotel. But of course they are in the hotel. I saw them only last night. They have departed, the operator said triumphantly. Perhaps if you were to consult in tourist, they could inform you of their itinerary. Ah, oh, well, sighed Siliana to the young couple, who were beginning to glance surreptitiously at their watches. They would have to leave for their Saturday morning classes. Simply one more call, if I may just to call for a taxi. But where was she to go in the taxi? To the club. And do what there, especially with Vasily, who should in any case be on his way to school by now? And as she looked out the window, she heard distant thunder and saw that it was beginning to rain. And saw that it was... Chapter 8 Saturday, April 26th a Saturday in the Soviet Union is not quite like a Saturday in London or New York. The Soviets do not work a five-day week. Schools are in session. The working force works. But a Saturday is still, after all, part of a weekend, even in the Soviet Union. And those who are in a position to get away for some relaxation generally do. In Moscow this Saturday, for instance, the telephone rang from Chernobyl. The duty officer at the Ministry of Nuclear Energy heard the voice say, this is Vitaly Varazin, 
chief engineer at the Chernobyl power station, and the officer exploded. At last, what has been going on? We had a call that there had been a serious accident. Nothing more. And no one answers your telephones. Yes, said Verazian. Quite a nuisance, that was. Communications have been interrupted because of a fire in a generating unit. But emergency crews responded at once. What the duty officer responded was not quite audible. It was definitely obscene, for he had spent a nasty hour in the middle of the night trying to track down his superior. Unfortunately, his superior had left the night before for his dacha at Perizelkima, and so the duty officer had been forced to act on his own. He groaned as he thought of what those actions had been. The situation is under control, then, he demanded. Quite under control, yes. Then tell me something, the duty officer snarled. What are you going to do with the plane load of experts in the special commission that is even now on its way to Kiev? There was a pause on the line. A special commission, Varazin asked. Twenty-four people, the duty officer said grimly. All woken up in the middle of the night on the basis of the first report from Chernobyl. Their plane left Moscow at six. I see, Varazin said faintly. The duty officer waited him out drumming his fingers on the desktop. Well, Verazin said at last, it was quite a serious fire, to be sure. Certainly we can use guidance from the ministry. Certainly you are going to get it, snapped the duty officer, because the first echelons will be helicoptered to your plant in the next hour or so. Thank you, said Verazin softly, and hung up. His voice sounded unhappy to the duty officer, which gave the officer some satisfaction. Actually, he was feeling much better. His worst fears were allayed. Responsibility for the 24-man commission was off his back. And now he lifted the phone again and called off the search for his chief. It would be time enough to disturb the highest authorities, he decided, when the full report was in. And with any luck, he'd be off by then anyway. In Novosibirsk, at the headquarters of the All-Union Ministry of Power Plant Structures, they took the call more seriously, until they found that the Yemeni visitors had left before it happened. At least, they reassured one another, there had not been the embarrassment of seeing one of their plants wreck itself in the presence of three potential foreign customers. In Kiev, it was another matter. The load dispatcher was shocked. Yes, all right. Two of your units are damaged. Naturally, they can't generate power. But really, why must you shut the other two down as well? A precaution? Precautions are very good. But do you have any idea what sort of trouble that makes for me? And when he hung up, he was swearing. Chernobyl was the plant he could always count on. And where on a Saturday morning was he going to find three or four thousand megawatts of electrical power to replace it? When the phone rang in the headquarters of the International Atomic Energy Authority in Vienna, it might have caused more action, except that this particular call was not to give information, but to ask for some. The engineer on duty put down his cup of tea to answer the telephone. His caller had an accent, quickly explained when he said he was calling from the Soviet Ukraine. Do you have information on controlling graphite fires and reactors? He asked politely. The duty engineer that morning happened to be an Englishman. He had no difficulty in understanding the question. Do you mean the wind scale sort of thing? Yes, I think so. That was a Wigner effect event. He paused to see if he would be required to explain the Wigner effect. The Wigner effect is a change that takes place in the molecular structure of graphite after long exposure to ionizing radiation. The molecular structure stores energy from the radiation. This has potential dangers, and so once a year graphite moderators of that sort must be annealed which is to say heated up sufficiently that the molecular bonds slacken and relax when cooled. In England's wind scale in 1957, that heating got away from its operators, causing the graphite to burn and destroy the reactor. One moment, the Ukrainian said. There was a sound of muffled voices, and then the man came back on the line. No, not in regard to the Wigner effect, he said. I ask of control measures of ways for dealing with such an event if it should occur. You mean to ask how they put it out, the Englishman said. They simply kept drenching the thing with water. 
Diverted most of a river onto it, if I remember all right. Wait just a moment. I think we do have some documents in the file. Shall I mail you a set? The voice on the phone disappeared again. When it returned, it said politely, No, thank you. We do not think that will be necessary. The Englishman hung up, finished his tea, and examined the pot to see if there might be another blackened cup left. That, he thought, had been a curious call. He looked through his files to see what he could find about graphite-moderated reactors in the USSR. There were plenty of them, but nothing that seemed relevant to the call. Still, he wanted to tell someone about it, and so after a moment's consideration, he picked up the telephone again and dialed a colleague in the United Kingdom. What do you reckon they're up to, he asked, after recounting the call. The colleague yawned. He had been sleeping in on a rainy English weekend morning. Ruskies, he said, explaining everything. You know what they like those graphite reactors for. The things are useful to make a little plutonium on the side. They don't want to know about controlling anything, in my opinion. They're simply hoping to find some better ways of increasing the yield. It could be that, I suppose, said the man in Vienna. They've got a mass of those RBMKs going. I found a note from one of our masters warning that the beasts were not entirely safe. That would be Marshall, I expect, said the one in London. That was Lord Walter Marshall, head of the United Kingdom's General Electricity Generating Board. That was donkeys years ago, wasn't it? The engineer in Vienna said doubtfully, You don't think I should report it to someone? Report it to whom? And what is there to report? No, said the voice from England. I'd forget it if I were you. It's what I'm going to do myself. Chapter 9 Saturday, April 26th If Vasily Smin lived in Moscow, he might easily be one of the westernized, pampered, English-speaking, playboy-reading, golden youth whose wrangler jeans and Gucci loafers make the disco scene in the Bluebird nightclub. Vasily has as much going for him as any of the spoiled Moscow darlings. His father is high in the party, as well as being the deputy director of an immense industrial complex. Vasily himself had been a leader in the kids' patriotism communism scouting organization, the Pioneers, had moved up to join the Komsomol as soon as he reached the tenth grade in school. He has spending money almost equal to the wages of the peasant girl who lovingly makes his bed every morning and unfailingly shines his shoes. Vasily, however, does not live in Moscow. He lives in a small town a hundred and thirty kilometers from Kiev, and even in the city of Kiev, the most pampered youth are less spoiled than in the capital. The other thing that makes Vasily unlike Moscow's golden youth is that he has a lot of his father in him. He certainly wishes to succeed, but he knows that the way to do that is first to make sure of getting into a first-rate college and second to join the party as soon as he can. The party meetings will surely be boring, but there is no other way to a high position and although his father has the influence to get him into almost any college in the USSR, he is far from powerful enough to plant his boy in a leadership post for life. Vasily knows that what happens after college will depend on his grades. It would also, Vasily knew, be helped along a good deal by commendations from his Komsomol leaders. But that was not the only reason why, that Saturday morning, he left his grandmother's apartment and took a bus to the outskirts of Kiev. Then he stood on the edge of the Pripyat Road, holding a five-ruble note in the air for passing vehicle drivers to see. He was not merely reluctant to miss a day's school, or the Saturday afternoon meeting of the League for Young Communists, the Komsomol, which would put the finishing touches on their May Day plans. He was also worried. A five-ruble note was statistically certain to get a ride from at least half of any random selection of truck, ambulance, or private car drivers. But this morning it wasn't working. There was traffic in plenty, but most of it was official, and all of it in a hurry. Vasily saw a dozen fire trucks, military vehicles, and militia cars go by before at last a lumbering farm truck pulled up beside him. What's going on, the driver demanded, leaning out of the window without opening the door. I don't know, said Vasily, waving the bill at him, but I have to get to Pripyat. Pripyat? I'm not going to Pripyat, but I can take you fifty kilometers. For one ruble, not five, Vasily bargained, 
and settled finally for two. Thrown into the bargain was nearly half an hour's conversation from the collective farmer, divided almost equally between complaints about the stinginess of customers at the free market in Kiev and invective against the other drivers on the road, who raced past him at 120 kilometers an hour. Nor were they the normal assortment of trucks and buses. The bulk of the traffic still seemed to be emergency vehicles, all in a hurry, and Vasily was beginning to get seriously worried. When at last the Kalhozis turned off onto a side road, Vasily was picked up almost at once by a soldier who was driving, of all things, a water cannon. What? Is there a riot in Pripyat? Vasily begged, aghast at the notion. But the driver only shook his head. His orders were to go to a checkpoint thirty kilometers south of the town. He had no other information. It was all in a day's work to him, and he resented losing his Saturday to it. Then they came to the checkpoint. Vasily hopped down from the truck, frowning. There was a barricade across the road. Civilian vehicles had been turned back and had already worn muddy ruts through the margins of a field of sunflowers as they turned around. There were soldiers there manning the barricades, and with them a rabble of young people. Young people? Why, Vasily saw with shock, they were come some alls. From his own troop. One of them, his friend Betty Shelanchuk. And as soon as Buddy saw him, he waved him over. Here, we've been called out to help the militiamen. So you're on duty, too. Duty for what? To make sure no one gets past, of course. There's been an awful accident at the power plant. An accident, Vasily cried. Have you... Do you know where my father is? I don't even know where my own father is. It's bad. People have been killed. For all that long day, Boris, Vasily, and the other young communists were kept on duty. It was not their job to turn vehicles back. That was work for the militiamen. For the Komsomols, the task was to make sure that none of the diverted vehicles got hopelessly stuck in the sunflower field, to try to keep them from doing more damage to the crop than was absolutely necessary, and when trucks turned up with water and food for the guards, to help serve it. It was not glamorous work, and it was not enjoyable, for no one seemed to have any hard facts about what was happening at Chernobyl. The traffic was almost all one way going in. The vehicles that came back were generally ambulances, and none of them stopped. To be sure, the best source of news was the sky to the north, for there an occasional wavering dark pillar of smoke on the horizon told its own story. Vasily would not have believed there could be so much to burn. When a truck at last came from the city and stopped, Vasily was the first to reach its side. Is the city burning? When Komsomol demanded. But the people in the truck were only young pioneers, twelve and thirteen years old, and they knew very little. No, certainly Pipiat itself was not on fire. What an idea. But yes, of course, the fire in the power plant was very severe. No one could say when it might be under control, and none of them had any knowledge at all of Vasily Smin's father or of Boris Sheranchuk's, or indeed of anything at all, except that when their pioneer troop had been called out to put up these signs, they had been frightened. The signs were placards with the ominous three-cornered radiation symbol in bright red, and a warning to keep out. The pioneers toddled off in groups of three and four to hammer them into place in a perimeter that would completely surround Chernobyl. Surround Chernobyl, in a perimeter thirty kilometers away, Vasily could not swallow the thought. The sun was dropping toward the horizon, but inside his protective smock, Vasily was sweating. When it got dark and another truck came up, with bread, tea, and vegetable soup, he hung back until the militiamen had gotten theirs. Then he took his tin tray away to a corner under an old tree, and while he ate, he wept, staring at the ugly red glow that hung over the northern horizon. He stayed at his post until after midnight, when a Soviet army truck took the exhausted Komsomols back to Pripyat. After the manner of boys and puppies, Vasily was ready to drop. But even so, he had enough energy to be astonished at how peaceful the town was. Could it be possible that they didn't know? Of course, at midnight, one did not expect much activity in the streets of Pripyat. But nothing. When he got out of the elevator and entered the sixteenth-floor apartment he shared with his parents. He thought of eating and dismissed it, thought of bathing 
and put that aside, too, but stood for a moment at the window that looked out toward the plant. He could not see the smoke in the darkness, but there were still lights there. He threw himself onto his bed, thoroughly shaken. His father's power station could not have blown up. It was the very latest triumph of Soviet technology, with all the safety features his father had been proud to display to him as they toured the giant plant. It was too big and too magnificent to explode. And besides, it was his father's. Chapter 10 Saturday, April 26th At nine o'clock on this Saturday morning, the Chernobyl nuclear power station is no longer a part of the Ukrainian electrical grid. No energy flows out along the high-tension lines. Reactors 1, 2, and 3 have been tripped to zero output, and the terrible fires, the fires in the buildings at least, have been declared out long since. It is only the hundreds of tons of graphite in the exposed core of reactor number four that continue to burn. So far, only one edge of the graphite is ablaze, with the blue-white heat as painful to the eyes as looking at the sun itself. And the firemen can do nothing about it. Their hoses still play on the roofs of the nearby buildings, on the smoldering heaps of rubble, on the walls around the wreck of number four. But they have not been able to extinguish the graphite, it is simply too hot. The water flashes into instant steam. There is another problem with using the fire hoses. The water that does trickle away from the core and from each bit of radioactive matter, small or large, dissolves radioactive material as it flows, and then it carries that radioactivity with it wherever it happens to go. On that morning, Vasily Smin's father was sitting in a militia car ten meters outside the gate of the Chernobyl nuclear power station, feverishly making notes. They had the windows rolled up tight in the car, and the militia colonel at the wheel was smoking a Bulgarian tobacco cigarette, the kind that laborers bought for 40 kopecks a pack. The car was filled with the heavy smoke. Smin didn't notice. He didn't even hear when, now and then, the militiaman picked up the microphone and issued commands on his radio, or when messages crackled in. Smin had pushed back the white hood of his garment because it made his face and neck itch. He was sweating, and the scar tissue could not sweat, and trying to get everything down while it was all fresh. It was a list of the things that had gone wrong because of deficiencies in training, equipment, and supplies. It was becoming quite a long list. Doctors not trained radiation sickness. Fire brigades not trained radiation procedures. No radiation protective garments for station. No respirators. Need equipment for station plus near towns, etc. Need repeated drills, emergency procedures. Smin paused, scratching the itchy scars just below his ear and gazing blankly out at the emergency vehicles that were standing around, engines running, while the few active firemen continued to play their cooling hoses on the endangered walls. None of the things he had written, he realized, attacked the real question. What in the name of God had gone wrong? He wondered if he would ever find out. The stories he had pieced together, that one by one the operators had systematically dismantled all the safety systems, just when the reactor was at its touchiest condition, were simply too fantastic. Smin refused to believe that anyone in the Chernobyl plant could have been that arrogantly stupid. It was almost easier to accept the possibility of that word that had not been much heard in the Soviet Union in recent decades sabotage. But that, too, was impossible to believe. Yes, certainly, the CIA or the chinks, they were quite capable of blowing up a power plant simply to inconvenience the Soviets. But there was no way such a thing could have been possible without the concurrence of everyone in the main control room. And to believe that was as preposterous as to believe in simple, crass, spectacularly gross stupidity. And the cost of it, not simply the ruble cost, though that was going to be heavy, not even the cost to the plan. It was the cost to human beings that weighed on Simeon Smin. So many casualties. Nearly 100 of the worst already on their way to the airstrip in the town of Chernobyl, where a special plane was going to take them right up to Moscow for treatment. And two dead already. One man never found, but dead all right because he had been last seen in the reactor hall itself, minutes before the blast. The other dying early this morning in the Pripyat hospital, 
with burns over 80% of his body and terrible radiation damage as well. And there would be more. He bent to the pad on his knee and wrote quickly, Anti-Flash Cream, Special Burn Facility in Hospital. Comrade Smin, eh? He looked up at the militiaman, who was replacing the microphone on the dashboard again. I said the helicopter from Kiev will be landing one kilometer away, by the river, in five minutes, with the team from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy. Oh, of course, said Smin, looking at his watch. Nine o'clock. They'd made good time. Would you mind driving me out to meet them? And as the militia officer started to say, of course... Smeen said sharply, No, wait. Can you turn on that outside speaker of yours? He was scowling out the window at the idle firemen in their white hoods and jumpsuits, clustered in knots as they watched their comrades playing water on the walls. You there! Smeen cried into the microphone, and heard his amplified voice bounced back to him. Get those men behind shelter. Have you forgotten everything you've just been taught about radiation? As they turned to gaze at him, he snarled, Do you want your balls fried? It was satisfying to see them jump. But how long had they been standing in the open like that before he noticed them? As the militia car pulled away from the plant gate, Smin caught a glimpse through the trees of the bright towers of the town of Pripyat, prettily colored in the morning sun. He should, he thought, have put his message to his wife and son more strongly, so that they would keep away until things became more normal, if things ever would. But Smin, at least, had a pretty clear idea of what the radionuclides that had erupted from reactor number four were going to do to the buildings, streets, and soil of Pripyat, once the wind changed, were already doing, no doubt, to the little farm villages in Belarusia, just across the border to the north. Smin recognized the little park by the river. It was where people swam in the summer, and the plant's football team practiced on its greensward. Now the goal cages had been torn away, and the people there were not playing football. Some were on stretchers, waiting for the airlift to the larger hospital in Chernobyl. Smin was surprised to see Chief Engineer Varazian bustling toward him. The man was neatly dressed, even freshly shaved, though the lines on his face suggested he had not slept. Eh, Simeon, Varazian sighed gloomily. What a night. Wouldn't you know the minute the director goes out of town? Then he brightened. You'll be glad to know that I've made sure all our observer guests are safe, and I've made arrangements for the new ones from the Ministry. Well, that's very good anyway, Smeet said wonderingly. Exactly. Put the past behind us. Get on with the work ahead, right, Simeon? But I'd better be doing it than talking about it, Barazin said, and trotted away, glancing up at the sky. Smeet shook his head. Was it possible the man thought that escorting the observers to Pripyat would do anything to ameliorate the miseries that lay ahead for him? Well, for both of them, to be sure, Smin thought resignedly. But there was no time to worry about that sort of thing now. He peered up into the sky. He could hear the helicopter approaching from the southeast, but it did not come directly to the pad. It veered away and slowly circled the Chernobyl plant. Sensible of them to take a good look at the ruins, Smin thought and wished he could do the same. Deputy Director Smin. It was one of the Panamarenka brothers, the footballer they called Autumn. Smin searched for his actual name and came up with it. Hello, Vladimir. No game today, after all. No. Can you tell me, please, if you know anything of my cousin Vyacheslav? They say he is missing. Was he on duty? Smin thought for a moment. Yes, of course he was, on the night shift. Well, no, I haven't seen him. Probably he had the good sense to go home when the plant was evacuated. He isn't at home, Deputy Director Smin. Thank you. I'll go on looking. Panamarenka hesitated. My brother is in the hospital over there, he said, waving toward the distant towers of Pripyat. He got some radio thing. He'll have the best of care, Smin promised trying to sound more certain than he was. We can't spare the four seasons, after all. He glanced up. The helicopter from Kiev had completed its leisurely tour and was fluttering down toward them. Well, here come the experts from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy. So we'll have everything straightened out quickly now. 
It was a way of trying to reassure the football player. But it was not, Smin admitted to himself, a realistic statement. Even the experts from the ministry had had no experience of anything like this, since nothing like it had ever happened before. Not even in America, Smin thought wryly, remembering how he had boasted to the Americans just the night before. It was a definite first in nuclear technology, and once again the Soviet Union had led the way. There were four of the experts from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy jumping out of the helicopter, and Chief Engineer Varazin was ducking under the blades even before they had stopped revolving to greet them. Smin recognized a couple of the men, but Varazin introduced them all around anyway. Comrades Istvili, Rasputin, Vestilian, he said, and waited for them to introduce the fourth man. They didn't. Rasputin, the one Smin had not met before, shook Smin's hand heartily. No, I am not the mad monk, he said, smiling. I'm simply from the section on biological effects of radiation. I'm not related to the writer, either. A pity, Varazin said shattily. My wife is a great admirer of his thrillers. He hesitated. I thought perhaps our director Zaglodzin might have been with you. Izdvili shook his head. He was a tall, heavy-set man, with the dark, almost Mediterranean look of a Georgian. We hoped that, too. But he had not been located when our special plane left Moscow. At six this morning, he added. It's been a long trip. Of course, Varazin sympathized. Well, I've prepared a command post just five kilometers away. It will all be ready when you require it. I think it will be suitable. But first I'm sure you would like to inspect the station. Smin was listening in amazement to the casual chatter. Why, Varazin was talking to these men exactly as though they were visiting Yemenis, no more than a mild annoyance to a busy man. Can I borrow your helicopter? he asked brusquely. Istvili understood at once. Of course. It's worth a look from above. Then, he glanced at his watch. It's eighteen minutes after nine now. Can we meet at ten in this command post for a first conference? Good. Then let's go. Simeon Smin had seldom been in a helicopter before, but the rapid, efficient movements of the pilot didn't interest him on this occasion. His eyes were all for the plant. Stay away from that plume of smoke, he ordered the pilot. Not too low, not below two hundred meters, but get as close as you can. Of course, the pilot said, not even looking around. No doubt he had had the same orders from his last passengers. But Smin wasn't listening either. He was staring out the window, scuttling over to the seat on the other side as the helicopter turned, keeping the plant always in view. As they approached from the undamaged side, over the cooling pond, the plant looked almost normal, at least if you did not count the pall of dark smoke that was drifting slowly northward from the still smoldering embers. Firemen were methodically removing their suction hoses from the pond. The roof was not yet in view. Then it was, and Smin groaned. There were still firemen on the roof, and they were still playing hoses on patches that smoked. Idiots! Didn't they know the debris on the roof was radioactive? Some of it right out of the core itself? Then as the helicopter lurched upward, the ruin of reactor number four came into view, and Smin forgot about the endangered firemen. From the ground he had not seen quite how terrible the destruction was. There was actually nothing at all left of the reactor building. No refueling hall, no roof. He saw twisted metal that might once have been the refueling crane. Most of all, he saw the naked core itself. He squinted between his fingers, instinctively protected his eyes, suddenly aware that even two hundred meters was not too far to be from that radioactive ember. An arc of brilliant blue-white light from one edge showed the burning graphite. Not more than ten percent of the exposed surface burning now, Smin thought and wondered if that was less than an hour ago, or more. The helicopter veered away from the smoke plume. The pilot called, Shall I duck under the smoke, or would you like to go back around again? Smin sank back in his seat. I've seen enough, he said. Varazin's command center turned out to be nothing more or less than Varazin's own comfortable dacha, set a hundred meters off the road in the fir forest. Its large main room was twice the size of anything in Smin's flat. 
but it was crowded by the time the meeting began. Smin, Varazin, the four men from the ministry, the general of fire brigades, the head doctor from the Pripyat hospital, Khrenov, looking worn but confident, two men from the Council of Ministers of the Ukrainian Republic. When had they arrived? Half a dozen from the Pripyat party committee, an army general. Smin looked at the crowd in dismay. This was an emergency meeting, not a party rally. It was his firm conviction that the effectiveness of any conference was in inverse ratio to the number of people sitting around the table. And over five, you might as well sleep through the proceedings. But Istvili, the Georgian from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy, took firm charge. For a man who'd been wakened at four in the morning and had been traveling ever since, he was surprisingly clear-eyed and collected. We won't wait for the people coming from Kiev by car, he announced. Our first order of business is a situation report. I understand the Chernobyl plant is now completely shut down. I gave the order for reactors one and two myself, nodded Varazian. As a precaution. Of course I consulted the load dispatchers in Kiev first. So that situation is stable, said Istvili. Now we come to damage control. The fire was extinguished at eight minutes after three this morning, said the general of fire brigades. Smin cut in. Yes, but excuse me, your firemen are still on the roof and the hoses are still going. The general looked down his nose at him. They are cooling the scene down and extinguishing small outbreaks. I don't think I'm making myself clear. All that water from the hoses is contaminated with radioactivity. It must go somewhere, and wherever it goes, it's dangerous. Radiation, said the general thoughtfully. That's not our concern. Our business is fighting fires, and we put this one out in an hour and a half. Radiation is your business. It's the business of your firemen, too. They're in great danger out there without protective gear. Istvili raised a hand. Please. Two issues have been raised now. Contamination of water from the runoff from the fire and proper gear for the workers controlling the damage. When we have finished... What is it, Barajan? The chief engineer only wanted to announce, There is some tea and mineral water coming in now. My wife is bringing it. And his wife, with a young girl beside her, was hovering in the doorway, trays in their hands. Thank you, comrade Barazian, Istvili said dryly. As I was about to say, when we have finished this preliminary conference, we will establish working groups to deal with each of these. First, we have to deal with immediate problems. The graphite in the core is still burning. Everyone turned to look at the fire commander. He looked annoyed. That is a different question from the fire in the structure, he explained. However, we are continuing to hose it. We have more pumpers coming, even a couple of water cannon. They should drown it, just as the British did at Windscale. No, no, cried Smin. But the other man from the ministry, Vestilian, spoke ahead of him. That is unacceptable for the reason Smin has given. Also, it probably will just fracture the graphite and expose more combustible surfaces to the air. We'll have to cover the core. What with? the fireman demanded. Foam's out of the question. Things much denser than foam. Sand, clay, even lead. Probably boron, too, because that swallows neutrons. And how are you going to get it on the core? The fire commander asked sarcastically. Do you want my men to carry it up there in hogs like bricklayers? Listilian said crisply, Of course we will need heavy earth-moving machinery. That, too, I think, should be referred to a working group. Exactly, Isvili said promptly. In fifteen minutes, I will adjourn this meeting and we will start the work of the groups. Comrade Rasputin, do you want to say anything about the casualties and risks? All of the injured are being evacuated. The Pripyat Hospital can't handle them all, so most of them are being sent elsewhere. The head of the hospital raised his hand. The hospital itself should be evacuated, I think, and probably also the town itself. Of course, Smin put in, as soon as possible. One of the men from the Council of Ministers in Kiev stirred himself. Why, of course. The wind is blowing the smoke the other way, isn't it? It could change at any moment. That's true, added Rasputin. And rain would be a serious added problem. Rain brings fallout. It was raining in Kiev earlier this morning. It isn't raining here. 
Evacuation would cause mass panic, the man from Kiev stated. Then at least the people should be informed, Smeen said doggedly. The man frowned. That decision is not ours to take, Comrade Smeen. But if we wait for Moscow to approve, it could be ours. At least let us have an announcement on the Pripyat radio station, Smeen urged. Istvili took over command of the meeting. We simply do not have enough information yet for public announcements to be made. When we have full facts to give them, yes, then it will be authorized. For now that discussion is closed. Now let us turn to the cause of the accident. There was one thing you could say for these high-powered people from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy, Smin thought to himself. At least they got things done. All three of the section chiefs had spoken quickly but unhurriedly. The meeting had been going less than seven minutes by Smin's watch. Against his will, Smin was beginning to respect, even almost to like them. It was hard for him to remember that these men were the they who had bombarded him every week with stern orders to hurry up, increase the proportion of working time, fulfill the plan. Even the fourth man, the one no one had bothered to introduce, was appearing to be getting down to business. For the first part of the meeting, he had been sitting quietly, smoking a cigarette and sipping his cup of tea as he gave each speaker polite but detached attention. But now that they had come to the question of the cause of the accident... He had taken out a pencil and was beginning to make notes. It appears, said Istvili, that the accident occurred during the course of an unusual experiment, which involved shutting off some or all of the safety systems of reactor number four. Is that correct? Chief Engineer Varazian set his cup down so hard he spilled some tea. It was not an unusual experiment. It was approved in advance in all particulars by the Ministry. Not quite in all particulars, I think, said Istvili. Not to take place at one o'clock in the morning. Not without a safety inspector present. Varazin said obstinately, There was no directive about the time or about safety inspectors. There was also no directive giving authority to dismantle the automatic systems, however, Istvili pointed out, and Smin sucked in a deep breath. Then it's true, he groaned. Is it? The idiots turned everything off. My God, Varazian, how could you let them? Chief Engineer Varazian had never been a really close friend. But it was in that moment, Smin saw, that he had converted him into an irreconcilable enemy. The engineer kept his face straight, but muscles were jumping in his cheeks as he ground out, At least I was there. And if you are so wise, Deputy Director Smin, why weren't you yourself present? The whole meeting waited patiently for Smin's answer. Why? Because the chief engineer should have been responsible? Because at last word the experiments had been postponed indefinitely? Because he had not for one second imagined such stupidity? Smin shook his head, more to himself than to the men from the commission. I agree that I should have been present, he said clearly, and watched the silent man from Moscow carefully writing his words down writing his words down writing his words down writing his words chapter 11 Saturday, April 26th Dean Garfield is 34 years old and he really is a highly successful television producer in America the reason for that perhaps is that his father's money from the jewelry findings business had paid for four years and a subsequent master's degree from the University of Southern California at just the right time in the early 1970s. Just then, a lot of bright young college boys were getting ready to be the film and TV geniuses of the later 1970s. And they remembered their classmates when they got big. A consequence of that, perhaps, is his wife. Candace Garfield, her professional name is Candace Merlin, was the star of Garfield's first sitcom. Unfortunately, the show failed to get past the eight-week cutoff, and Candace had been looking for another series ever since. She is very happy about Garfield's present success with his all-black series, which has just been picked up for a third year, except that there are no ongoing parts in it for tall, beautiful blondes. She is confident, however, that she could play a tall, beautiful blonde Soviet nuclear engineer, or Soviet almost anything, in a new series, and she has been developing this idea for Garfield since breakfast. Actually, it started out as Dean Garfield's own idea. It came to him as he was peering out the window, 
slightly hungover and too restless to sleep, at the misty Ukrainian sunrise over the city of Kiev. When he saw that his wife's eyes were opened and watching him from the bed, he grinned. I guess I'm all charged up. How many Americans get to see the inside of a real Russian home? Ukrainian, anyway, he amended. You know what? There ought to be a story here. All this local color. Let's go out and take a look at the city. We already saw the city, Candace yawned. I haven't got the strength for one more museum of teeny tiny paintings on human hairs. I don't mean the tourist stuff. I mean the way the people live. Ride in the subway. Walk around a tenement district. See a, I don't know, or whatever they have to eat in it's like a McDonald's. That in tourist guide is really not going to like that, his wife said absentmindedly because actually she had begun to take an interest when he used the word story. So screw the in-tourist guide, Garfield said happily. We'll just tell the hall lady, hey, no speak Russian. Then we take off. What can they do? His wife was looking doubtful, but persuadable. Dean, are we talking about a new television series? I don't know what I'm talking about. Yet. All I'm saying is, what could it hurt to hang around and take a look? And so they had, even though the hall lady had done a lot of head-shaking, even though it had begun to rain. During the morning they had found their way into a grocery store and a dairy store, even a department store. Candace Garfield aghast at the people waiting in one line simply to see what was available to buy, then a second line to pay the cashier, then a third line at last to get whatever it was. They never did find anything like a McDonald's, but they decided to treat themselves to the best meal they could find in Kiev. By the time they were ready for lunch, Dean Garfield was just about convinced that not only was there a possible show, but his wife might well be the star of it. Maybe you shouldn't be an engineer, he said thoughtfully as they waited for a table at the Dynamo restaurant. How about if you were an in-tourist guide? You get into all sorts of funny situations with the tourists, you know? Every week there's a new batch of tourists, American, Japanese, everything. So we have guest stars doing vignettes, like Love Boat. She was frowning as the head waiter led them up the stairs to a table on the balcony, but it was a frown of concentration, not anger. Garfield well knew the difference. He sat down with a groan of satisfaction. It's nice to get off my feet, he observed, glancing around. They had been walking around Kiev for four hours, and Candace had been talking the whole time. The hangover was gone, and he was getting really hungry. When the waitress arrived with the menu, he didn't even look at it. Ten days of travel in the USSR had taught him that of the hundred dishes printed in any given menu, only the dozen or so with prices attached were ever available, and not necessarily all of those. Do you speak English, he asked. When she shook her head, he got up and looked around at the other tables. When he saw something that looked edible, he pointed to it, then to himself and held up two fingers. Not steak, I hope, Candace said absently. She had her glasses on and was already writing things in her notebook. I think it's kind of a veal stew, said Garfield. Smelled good, anyway. And I ordered a bottle of that white wine over there. He lit a cigarette and gazed down at the floor below. There seemed to be at least two wedding parties, one bride in traditional white, though without a veil or a train, the other in a pale green business suit. A four-piece orchestra was playing what Garfield recognized as raindrops keep falling on my head, and two couples were on the tiny dance floor. Even if we don't get a show out of it, I'm glad we decided to stay, he told his wife. Candace looked up from her notes. You do get some really neat ideas sometimes, hon she acknowledged. You know, I was a little worried that some KGB guy might grab us for running around without an escort or something. Garfield accepted the complimentary tone with a modest shrug. I was pretty sure they wouldn't bother us, he said. Although, in fact, for the first hour or two, he had felt an uneasy itch every time any Russian looked twice at them. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to see my relatives again. Only how are we going to get in touch with them? Candace had already returned to her scribbling. Call them up, she said absently. Call up who, where? Simeon doesn't live in Kiev, and I don't know Aunt Atasia's address. 
The old lady had phoned them at the hotel and then sent a car for them the day before. And it had not occurred to Garfield to ask for addresses or phone numbers. There has to be a telephone book, said Candace. In Russian? Besides, the old gal doesn't have a phone. So we wait until Monday and call up the power plant. Listen, I'm an tourist guide, like you said. Maybe sometimes I'm a stew on Aeroflot. Each week we get a different bunch of tourists, and we go to different locations. Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, I don't know, maybe Tashkent, Yalta. There's a million places in Russia. Like Love Boat, you know. We get in a lot of scenery, right? How are we going to do all of those locations? She put the ballpoint pen down to look at him over the top of her glasses. You don't think the Russians will cooperate with filming? I'm thinking about production costs, he said. Not to mention trying to get along with Russian film labs and technicians. I'm thinking about a title role for me, said Candace decisively. How about calling it Comrade Tanya? You can figure out the location stuff. Send a crew to go all over for background shots. Hell, Dean, there's probably plenty of stock footage around. Cathedrals, rivers, airports. Then what do you need? A bus, a hotel lobby and some rooms. A beach, any beach will do. Just put a lot of people on it in Russian bathing suits. It could happen, Garfield conceded. And then when he saw the beginnings of that other kind of frown. I mean, we'll certainly give it a shot. I'll get a writer in as soon as we get back. And here's our wine. The stew turned out to be pork rather than veal, and the white wine was warm, but it was still a good lunch. What made it a particularly good lunch was that Candace was bubbling over with her new idea, and Dean Garfield had begun to feel confident that even if no part of it ever got before a camera, the development would make their whole Soviet tour beautifully and unchallengeably tax-deductible. He used up their last roll of film shooting the bridal parties, the wood-beam ceilings, the waiters in their dinner jackets, the funny little orchestra with three of the four players female. Even the terrible thick sweet coffee did not blight his mood. He leaned back and lit a cigarette, regarding his beautiful wife. Nearly everyone in the restaurant had stared at this tall, slim American woman in the pale blue suit. It was Garfield's opinion that the women were looking at the suit and the men were busy imagining what was under it. It wasn't a new thought for him. That was his general opinion every time they went out together, and he was certain it was right. He did the same kind of looking himself. He was doing it now as he contemplated his wife across the table, though in his case he was not imagining but remembering. Though not unfortunately from recent experience, it was not only on the love boat that couples went traveling to try to save their marriages. He stubbed out his cigarette decisively. Since Candace had filled the ashtray with the carefully amputated fat from her pork stew, he had to use a saucer. I think, he said, we could use a little nap about now, don't you? So let's go back to the hotel. His wife gave him a good-humored look. So let's at least finish the wine while we're here. Then maybe I'll show you my scar, like the old lady. Yeah, tell me about it. She actually showed you a bullet wound. I'd like to see that. Candace laughed. Not a chance. It's right near her crotch. She had to take her underwear off to show me. And honest, hon, you wouldn't believe the kind of bloomers she had on. She said she got it in the Revolution. Well, the teacher said it was the Civil War. Is that the same thing? The old lady said all kinds of stuff. But that lady school teacher only translated about a quarter of it. That's a pain. Even if we did get a chance to see them again, how are you going to talk to them? We'll worry about that on Monday, Garfield said expansively. Finish your wine. I'm real anxious for a little lie down. It was turning out, he thought, to be a pretty good day. They even found a taxi letting people out in front of the restaurant, and the driver was even willing to take them to their hotel. Only when they got out of the elevator and presented their hotel card to the concierge or keeper, or whatever the old woman who kept an eye on everything was called, it began to go sour. The first thing was that Candace gave a faint scream as she saw all their luggage piled behind the woman's desk. The second was when the woman told them, in heavily accented English, 
that they were, after all, scheduled to leave for Tbilisi that morning with the rest of their entourist group. Their room was needed for new guests, who were in fact already occupying it, and would they please remove the bags at once. But I left a note at the desk, Garfield cried. I told them we changed our plans. The woman looked shocked. No, that is impossible. Your group has already left. You must immediately go to reception and clear your bill. Then a porter will remove your luggage. Reception was no kinder. No, there were no rooms available in the Great Gate Hotel. No, there would be no rooms in any other hotel in Kiev either. After all, it was coming time for the May Day celebration in just a few days, and every hotel was naturally full. Garfield turned his back on his wife because he did not want to see the look on her face. Well, he said, his tone self-assured and relaxed in just the way that had seen him bluff his way through many a meeting with network executives. I'm sure there's some place we can stay. Not necessarily a hotel. A private home. You know, a kind of bed and breakfast place. It is against the law for foreign nationals to stay at the home of any Soviet citizen, she said primly. But then what are we going to do, he cried. But the best the reception clerk would do was to concede, We will store your luggage for you until you pick it up. She nodded graciously, turned her back, and disappeared into another room. Garfield opened his mouth to call after her, but his wife was plucking urgently at his sleeve. Let's go outside, she said. Her tone prevented Garfield from arguing. Out in the street, he complained. But we can't sleep in the street, hon. She said tightly, There was a man standing right behind you and he was listening to every word. What are you talking about? You mean like somebody with the secret police? But we haven't done anything. Come on, she said, pulling him down the street. Passing citizens were looking at them curiously. Candace was silent until they had rounded a corner. Then she turned on her husband. You should have made sure about the room before we went out, she accused. What are we going to do now? Now don't worry, honey. He said in his confident network meeting voice, We've got plenty of traveler's checks. This is a big city. There's bound to be some place. Why don't we get in touch with tourist? He thought for a moment. Nah, he said. We just have to do the routine tourist things. Then he grinned. This could be a real adventure, you know. And I bet we'll get some good stuff for Comrade Tanya. He could see her doubts wavering. We'll just find a room. God knows it won't be the Beverly Wilshire, but we can stand it for a couple of days. Worst come to worst, there's Aunt Tasia's apartment. She's got an extra room, because the Spins were going to sleep in it last night. She reminded him, how are you going to find them? And anyway, an adventure's one thing. Breaking some kind of Russian law is another. You heard what the woman said about renting rooms to foreigners. Garfield thought for a moment. We'll keep Aunt Tasia as a last resort, he conceded. Well, what about Simeon? He's a big wheel. He can pull some strings for us. Dean, she said patiently, he doesn't live in Kiev. Do you even know the name of the town where he lives? And, oh God, here comes that man again. Garfield spun around. It was true. The man coming toward them was, he recognized, the same one he had seen in the hotel lobby. He did not look like Dean Garfield's idea of a KGB operative. He was not much more than twenty years old. He looked quickly about, and then said ingratiatingly, Please, you excuse me. You want house room to sleep? I know nice place. Right near bus to metro. You have USA dollars to pay. You have USA dollars to pay. You have USA dollars to pay. Chapter 12 Sunday, April 27th. The home of Simeon Smin and his family is not a flat. It is a handsome apartment on the 16th floor of one of Pripyat's best buildings, and it has five rooms. Five. It is, of course, also in keeping with Smin's high position, and besides, they can quite properly claim space for Nikolai, their elder son. Nikolai Smin is now on duty with the Air Force, though Selena Smin does not like to think about where. It is a very comfortable home. The kitchen has a stand-up freezer as well as the fridge. The bath has a stall shower in addition to the tub. It also has a bidet. And Selena Smin has already engaged an engineer to make sure the floor is sturdy enough to bear the weight of the next fixture she hopes to acquire. 
She has almost succeeded in arranging for the importation of a jacuzzi to replace the tub. The bed she shares with Smin is king-sized, with sheets from England and a white Irish lace counterpane. And there may not be another like it anywhere in the Ukraine. There are coffee table books in Russian, French, and German in the living room. The prize book is a wonderfully illustrated volume on the art treasures of Leningrad's hermitage, printed originally for export only, and hence regarded as a rare book. But there are also handsome volumes of travel scenes from all over the world, and there is a glass-topped coffee table from East Germany to put them on. There is, of course, a television set in the living room, and it has a VCR attached. The Spins possess a library of nearly twenty video cassettes, mostly of ballets and operas for the parents, but with four or five American films that belong to Vasily. His special favorite is Jesus Christ Superstar. There is a second small television in Vasily's room, which has posters of Soviet spacecraft and cosmonauts on the wall, and a signed portrait of the American astronaut Edgar Mitchell. Siljana would deny that they live Brezhnev style although she would point out that since her husband has had his job since Brezhnev's time, they had every right to the more opulent display that was the acceptable. With all her activities, Selena can't hope to keep such a large apartment in order, but there is a seventeen-year-old maid from the nearby Kolkhoz who comes in every morning at seven, and if there are guests, sometimes remains until almost midnight. When Selena came to her apartment that Sunday morning, the maid was absent. So was her husband. But her younger son, Vasily, was slumbering fully dressed across the checkered spread of his bed. His clothes were stained and muddy. He was snoring gently. Siljena let him sleep. There was nothing she specially wanted to say to him, now that she knew he was alive. There was not even anything she wanted to hear from him. For Siljena Smin had heard too much, and seen and experienced and felt too much in the last twenty-four hours. What she wanted was for it all to go away so that she could get back to organizing a May Day party for a few selected friends and planning for the jacuzzi. As a practical matter, the first thing for her to do was to get clean. Siljena had been wearing the same clothes for two days. She put the tea kettle on, running her finger along the edge of the gas range, and resolving to have a word with the maid when the girl chose to show herself again, and got under the shower. There was only a trickle of lukewarm water, the kitchen tap had been slow, too. Siljena sighed and used the tepid flow as thriftily as she could, soaping herself thoroughly. She thought wistfully of the jacuzzi and glumly of the last two days in Kiev. The visit with the American cousins had been exciting and pleasurable, but it now seemed like something that had happened to her when she was a young girl, like the first solo part in the student production of Swan Lake, or the time when Simeon Smin had taken her out among the cherry trees to tell her he wished to make her his wife. The orderly part of her mind filed a reminder to speak to Smin again about that apartment in his mother's name. Was it really worthwhile to have a pied -a in the city when it was in a Khrushchev slum? Siljana Smin did not dislike her husband's mother. In fact, they got on rather well. But really, what an odd fish her mother-in-law was. What was the use of a mother-in-law who knew everyone in high places, at least knew everyone's father or even grandfather, when she lived like a collective farm pensioner. Yes, all right. Avtasia Smin preferred to live quietly and inconspicuously. Very well, nothing should prevent her. But couldn't her son get a nicer apartment, in a better neighborhood, with more space to store clothing and other things they might need? And for the love of heaven, at least a telephone. And preferably without the grandmother sharing it. And while she was at it, a little car of her own, if only a Muskvich, perhaps, so that she would never again have to take a bus from Kiev to Pripyat, and then to be dumped unceremoniously at a checkpoint, with fifteen other passengers hoping to get somewhere in the perimeter, left to make their own way to their destinations if they possibly could. She had not been alone. Ivana Khrenovna, the wife of the Director of Personnel and Security, had been caught in the same checkpoint. No car to meet her when she returned to the Kiev airport from her trip to visit relatives in Smolensk. Her hired taxi turned back at the checkpoint by soldiers who did not care whose wife she was, or who Selena was, for that matter. Even Yvanla had had to shout to get an ambulance to take her the mere two kilometers to her own home. But at least she had given Selena space in the ambulance. 
Despite the meager supply of water, the shower refreshed Selena. She began to think of what had to be done. There was food in the refrigerator, so the special distribution from the stores had arrived, and she didn't have to worry about shopping. Vasily should not be allowed to sleep all day, otherwise he would not get to sleep this night. Her husband would certainly be home, or call home before long, and he would have to tell her whether this thing at the power plant was likely to cause any inconvenience to their plans for a May Day party to watch the fireworks. Those were the things that crossed the orderly part of Selena Smin's brain. But as she was toweling herself and gazing out the window, she saw the pall of smoke that had been visible from many kilometers away and felt an uneasy lance of doubt pierce her comfortable sense of security. She was trying one more time, without hope, to get through to the plant on the telephone when she heard the elevator grind to her floor. Its door rattled and slammed. There was a key in her door, and her husband came in. Ah, you're here. Good, he said. Is there anything to eat? Selena Smin had never seen her husband look as he now did. His tailored suit was filthy. The cuffs of his trousers soaked with mud. His shoes a wreck. His plump face seemed to have lost weight. There were ash-gray half-moons under his eyes, and that terrible scar of shiny flesh almost seemed to gleam. Oh, my dear, she said, helping him off with his coat. Sit down. Wait, I'll find you something. You look terrible. What has happened? Simeon Smeen looked at his wife with eyes that were reddened with broken veins. He waved an arm to the window, where the serpentine crawl of smoke bent toward the northern sky. That has happened, he said. The soup was more than two days old, but it seemed all right to Siliena's sniff, and she boiled it for an extra minute to make sure. The bread was quite fresh. By the time Smeen had come out of the shower in his quilted brown robe, she had the meal on the table. Did you have enough water in the shower? He said, no more than enough anyway. There is a temporary power restriction. I suppose it has affected the pumps for our building. Selena poured tea. You ought to rest, she scolded. When I have eaten, he said. I will sleep for one hour, no more. Be sure to wake me. You really must go back to the plant. Who else, said Smin, his mouth full of bread. The director is still in Moscow. The chief engineer fell apart last night. Now he is attempting to run things from six kilometers away. Selena put a spoon in her own bowl of soup, but just stirred it around. It is really bad, she said, not as a question. Smin said, of the 300 technical workers, 40 are in the hospital, and 103 have reported for duty. The rest have simply run away and not come back. I don't blame them, Selena cried, surprising herself. I wish you wish, Smin filled in for her, that you hadn't come back either. So do I. It is not safe here, Siliana. It might blow up? It already has blown up, he corrected her. It is not explosions you have to worry about. That smoke is full of poison. Every bit of it. Oh, God, wait. And he got up from the table, closing the windows. Never leave a window open until I say you may, he commanded. While I am sleeping, dust the sills. Dust everything that has dust on it. Any kind of dust. Use newspapers. Then throw them away and wash your hands very carefully. But the maid... We will see the maid again, Smin said heavily, when pigs fly. Or when this situation is under control, whichever comes first. And the clothes I just took off are in a paper bag. Don't open it. Just throw them away. Your good suit. Smin sighed and didn't answer. Then mopping up the last of the soup... When Vasya wakes up, don't let him go out. If anyone comes for him, say he has been vomiting. They will think it is radiation sickness, and they will leave him alone. Radiation sickness? Can't you do anything but repeat what I say? Smin asked almost jocularly. Please, do it. And don't go out yourself. When I have an opportunity, I will arrange to have both of you evacuated. Perhaps back to Babushka in Kiev. Pack what you need but no more than two suitcases. 
For how long must I pack? Selena asked. She was not surprised when her husband didn't answer. He got up from the table and walked slowly into their bedroom, moving as though his back pained him, as it often did. She cleared the table, bent to find some old newspapers, and began carrying out her husband's instructions about wiping up dust. When she dampened the wadded-up papers, the flow from the kitchen faucet was even weaker than before. She thought she would weep. Instead, she flung the papers to the floor and marched into the bedroom. Smeen was not in bed. He was standing at the window, looking at the pall of smoke. Selena, he said without looking at her, it is really very bad. It exploded. There was no chance to do anything. If we don't put it out, there will be dead people all over the Soviet Union from the radiation in that smoke. And how we will put it out, God alone knows. Nothing is working. She said desperately, You will find a way, Senior. I hope so. I do not have your confidence. But you will. I am sure of it. And then when the inquiry is held, of course the director will have to go. And then your turn. She stopped, because her husband had turned to stare at her. My dear Selena, he said, are you thinking that I will gain from this? Everyone knows you do all his work. Certainly you are entitled to promotion. Promotion? It is true, she insisted. The director, he was never here. And he is, after all, the man in charge. As everyone understands, you simply correct his mistakes and cover up his failings. Surely he is the one to blame. Smin studied his wife for a moment. Can you really believe, he asked gently, that there will not be blame enough for everyone? Chapter 13 Sunday, April 27th The town of Pripyat, with its shops, its film theater, its library, its five schools, its hostels and apartments for nearly 50,000 people, exists only to serve the Chernobyl nuclear power station. Pripyat is a new town, enclosed by wide fir and pine forests. Few of the buildings are much more than ten years old. Neither is the Chernobyl nuclear power station itself. During the Great Patriotic War, the ground where the town stands was a battlefield where Germans and Soviets slaughtered each other in thousands. When the foundations were dug for the pretty sixteen-story apartment towers, skeletons of men and machines came up with the backhoes, the people who live in Pripyat think themselves lucky. They are affluent, because pay is good at the power plant, and even at the radio factory and the construction works that are the town's other chief industries. They are young. The average age is no more than 30, even without counting all the children. Their town is architecturally advanced. Town planners come from all over the USSR to study it. It was purpose-built, but it serves its purposes not only well but gracefully, even with a human dimension. Pripyaters are proud to say that their main avenue was redirected so that three cherished old apple trees that somehow survived the war could be preserved. The apartment buildings are faced with ceramic tile, white and pink and blue, and they glow in the sun. The boulevards are wide. It was sensible to make them so. After all, the land was cheap, being nothing much but sand. The town is filled with greenery. No Pripyatur would ever have considered being tempted away with another job, at least until now. Senior operator Bodan Kalichenko woke to a thunderous pounding at his door. Kalichenko crossed himself as he hurried to answer, but when he opened it, the person standing there was not from the first department of the plant, come to demand to know why Kalichenko had run away from his post. It was only Zakharyan, the man from the milk store around the corner. Without his white jacket and little white cap, Zakharin looked quite different, and he was oddly hesitant after his violent banging. Did I wake you, Comrade Kalichenko? he asked. I wasn't sure you were here. I thought you might be at the power plant. It is my day off, said Kalichenko, rubbing at his right arm, which was nestled in a sling made from a large red kerchief. Oh, are they keeping to a regular schedule, even now? But I thought... The man from the milk store took a closer look at Kalichenko's arm. 
Oh, but I see you are injured. Kolachenko cradled the arm in his other hand. What do you want, he demanded. The man cleared his throat. He was much shorter than Kolachenko. Looking up, he began diffidently. You understand these things, Kolachenko? I do not. I am only a storekeeper. You have technical training. You see, we are frightened. This explosion, this smoke. Some of us think it is not safe to stay in Pripyat. Is it so serious, do you think? The authorities will decide that, Kolichenko said gruffly. Zakharin was insistent. The authorities are completely overwhelmed, Kolichenko. There is hardly a militiaman on the street. There is not a fireman left in Pripyat or a piece of equipment. Hot coals have fallen in the woods. My own sister's husband saw them. What if this building should catch on fire now? What would we do? None of this is my concern, Kolichenko said angrily. He looked with hostility at the man from the milk store, quite strange in his Sunday morning suit and tie. Zakharin looked both older and less sure of himself than in his store, counting out eggs for a shopper or carefully stowing the plastic bags of milk in the cooling compartment. He also seemed quite frightened, though he was trying to conceal it. That touched a chord in Kalichenko's own heart. I don't know what it is you want from me, he said unwillingly. Information, first of all, if you please. You are a scientific man. My son, who is fourteen, says that the smoke from the power plant contains atoms of radium and other substances which can cause our hair to fall out and our blood to dry up and perhaps to kill us. Is this true? No, not that, Kalichenko said. He hesitated, and then added, But it is true that there can be danger from fallout. Fallout? Like from the Americans testing nuclear bombs. Then should we not be taken somewhere else until the danger is past? Please, comrade, I have three children. Several of us have talked of these matters. I have hardly slept all night. We think we should go to the authorities and demand that the children at least should be taken to a place of safety. But we don't know how to explain this. None of us are scientists. So please come with us to the party headquarters. No, that is completely out of the question. Zakharin stepped back before the vehemence of Kalichenko's tone. His eyes blinked. Without his cap, Kalichenko saw that the man was nearly bald. I must report into the plant now, Kalichenko added firmly. This is, after all, an emergency. I'm sorry I can't help you. I will talk to the others again, the man said stubbornly as Kalichenko closed the door on him. Kalichenko did not, as it developed, report in. He did seriously intend to. He actually had his hand on the telephone, not once but four times, and each time there was some confounded interruption that prevented him from making the call. First there was the need to go to the toilet. Then there was a sudden noise outside, and he had to go to the window to look out on the courtyard where at least thirty people were standing together, talking, arguing, pointing in the direction of the plant. It was out of Kalichenko's sight, but he knew that it was the distant drift of smoke they were pointing at. Then, with his hand on the telephone, he said to himself, But they have this telephone number, if they simply take the trouble to look for it. They will call me if they need me. In any case, I should shave before I report for work. And he did shave, with meticulous care, twice over, using the tube of shaving cream that his fiancée had given him for his birthday just days before. Kalachenko was a tall, pale man, and his beard was so fair that shaving more than twice a week was no more than an affectation. But he told himself that if things were really as bad as they had seen the day before, it might be a long time before he had an opportunity to shave again. Then he put the sling back on his right arm, which he had used quite freely while shaving, and marched firmly to the phone for the fourth time. And there was the door again. This time it was Raya, his fiancée. She squeezed in hastily, closing the door behind her. The man from the milk store, she began, and Kalichenko groaned. What, has he been after you too? But Bodan, isn't he right? Please... How many times have you told me how dangerous these radioactive chemicals can be? I am not concerned for the man in the milk store, or for you and me. Have you forgotten what I am carrying for you? 
She spread the fingers of her hand over her still quite flat belly. I have not forgotten for one second, Raya, he said sourly. Then listen to what Zaharin says. I really think you should help him. Make the authorities understand what must be done. Raya, he said patiently, it is not our responsibility to make such decisions. In any case, do you really want Pripyat evacuated? If they send everyone away, then what? Thousands of people must be moved in that case. There will be immense confusion. Suppose you are sent to Kiev and I to Kursk or some other place. Surely we can find a way to stay together. He said seriously, Yes, perhaps, sooner or later. But it could take time. And what about our wedding? Can we make arrangements for a reception in a train station? Where will our friends be? People get married everywhere, Bodan. So we won't be able to have a reception in the red room at the plant. All right, we'll get married anyway and have the party another time. After we all come back to Pripyat. Come back to Pripyat? With all this poison falling all over? And when would that be? He started to say more, but checked himself as he saw her eyes widen at his words. All right, he said reasonably. Let's think this out step by step. I agree. Perhaps you should leave for the sake of our baby. The next question is, can I leave too? I don't know. Perhaps they will want every hand on duty at the plant. But let us say I can. Very well. You leave now. I will follow when I can. Your parents in Donetsk will put us up if we marry there. So you can take a bus. A bus? There aren't any buses, Bodan. Even the streets are covered with white foam. White foam? Kalichenko could dislike the sound of that. Foam on the streets meant that someone had decided the danger of fallout was quite real. Yes, foam. And no buses. Haven't you been outside at all? I went to the highway to see what was happening. And that's where the buses are. Carrying militiamen and troops and firefighters. The highway is full of emergency traffic. No, please. The whole town must go and none of us will. I do not think this is a good idea. Kalichenko groaned uneasily. Raya sighed in exasperation, then held out a hand. At least let me see your arm, she ordered. He assumed a stoic expression as she unwrapped the scarf and pulled up the sleeve of his tunic. Is it tender? she asked, poking. No. Yes. There, a little. She worked the arm back and forth gently, and then sighed. Do you know, she said, I think I have a sore throat this morning. Because you smoke too much. No. I don't think this is from smoking, dear Bodan. Also my face. I can't describe it exactly. It tingles a bit. As though someone were poking tiny pins at it. I don't mean that it's painful. Simply strange. Maybe all those cigarettes are cutting off your circulation. But to my face... Well, if you don't think it's serious. She put the bandaged arm down. There's no bruise, she said doubtfully. You should see a medic. What? When there may be many people very much worse hurt? He rose and said abruptly, Excuse me, I must go to the bathroom. With the door closed behind him, he felt better. These silly symptoms of Raya's were, of course, imaginary. He had never read of sore throat or pins in the face indicating exposure to radiation. But, of course, he told himself unhappily, he had never quite got around to reading all the stuff they threw at you when you came to work in a place like Chernobyl. With Kalichenko out of the room, Raya took out a stewardess cigarette and inhaled the menthol smoke deeply. And at once she began to worry. Should she be smoking at all? Would it be bad for the baby? Her husband-to-be had informed her quite definitely that it was. But at the clinic they had only shrugged and talked about moderation. She wished she had thought to ask at the clinic about radiation. But who could have imagined such questions were necessary? She touched her stomach, hopefully, and worried. Until now the only question seriously troubling had been whether her fiancé would actually go through with the ceremony, and whether the child would have his blue eyes. Now... Would it have any eyes at all? 
By the time Kalachenko came out of the bathroom, Rai had frightened herself into stubbornness. You must come to the party headquarters, she said firmly. And leave the telephone? What if I'm needed at the plant? She said reasonably, How would they find you here? As far as the plant knows, you're still at the hostel for single men. Isn't that so? I think I informed the plant that I would be staying here, he said, although it was a lie. Actually, he had not thought it anyone's business if he temporarily borrowed this apartment from the friend who had followed his wife to Odessa, hoping to talk her out of a divorce. In any case, judging from some of the remarks Hrenev had made, even this telephone number was almost certainly somewhere in the personnel and security files. And in all this confusion, will anyone remember that? No, really, Bordan. If you're worried that the plant needs you, call them. But first come to the party headquarters. There's nothing else to do, is there? Perhaps there wasn't. Kalichenko could think of no way out. He could not simply go on hiding in his friend's apartment as he had done all the previous day. In the long run, he sighed, threw up his hands at his fiancée's gentle nagging, and went reluctantly out to tell the man from the milk store that after careful consideration, he had decided that he would go along to talk to the people at the party committee building. It was not that he thought it was a good idea... He simply didn't have a better one. There were a hundred people in the crowd that marched doggedly through the streets to the party headquarters. The white foam had caked solid and was soiled, and there was an unpleasant, smoky, chemical, almost ammonia-like smell in the air. It was true enough that there were no buses on the streets this day. There was little traffic of any kind, with nothing coming in from outside the town. They strode along the center of the roadway itself, with no militia around to find them for jaywalking. Zaharin was in the lead, with Kalichenko looking stern enough and determined enough as he strode along just behind him. It was still early morning, not as much as ten o'clock, but it was a sullen, coppery-colored sort of day. There weren't many clouds. The sun was bright enough, even hot, but overhead, covering half the sky, was a thin pall of smoke from Chernobyl. Citizens who would normally be sitting in their bathrobes, drinking tea in comfortable relaxation on their day off, were peering out the windows or standing on the sidewalks. They called back and forth to the clot of men moving down the center of the street, and some joined the march. Most merely looked worried. Outside the party headquarters, the flag was stirring listlessly in the breeze. A couple of older, exhausted militiamen stood in front of the door. What is the matter with you people? One of them demanded. Why are you making a disturbance at this critical time? We want to speak to the party secretary, Zakharin said boldly. On a Sunday morning? Are you out of your mind? It is an emergency, Zakharin insisted. The other militiaman said, Of course it is an emergency, and the party secretary is at his post of duty. Go back to your homes at once. No, said Zakharin. We demand that something be done. The town must be evacuated. The danger is very great to all of us. Comrade Kalichenko here is an expert on such matters. He will explain it to you. But Comrade Kalichenko did not, because when Zakharin looked around for backing from his technical expert, Bordan Kalichenko was nowhere to be seen. Where to be seen? Where to be seen? Chapter 14 Sunday, April 27th there is no core meltdown at the Chernobyl power station. At least that particular disaster was impossible, for uranium dioxide does not melt until it reaches a temperature of 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Even burning graphite never gets much hotter than half that. When the graphite burned, it was, after all, only a simple chemical matter of carbon combusting in the presence of oxygen, not basically different from the blazing logs in the fireplace of a split-level ranch house. Although it was a real nuclear explosion that started the disaster, the nuclear reaction blew itself out in the first fraction of a second after the initial blast. So there is no longer any real danger of that famous nuclear nightmare, a core meltdown. But another danger is most ominously present. In a way, it has become even worse. As the carbon in the graphite reacts with the oxygen in the air in that fire, the smoke rises. It has no chimney, as the fireplace logs would, but it doesn't need one. At such temperatures, the fire creates its own chimney, as the column of hot smoke and gases thrusts upward through the atmosphere. 
The column carries other gases and tiny bits of solid matter along with it. That is where the real and most terrible danger lies. That smoke contains deadly poisons. It is not just the uranium in the core that is radioactively poisonous now. The reactor has created its own new poisons, some of which are far more worrisome than uranium. It is inevitable that it should. Even if a nuclear reactor could start with pure and nearly harmless materials, its purity would not last. Its own radiation corrupts it. Some atoms are broken into fragments, and each fragment is a new chemical element. Nuclei gain particles or lose them. Elements which do not exist in nature, the transuranic ones, are created. Many of the new elements are fiercely radioactive. This is the unique danger of nuclear accidents. Without exception, all radioactive elements are harmful to living things. Every living thing from fungi to human beings. High doses of radiation kill quickly. Lower doses take more time. At the lowest possible concentration, a single particle striking a single cell. There may be no detectable damage at all, because the rest of the body may be able to repair or replace the cell. Or it may not, in which case the damage may not show up for decades. Appearing only late in life is cancer. Say what you would about the men from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy, Smin thought wearily. You at least had to admit they got things done. He had lost count of the number of experts, specialists, doctors, engineers, construction people, who had poured into Chernobyl in the last dozen hours. Of course, Chief Engineer Varazin's dacha was far too small to hold all the meetings and individuals concerned in the effort to control the damage to reactor number four. Perhaps, Min thought, it was also a bit too close to the naked core for the comfort of the experts. At any rate, a new command post had been established thirty kilometers away, in the regional party headquarters of a collective farm village. It was not just men the people from the ministry had conjured up. It was materiel. A steady flow of heavy machines lumbered through the checkpoint on their way to the plant. Trucks had arrived all through the night, bearing all sorts of things that the Chernobyl nuclear power station had never had before. Everyone now carried a little aluminum pen-shaped dosimeter. Everyone, even at the checkpoint, wore coveralls, caps that came down over the neck and ears, even cloth masks to put over the mouth and nose, though at the checkpoint all of those hung loose around the wearer's throats. You could not tell a general from a laborer. In white or green, they were all covered from head to toe. It made them look like robots. But if they had been robots, there would not now be the steady stream of casualties coming from the plant. Almost all of the wounded now were firemen. Many suffered severe burns, but most of them also had worse than burns. Already a few of the victims had suppurating cold sore blisters on their faces and mouths. And those were not just burns. Those were the first signs of radiation sickness. And the fact that the black herpes blisters had popped up so rapidly was certain indication that the exposure had been very great. But Rasputin, the specialist in the biological effects of radiation, had instituted tight procedures for dealing with them. Each man was carefully undressed by white-robed, white-gloved, white-hooded orderlies as he lay on his stretcher in the open air. His clothing, every scrap, went into a bin to be buried in the open field, where a bulldozer was excavating a deep trench. Then the doctors took over, first carefully washing every inch of exposed skin, checking with radiation monitors. Then they redressed him in a hospital gown and poulticed the burns. A separate set of ambulances waited at the control point. When they were full, they roared away. Some ferried the patients with the worst radiation damage to the airstrip in Chernobyl town, for the plane that would take them to the special hospital in Moscow. The others were put into other ambulances to start the two-hour trip to hospital number 18 in Kiev. The highway crossed a little stream at the collective farm village. It was why that spot had been chosen for the checkpoint. One fire truck was permanently posted there, its pumps constantly going to suck water from the stream. With that water, each ambulance was hosed down before it went back to the plant for more of the endless supply of wounded. The ambulances from the Chernobyl nuclear power station never passed beyond the checkpoint to the outside world. They never would. Returning to the command post for another installment of the endless meetings, 
Simeon Smin saw a little two-man helicopter sitting on the ground just off the roadway. Its rotor was turning slowly, and the pilot was leaning back in his seat, gazing at the distant smoke plume from the power station. Smin ducked under the rotor and banged on the door. Pilot, who are you? The pilot blinked at him. Lieutenant of Militia Kutsinka, at your service. Pilot to Major General Varansky. Of course, sparked Smin, just as though he had known who General Varansky had been all along. I have the General's orders. Take me up. I want to survey the site. And as Lieutenant Kutsinka opened his mouth for a question, Smin snapped, at once. Do you not understand that this accident endangers the entire country? Smin had never been in such a small helicopter. It bounced and swooped staggeringly, far worse than the one he had borrowed the day before. But his mind wasn't on the ride. It wasn't even on his fatigue, or the facts that his scars itched, his eyes ached, and the corners of his mouth were sore. What he was thinking about was what he had come to see. When they were only five or six kilometers away, the plant began to come into view. The great drift of black smoke snaking into the sky seemed far thicker than the day before, even though most of the fires were long since out. It was, Smin knew, the smoldering embers that produced the pall. As they approached over the towers of Pripyat, Smin could see that the streets were full of people. Their white faces stood out sharply as they gazed up at the helicopter. Fools! muttered Smin. The pilot craned toward him. What? he yelled. Did you speak? Smin shook his head. The people of Pipit had to be gotten out of that area. There was no question about that. But there was nothing the pilot could do. Up higher if you can, he urged. But stay out of the plume. The pilot nodded and kicked and turned his controls. The machine spun and lifted first away from the reactor, then swinging back to approach it from the windward side. They were no more than three hundred meters above the inferno. Smin could look almost directly down into it. As the pilot hovered, Smin opened his door and leaned out, staring down at the end of so many hopes and the death sentence passed on so many friends. Even so high, the heat beat at his face. It was true that all the lesser fires were out, but he could see clearly that all the efforts of the firefighters had done nothing at all to stop or even to slow the terrible combustion that was going on in the graphite core of the destroyed reactor. If only ten percent of the graphite had been burning yesterday, now it was nearly a third that was aflame. The still unburning surface of the graphite was a rubble of lumps and cracks and hillocks. The burning part was as bright and hot as the sun, Great rainbow-shaped streams of water came up from the hoses and down onto the furnace, but to no avail. Where the streams of water hit the fire, there were clouds of steam, but when the jet wavered away, the fire was still burning as fiercely as ever. On the ground, Smin could see bulldozers grinding away as they heaped up berms of earth. Beside the bulldozers, a pair of water cannon were blasting away at the lower reaches of the reactor shell. Whether any of their water was getting through or what good it was doing if it did, he could not tell. The smoke billowed toward them. Get away, Smin shouted, pulling himself back inside and slamming the door. The pilot was already slanting away, but the vagrant gust of air was faster than he. For a moment there was smoke all around them, and a stink of burning chemicals that tore at Smin's throat. Then they were clear. Both men were coughing, and the helicopter lurched as the pilot spun it away. Better get down, Smeen managed to rasp out, and the pilot didn't even nod. He was already heading back to the perimeter post. By the time they were on the ground, the coughing fits were over. Thank you, said Smeen gravely, and got out to confront the man in the green coverall who was watching them impassively from the door of the headquarters building. Even without the insignia on his shoulder bars, Smeen knew who he was. He said... Thank you also, General Varansky, for allowing me to borrow your aircraft. The general didn't even smile. He only murmured, Why should I refuse one helicopter, when you people have already borrowed half the movable equipment in the Ukraine? But should we not go inside for the meeting? 
The general's remark was not much of an exaggeration at that. From the air, Smeen had seen literally scores of trucks, bulldozers, ambulances, fire vehicles, and examples of almost everything else that moved on the roads around the stricken plant. Smeen followed Major General Vronsky into the meeting room. The only conference actively going on was with the special doctors from Moscow. At least these specialists knew exactly what they had to do and could get on with it. Their home base, Hospital No. 6, had been designated the center point for radiation injuries, and the first job of the task force that had flown in the night before was to screen every victim for radiation. More than a thousand so far, with nearly 200 of them already on their way to Moscow for whatever treatment there was to give them. They were explaining this to some party and town officials for Pripyat, who were looking glum. Smin paused a moment at the door, where there was a rack of the pen-shaped dosimeters. He glanced around while the general went on ahead. No one was looking. Smin unclipped his old one and threw it into a basket and fixed a new one to his jacket before he went in. I do hope, the Pripyat party secretary was saying cheerlessly, that you are not proposing to test everyone in Pripyat. Of course they will test everyone in Pripyat, Smin snapped, aware that his tone was offending the man, aware that the secretary would be writing a report on what was happening, aware, most of all, that none of that mattered. Smin wrinkled his nose at the faint smell of animal manure that permeated the meeting hall. The cow barns were only a dozen meters away. It is not all that has to be done, he said, in the town of Pripyat. Those people's lives are all at risk. They must be evacuated. Two of the Moscow doctors nodded, but the men from Pripyat looked thunderstruck. Impossible, cried the party secretary. What are you saying? We do not want panic. It is better that they be frightened than dead, Smin said flatly. I refuse, the man said. This very morning, some panic mongers in Pripyat came to the party headquarters with the same ultimatum. It was almost a demonstration. We taught the ringleaders a lesson, I assure you. If you put them in jail in Pripyat, said Smin, you will teach them a final lesson, because they will die there. Everyone in the city will die if they remain there long enough. They must be taken away at once. Taken to where? To sleep in the fields if they must, Smin cried because that is better than dying in their flats. If you won't do it on your own authority, then call Moscow. I will talk to them myself. I insist. Oh, what is it now? The biological effects man, Rasputin, was standing in the doorway, next to a doctor who was holding a glass vial of water. Hydrologist engineer Sheronchuk was beside her, looking as weary as Smin himself. But he spoke first. It's the stream, he said the one where they get the water they are using for the wounded, and to wash the vehicles. It is showing radioactivity now. Leonid Sheranchuk did not just look weary. He was sodden with fatigue. He had not slept at all. For what? He had lost count. More than forty-eight hours at least. He could have gone home when the militia and fire brigades and emergency workers of all kinds began to show up in strength because they no longer needed amateur rubble shifters and stretcher toters. But then he remembered that he was a highly trained expert in hydraulic flow, and hydraulic flows were the only things that were keeping all the rest of the Chernobyl nuclear power station from joining the stricken reactor in flames. It was Sheron Chuk who managed to get some of the station's primary pumps working to provide pressure for the hosemen and give a little relief to the straining fire trucks. Sheranchuk, who directed the pumper intakes to the deepest and least sedimented parts of the cooling pond. And Sheranchuk, who, watching the streams of water running down the sides of the building and spreading across the sodden ground, thought to wonder where that water was going. When he found Rasputin and expressed his fears, the man from the ministry responded at once. He commandeered one of the doctors and set out. The radiation detectors gave the answers. The clear, purling waters of the brook by the command post were registering radioactivity. It wasn't an immediate problem. The brook water was still good enough to wash down the trucks. That was not important anyway. In any case, there were the wells of the collective farm ready to supply the need for drinking water and to clean the wounds of the injured. The problem was that the brook did not stop flowing at the highway. 
That brook came from near the Chernobyl power station. It wasn't just picking up radiation from the fallout of soot from the fire. It was the conduit, one of the conduits, for the wastewater from the firefighting. Millions of gallons of water were being pumped out of the Pripyat River and the plant's cooling pond to pour onto the fire. What did not turn into steam ran away into the ground and across it, into that brook and every other nearby, into the Pripyat River itself sooner or later. And, said Sheran Shuk grimly, the Pripyat River flows into the reservoirs that supply the city of Kiev. He looked directly at the party secretary, who frowned back. After a moment, he said, Yes. And then, raising a hand to keep Sharon Shuk from answering, I see what you are implying. But surely that is not important. The hose water from a few fire engines against a reservoir. That hose water, said Smin wearily, is full of radioactive material. What do we do, Comrade Plummer? We must dam up the overflow, Sharon Shuk said at once. We must dike every stream every little river that flows near Chernobyl. The cooling pond, it must be diked off from the Pripyat. Sewers, drains, they must be diverted or simply stopped up. The party secretary stared at him. Stop up the sewers? Exactly, said Rasputin. Just as Sharon Shuk here says, we don't have a choice. Or else we will poison the people of Kiev, said Sharon Shuk. Smin sighed and stood up and said, Let's go, Comrade Plummer. Show me where you want to build these dikes. But in the long run, of course, it wasn't Sharon Chuk who decided where the dikes should go. It wasn't Smin either. It was the men from Moscow. By the time Smin and Sharon Chuk got back to the command post, someone had produced a hydrological map of the area. Sharon Chuk's eyes were bulging. He had not even known that such a map existed and the dikes and trenches and diversions were already being marked. Smin knew that it was all out of his hands now. Higher authority had taken over. Higher authority listened, spoke, looked at some plans, then picked up a phone and issued instructions. Higher authority did not have to bribe or wheedle to get what it wanted. It simply gave an order, and somewhere in the Ukraine or Moscow or Belarusia, someone began calling workers in to load a truck with whatever was required and send it speeding to Chernobyl. They did not send Smeen away, though he was reeling with fatigue. They did not object when he appeared at one of the endless meetings to plan for the implacable future, while simultaneously dealing with the catastrophic present. They even listened courteously when he spoke. But that was not often, for higher authority knew its resources better than he did. He listened and marveled. To Rasputin, explaining to the head of the Pripyat Hospital that the reason his clinic had been evacuated was not only that it was better for the patients to be farther away, but that his staff was simply not adequate to the problems. Your doctors are diagnosing burns, shock, heat exhaustion, even heart attacks. But where is one diagnosis of radiation sickness? Tulestilian, patiently reasoning with the general commanding the fire brigades. We must use other methods. The fire in the core was not out. It had not even slowed down. The supply of burnable graphite was endless, and every atom of it hungered to unite with the oxygen in the air. The terribly hot core was a massive reserve of heat. Even if they cooled the surface a bit, the vast interior store reheated it and kept the temperature of the graphite blocks well above the ignition temperature. Exactly. So water is no good, the fire chief complained. It boils right off. Of course. So we must smother it. Cover it with sand, maybe. Something that will keep the air out. Sand through hoses, said the fire commander. What nonsense! I have never heard of such a thing. Not through hoses, Lestilian said patiently. In some other way, and quickly. What is it now? Six hundred micro-rentkins an hour in Pripyat? And more all the time. I know nothing of micro-what you said, the fire commander said stubbornly. I know only what to do with fires. He meditated for a moment. Then he said, Well, then, can we get helicopters to drop it in? Or do you want my men to carry the sand there in their helmets? Of course, said Listilian, nodding. Helicopters. And picked up the phone to call the Air Force. 
to everyone. Smeen listened carefully to all of them, and spoke little. And that was the day, one emergency falling on top of another. No time to solve one problem before the next arose. At least the Air Force promised helicopters would be on the scene by nightfall. At least a crane was brought from Pripyat to the burning reactor, and an operator found brave enough to try dumping dirt, broken rocks, slabs of cement, onto the blazing reactor, even before the heavy helicopters got there. At least the medical problems were now being dealt with by experts. At least... At least, Smin thought grimly, his wife and younger son were out of it. He had passed them through the checkpoint himself, in their own car, not twenty minutes before the order had come to let no more vehicles through. But nearly fifty thousand other people were still in the town of Pripyat. When someone thrust a plate of bread and army soup in front of him, Smin realized that it was well past noon, and he had eaten nothing since he arrived at the control point, well before daybreak. He wished he could put his head down just for a minute, close his eyes. But it would not be a minute. The aching weariness in every bone, the sullen throbbing that was beginning between his temples, no ten-minute nap would heal those. So Smin did not put his head down. Instead, he got up from his meal he had picked at and walked out the door, because he had heard the sound of a helicopter approaching. Could it be the Air Force arriving so quickly? It wasn't. It was a little two-man craft, like that of the Major General of Militia, and the man getting out of it was the director of the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Station, T. M. Zagvodin. He spoke deferentially to Istvili, the man from the Ministry, before he turned to Smin. Well, Semyon Mikhailovich, he said angrily, I am called away on business for a few days, and a fine mess you make. What the director had to say meant nothing to Smin. In any decision-making sense, he no longer mattered. He had not been present when the first decisions had to be taken, and now that the men from Moscow were on the scene, nothing he or Smin decided would be final without ratification by them. Smin ignored him. Comrade Isvili, he said, I request a decision on the question of the urgent evacuation of all unnecessary personnel from Pripyat. Isvili raised his hand. The buses are already on the way, he said but he didn't seem interested in the subject. He was peering curiously at Smin's face. He said soberly, Comrade Deputy Director, I think you will have to leave these matters to us now. Smin scowled, and the sudden sharp crack of pain at the corner of his mouth informed him what Isvigi meant better than any words. He touched the spot. When he brought his finger away, he was not surprised to find it damp with the fluid from a broken blister. Istvili had already turned away to order an ambulance for Deputy Director Smin. Ambulance? Smin protested. There is work that I must do here. Why do I need an ambulance for a blister? Not for the blister, Istvili said gently. For what caused it. What you will do now is what the doctors will tell you to do, in Hospital Number 6. You are relieved of your duties, Deputy Director Smin. He turned to Zaglodian, his face hardening. Then he paused, looked back at Smin, and added, Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Chapter 15 Sunday, April 27th Although the Soviet army soldier Sergei Kornov was born in Tashkent, he is both Russian and Muscovite by ancestry and upbringing. He does not remember anything about Tashkent. He doesn't even remember coming to Moscow with his parents when he was two years old. He remembers very well leaving it when he was ordered up for his military service in June of 1984, when he was twenty, because he did not at all want to go. Kornov has not been a good soldier. He did not want to be a soldier at all, since he didn't like any of the possibilities that suggested. You could be sent to Afghanistan and die there. You could go to Poland and have the Solidarity Girls shun you. You could, at the very best, have to spend all your time doing dull and arduous things for a couple of years, with no chance to put on the beautiful Wrangler jeans, and join friends in the Bluebird nightclub off Pushkin Street, or listen to Beatles and Abba tapes in someone's flat until daylight. But what Kornoff wanted had not mattered. There was no way to get out of it, though he had tried. 
the entire jar of American coffee powder he had forced himself to brew and drink just before his examination by the military doctor had certainly made his heart pound. But the doctor had not been impressed. All he had said was, Less coffee, please, Gwyneth. You will serve your country better if you sleep at night. Gwyneth has a reputation in his unit as a sloppy soldier. He has deserved it. He doesn't get along very well with most of his comrades, few of whom are Slavs like himself, and none, of course, Belarusians, since the Belarusian Republic is where his 461st Guards Rifle Division is based. He avoids all the details he can, pretty successfully now that he is a fourth-class soldier, with his discharge not far away, and thus in a position to make the juniors do his work for him. He has one ambition, and that is to avoid being sent to a punishment battalion before his time is up. Since Kornlef was in the summer 1984 intake, his term of service will expire exactly two years later, on June 12, 1986. He knows that date well. He has been looking forward to his demobilization date for exactly 684 days so far, and as he bumps along in the army truck to his new assignment, he calculates that that date is. He looks at his watch now just 66,240 minutes away. Kornoff didn't know that Chernobyl was the name of the place they were going to on that Sunday afternoon in April, the one day in the week that should have been their precious own. Kornoff didn't know anything at all about where they were going or what they were supposed to do. Neither did any of the other 20-odd soldiers in his truck, bouncing along a country road at 130 kilometers an hour, until they stopped at a crossroads, and were ordered out of the trucks. They straggled down from the truck to relieve themselves, lined up along the edge of a field of winter wheat, exchanging with the soldiers from the other trucks the same guesses and denials they had been exchanging with their truck mates for the past two hours. No one had any facts. None of the units was even complete. The 461st Guards Rifle Division had been put on alert at two o'clock that afternoon, and the units that were in camp ordered to be on board the trucks with full gear at fifteen minutes before three. It can't be the Americans attacking, said one, because we'd be going east, not south. And another said, Americans, your asshole. It's the fucking Ukrainians. They found another Cossack bandit to lead them, so they're trying a revolt. And another still was certain it was the Chinese, sneaking over the border from Iran. Or the Afghans, bored with shooting down Soviet troops in their own country, and now invading. Or the Martians and it wasn't until the sergeant came trotting up to shout at them that they got any information at all. Then it wasn't immediately helpful. Assholes, he yelled. You should all piss on the east side of the road. The west is where you're sleeping tonight. Sleeping here, sergeant, called one. You mean we're going to be staying in this place? What are we here for? And the sergeant waved a hand to the distant pillar of smoke on the southern horizon. You see that? That is what we're here for and you'll all be damned lucky if you ever live to see anything else. It was just his way of talking. Kornov's comrades reassured one another. But an hour later, when they were in the town of Pripyat, Kornov was no longer so sure. Some of the militiamen guarding the approaches had called to the soldiers, and the words they used were scary. Atomic explosion, out of control. Worst of all, people are dying here and no one seemed to think that was an exaggeration. And then they were all issued light little aluminum things that looked like fountain pens. The men turned them over curiously, and when they were told that these objects were called dosimeters, and their purpose was to measure how much dangerous radiation each of them might receive, the mood of the soldiers became quite thoughtful. Their job turned out to be getting the people out of the town of Pripyat, an endless creeping caterpillar of buses, city buses, Highway buses, military buses. Kornoff had never seen so many buses in one place. Eleven hundred of them, someone said, were snaking along the highway toward the town. The first task of the soldiers was to get the people out of their houses and onto the transport. Immediately. In pairs they were assigned to blocks and buildings, and Kornoff found himself running up and down stairs, bawling to the occupants that the town of Pripyat was to be evacuated simply temporarily as a precaution, and everyone was to be ready to leave in half an hour. Meanwhile, were there any sick, pregnant women, 
Old people or people with a heart condition who would need special help? It surprised Quanoff that the Plipiaters took his shouted orders so lightly. Of course they had had ample warning that something was up. If somehow they had missed seeing that worrisome distant smoke cloud, then certainly the militia cars cruising every block with their loudspeakers blaring were letting them know. And yet there were people who didn't want to go. There were people who couldn't make up their minds to go. And people, many, many people, who definitely wanted to be taken out of the threatened town as fast as possible. But first wanted to be given time to make decisions, help to pack up their food, their clothes, their pets, their children. There was no time. In thirty minutes, shouted Kornuth, you will be out of this building, or we will be back to drag you out. You must take food necessities for three days, do you understand? And in thirty minutes there will be a bus at your door to take you. When he first saw Pipit, Kornuth felt almost jealous. The eight-story concrete buildings of flats on the outskirts were quite like those that had swallowed all the green fields around Moscow. Like, in fact, the ones Kornov's parents still lived in just off the Leningradskaya Prospekt. But the ones farther into the town were something quite different. They were, in a word, beautiful. They were well kept, too, and surrounded by trees and parks. It was not just that someone with a bulldozer had sculptured a greensward here, a circular flower bed there, Pipit's trees were native firs, as well as chestnuts and fruit trees, and some of them were already in blossom. How fine it would be to live in a place like this, Kornov thought. The only things that reminded him of home were cars drawn up on the sidewalk, some of them on blocks, nearly half of them still covered with the canvas shrouds that had protected them through the Ukrainian winter. And inside the buildings, it was even more like home, for new as they were, the hallways held that omnipresent Russian aroma of old cabbage. For the first time in his army career, Korna felt he was doing a job that was worth his while. It was frightening at first, a nuclear accident. But it was obvious that the important thing was to get all these people to safety. Korna moved faster than he had moved in the last year and ten and a half months, and yet it didn't seem to him that it was fast enough. By the time they had made their first pass through the two buildings assigned to them, Kornov was itching to get on with the job. Pripyat was a town of young, healthy people, it seemed. Hardly any had needed special attention because of age or illness. The men of Kornov's platoon hunkered down and smoked, waiting for the orders to finish the job. Miklas, Kornov said to his partner, a dark-complected Armenian, we can do this faster if we split up. Why do we want to do it faster? Kornuf hesitated. To help these people? It had turned into a question as he said the words. Miklas looked at him with curiosity. Siryoja, he said reasonably, if we finish fast, they'll just find something else for us to do. Even so, Miklas shook his head. Well, why not? All right. You take the tall building, I'll take the other one. Well, that served him right, Kornov thought as he entered the second apartment house in the block. He had already figured out a new skill to meet the needs of the situation. It was better to start from the bottom of the building and to work his way up than to begin at the top. In his new system, he reasoned, you could double-check every flat on the way down, because when the people were out of the top floor, the ones lower down were already informed of what they had to do. Even if you were lucky, many of them might already be in the street, trudging toward the loading zones on the sidewalks with their belongings in their arms, and perhaps one child on their backs. He had to use threats at one of the first-floor apartments, but on the second floor he got unexpected help. A tall, pale man with his arm in a sling was standing at the stairs waiting for him. Surprisingly, although the weather was warm in this late afternoon, the man was wearing a turtleneck sweater and a woolen cap. Let me help you, he said, his tone oddly supplicatory. My name is Kalichenko. I'm an engineer. I worked at Chernobyl. Kornov frowned at him. And how can you help now, he demanded. The man said apologetically, At least I can explain to the people what they are facing. Many of them simply do not understand the danger of radiation. But you are hurt, Kornov objected, eyeing the man's arm. It was not in a proper sling, but a woman's shawl. If you go down now... There may still be some ambulances for the sick people. 
I don't need an ambulance. I'll have it looked at later. Come on, then, said Kornoff, turning away. He paused as the man tossed his own suitcase inside his apartment door, but he left the door open. Aren't you afraid that will be stolen? he asked. The man laughed. But that is impossible, he said. There is not one person leaving Pripyat who can carry one more thing than he already has. Come on. The sooner we get these people moving, the sooner we will all be gone. Kornoff would not have believed it possible. But in less than ninety minutes from the time they entered Pripyat, a town of nearly fifty thousand people had become a wasteland. The street Kornoff had been assigned to was almost the last to be evacuated. He patrolled the sidewalk with Miklos always watching to see that none of the complaining citizens obeyed that impulse to go back for one more thing while they waited. It would have been better, Miklos told him, observing the scene with a critic's eye, to assemble everyone in the main squares and load from there. Nonsense, Kornoff said, equally critical. They keep them at their houses because they don't want them to panic. Only they should have assigned each bus to a specific address at once, of course, so there would not be this long waiting. Nonsense to you, too, said Miklos amiably. And up your asshole. What would the Soviet Union be without long waiting? That is why you are not an officer, Sergei. You do not understand Soviet life. I will understand it perfectly when I am back in it, Kornov said. And then calling sharply, You, stay by the curb. Your bus will be here directly. It wasn't, though. Kornov could hear buses grinding their gears in the next block but so far their own had not been reached. Only soldiers were moving on foot in any of the streets. Militia cars were all that roamed the avenues. Kornoff watched the knots of people on their block carefully for those who might change their minds, or remember something irreplaceable that they must certainly go back at once to retrieve. Some tried. None got through. Now they could see the next block loading almost the last of Pripyat's people, as they were herded into the hundredth or perhaps it was the thousandth of the buses that patiently crawled through the emptying streets, loaded, and rolled away. The buses were of all kinds. Some had been making their runs in Pripyat itself. Most seemed to be from the distant city of Kiev. Others perhaps came from other communities nearby. There were even a few trucks with army markings, perhaps the ones Kornoth and his comrades had come down in not two hours before. So we walked back to our campground, grumbled Miklas, and Kornoff clapped him on the shoulder. You may be luckier than that, he said. Look, they are putting one soldier on each bus. Maybe you'll spend the night on the Black Sea. If that was where the buses were going, some of the people waiting to be evacuated had made bad guesses. Many wore sheepskin coats, even boots. One man even had a pair of skis. Another had a tennis racket. Well, since they had been told the evacuation would be for only three days, no doubt they planned to have a little vacation to make up for the pains. But where did the man with the skis think they were going? And the things they carried, a live chicken even. Kornoff saw it with his own eyes, under one old woman's arm. There were bird cages and rolled up blankets. There were suitcases and duffel bags, paper sacks, cardboard cartons, table lamps with rosy pink shades, television sets, a stereo or two. There was nothing in any Soviet home small enough to carry, Kornov thought, that he did not see on the backs or in the arms of some of the thousands. What possessions could there be that had been left behind? And yet, Kornov knew, the answer was everything. Even the poorest owned much more than he alone could carry away, and the officers had been adamant. What a person could not lift aboard a bus in one trip stayed on the ground when the bus pulled away. There was already a mound of discarded, wept-over belongings stacked helter-skelter just inside the building door to add to everything left in the flats or at people's places of work and the washing on the lines and the food on the tables. It must, Kornoff thought, have been like this nearly half a century ago when the Germans finished their sweeper on the Pripyat marshes and overran all this land. But this was not Germans. This was not the work of any external enemy. It was, Kornoff thought uneasily, simply the result of what they had done to themselves. He did not like that thought. Kornoff pulled the unfamiliar dosimeter instrument off his cape and held it up to the light. When he peered through it, he could see cryptic numbers and symbols, black on a white background. 
But what the symbols meant, no one had told Cormus. At the end of the block, the sergeant was in an altercation with a man who was shouting and pointing to a car, while the sergeant uninterestedly shook his head. Look, said Nicholas, the poor man only wants to evacuate himself in his rigouille. Why won't the sergeant let him? Because they don't want traffic jams, of course, said Cormus. But there was something he wanted to ask the sergeant for himself. He was beginning to be very hungry. He got up and walked toward the sergeant, almost bumping into the pale man with an arm in a sling who had helped him evacuate one of the buildings, the one with the Ukrainian name, Kali something or other. But Cornuth had more important things on his mind. He barely returned the man's greeting, though he noticed the young woman beside him in the line was good-looking. Cornuth approached the sergeant, who was standing by himself and sipping something that came out of a Fanta orange drink bottle but looked and smelled like beer. Sergeant, Cornuth said politely, it is past time for us to eat, I think. You will eat when you are told to. There will be food at the bivouac area, probably. Yes, Sergeant, said Cornuth, but that too is a question. If our trucks are being used to take these people out of danger, how will we get to the bivouac area? It is at least ten kilometers from here. The sergeant said thoughtfully, It is nearer twenty. He looked at Cornuth, and then added cheerfully, But you won't have to walk. I was about to select a man to board that bus to keep the refugees in order. You'll do. Get on it. Get on it to where? Cornuth demanded, recoiling a step. To wherever it goes, said the sergeant, reaching to pluck the dosimeter from Cornuth's blouse pocket. But first give me that. We will need it for the patrols that remain on duty here. But, Sergeant, Cornuth yelped. I don't know what it says. If it turns out I have already been exposed to too much radiation, how will we know? Of course we will know, said the Sergeant, jerking a thumb toward the bus, because we will get a report from wherever you are going to tell us that you are dead. The mood in the bus was cheerful enough at first. Someone had an accordion and a few people in the front were singing as though they were teenagers off to their Komsomol camp for the summer. Then the bus rolled out onto the highway. It had to squeeze past a long line of army vehicles, ambulances, and heavy machines rolling toward the plant. Everyone in the bus craned to look at the convoy. The holiday mood evaporated at once. The bus was filled with people and their belongings. There was no seat for Cornuth, only the stairwell by the bus door but at least he was on what seemed to be an intercity bus. Not one of those urban ones, where even the stairwell was so cramped no one could sleep in it. Cornuth did sleep, leaning back, his head almost under the driver's seat. So after a while did most of those on the bus, even Kalichenko. He and his fiancée, too, had been lucky. They had managed to get two seats together. They had even managed to get into the very back of the bus, where there was a little more room on the floor to set down Raya's straw suitcase, her cooking pots, her sack of flour, and already melting half kilo of lard. And every ten minutes for the first fifty kilometers, she would jerk up straight in her seat with something else she had forgotten. The wine bourdon, the champagne for our wedding, it's still in the kitchen cabinet. They gave me no time to think. And Kalichenko would hush her his arm twitching with pins and needles as it rested around her shoulder where she had been leaning against him. Shush, Raya. It's all right. We're not leaving forever, you know. But was that true? Kalichenko knew quite well that three days might indeed stretch to forever. The fact that the town had been evacuated so hurriedly and utterly was certain proof that the radiation level had been not only above warning levels, but definitely very dangerous indeed. And how much radiation had each of them received already? Not as much for Kalichenko himself as he would have if he had remained at his post of duty, of course. But that line of thought led him to worries almost worse than future leukemia. He performed calculations in his mind, trying to remember the half-lives of all the deadly radionuclides that were likely to be in the smoke from the explosion and fire. Suppose, he thought, the firefighters and the engineers managed somehow to put out the flames and control the fission reactions. Suppose they sealed it all off. Very well. There would still remain all the tiny radioactive particles that had already fallen from the sky. The soot from the fire, the morning dew, the air itself had already left invisible films of radioactive cesium, iodine, strontium, and a dozen others. 
and all of them were still there in Pripyat, emitting radiation. Well, but some of them had short half-lives, he reminded himself. In just a few days, half of the iodine would have radiated itself into some other element, a harmless one. In a few months, the same would be true of the cesium, the strontium. In just a year or less, the radiation would be only a fraction of its current levels. A year or less. He did not even think of the long-lived transuranics, like plutonium, with a half-life of a quarter of a million years. A year was already an eternity. And anyway, it all depended on how much there was to begin with. A quarter of a little bit was perhaps no more than the normal background, while a quarter of very much might still be enough to kill. And worst of all, when could they start the patient clock that would tell them when they might return? For as the bus pulled out of Pripyat, Kalichenko had craned his neck to stare back. He could still see in the waning light of that April day the distant, uneven column of smoke. There seemed to be helicopters fluttering around it, sightseers. Foolish ones if they were, because if they flew through that plume, they would learn caution very thoroughly, if too late to do them any good. The plume had been not one whit smaller or less frightening than it had been the day before. So it could easily be a year before any of them saw Pripyat again, Kalichenko told himself. It could be much longer. It could be never. And what then of his precious stereo from East Germany, his Magnitis Dat tapes of Akujava and the Beatles, his hopes for a car, his career? What of Raya's ten thousand forgotten treasures? What of their wedding? When she started up again, My raincoat from Czechoslovakia! What if it rains where we're going? He patted her silently. It would rain all right. It would rain many, many times before she saw that smart new black trench coat again. When he woke from an uneasy sleep an hour later, it was because Raya was leaning across him. She was trying to help the woman in the seat ahead of them with her wailing baby. The infant had soiled itself and the mother was trying to make a flat space on the clutter of bundles, bags, and personal possessions of all kinds that were piled in the aisle so she could change it. Under the circumstances, it was a major undertaking. The mother had not failed to bring everything she needed with her, especially including the rolls of gauze bandages that were used for diapers. Unfortunately, the child was in her lap, and the bandages were in a bag buried somewhere along the aisle of the bus. Kalichenko suffered his fiancée to climb over him, changing seats so that she could be more used to the woman ahead. Raya held the crying infant's shoulder securely while the mother dabbed him clean, then grumpily wound a headscarf around the baby boy's bottom. Kalichenko averted his eyes. He could not avert his nose, and when the woman carefully rolled up the soiled diaper bandages and deposited them at her feet, he complained to his fiancée. She should throw them out the window. It's not fair making us stand all that stink. Then it was Raya's turn to shush him. And then what would she use when we got where we are going? It's all right, Bodan. Here, let me make it smell better. From her pocketbook she pulled out a little flask of cologne and patted it on Bodan's cheek. You don't mind about the scarf, do you? She added shyly. The scarf? You mean you gave that woman my sling? Kalichenko was suddenly outraged. But you don't seem to need it any more, Bodan, dear. You lifted the bags with both hands. And think, in just a few months, when we have our own little one. I suppose it is all right, he grumbled. Let us go back to sleep. Obediently, Raya put her head on his shoulder again, and presently closed her eyes. But for Kalichenko it was not so easy. Raya's last remark had reminded him of another problem of radiation. What about the baby she was carrying? Just how much radiation had Raya absorbed? He didn't know, but had an uneasy feeling that pregnant women, or their babies anyway, were especially subject to radiation damage. In any case, he told himself, there was nothing he could do about it right now. But he remained wide awake, trying not to think. He squirmed carefully in his seat, not wanting to disturb Raya. The woman ahead had politely opened her window a crack to try to dissipate the odor pervading her immediate area. But as a result, a blast of damp, cold night air was striking Kalichenko just on the side of his head. His bladder was full. His future was murky. 
His mood was dour. There was no doubt in Kalachenko's mind, well, no real doubt, that he wanted to go through with marrying Raya, even less that he wanted the child she was carrying. Of course one should have a son. But his stomach churned with fear. Perhaps there was a way to have Raya checked for radiation. As for himself, the little bruises on his elbow, got when he fell as he fled the exploding reactor, no longer seemed very convincing even to him, especially since Raya had given his sling away. The sling, of course, was no more than camouflage, simply circumstantial evidence to add credibility to the story he was planning to tell. But Kalichenko was aware he would need all the help he could get when questions were asked. And sooner or later, questions surely would be asked. Kalichenko groaned, stifling it so Raya would not hear, and tried to settle himself again for sleep. But the bus seemed to be slowing down, even stopping. It came to a dead halt, then lurched slowly forward again. Kalichenko tried to raise himself to see ahead. There were lights in the road. Someone was shouting directions. The bus crept forward, then turned into a space on the side of the highway, and came to a complete stop. The passengers began to stir. The overhead lights on the bus came on and the door opened. Up ahead there was a muttered colloquy between the driver, the soldier who had gotten on with them, and someone from outside. Then the soldier stood up. Everybody is to get out here, he cried, his voice hoarse with sleep and fatigue. Leave your belongings on the bus. Now please hurry up. It had not, after all, been altogether a good idea to sit at the back of the bus, for it took them forever to get out. Emptying the bus was a complicated logistical problem. First the people in the front seats had to stand up and lift some of the things from the aisles onto the seats they had vacated before those in the next row could move into the aisle. The process had to be repeated row by row, the whole length of the bus, before it came to Kalichenko's and Raya's turn. There was no way to speed the process. All they could do was peer out the windows. They could see that they were in what seemed to be an agricultural station of some kind. There were other buses there, a dozen of them or more, and people milling around under bright lights. As they limped forward and stiffly disembarked, the soldier was calling, Please, everybody, listen. Remember your bus number. Bus number 828. 828. Remember. When the bus number is called, follow instructions. And especially when it's time to go, make sure you get back on bus 828. For it is my ass if you aren't. An old woman chided him. Is that a way to speak, a Soviet army soldier? Would your mother like to hear such talk? I'm sorry, Kornov said, abashed. But please, bus 828, don't forget. Men were drifting to the right, back down the road they had traveled, women to the left. Kalichenko went far enough to avoid the messes those before him had made, and then relieved his bladder at the side of the road, stretching and shivering in the cold night air. One by one, the buses were pulling up to a gasoline truck for refueling, then returning to their parking spaces while the drivers hurried to take care of their own needs. They closed the doors behind them. Soldiers, other soldiers, with the green flashes of the internal army, were keeping everyone but the drivers away. Still other soldiers were clustered around a pair of wooden tables, with people lined up before them, and from the back of a truck, dirty, tired komsomols were serving some kind of food. Well, at least that was something. Kalichenko looked around for Raya, and when she returned from her own necessities along the southward stretch of the road, they lined up to get what was offered. The Komsomols looked both exhausted and keyed up as they dished out bread, sausages, and strong tea. I wonder where we are, said Kalichenko as they found a low wall to sit on while they ate. A woman said it is a place called Sadolyets, Raya told him, raising her voice to be heard. It was a noisy place to be, with bus motors grumbling and racing as new ones arrived and old ones left. South of Kiev, we've come a long way. She was gazing at the mother from the bus who, her back modestly turned, was nursing her baby. I hope we're nearly there, Raya fretted. It's not good for the child, being up so late in this night air. It's not too good for me either, Kalichenka grumbled, but softly. And then their bus number was called, and they lined up one more time, under the bright lights, 
Before the tables where an army colonel was standing, scowling, smoking a cigarette while two lieutenants were, wonder of wonders, giving away money. When he reached the head of the line, Kolichenko displayed his passport. The lieutenant painstakingly copied his name onto a long list and then carefully counted out twenty new ten-ruble notes into Kolichenko's hand. For what? Kolichenko asked, astonished. For you, said the lieutenant, to help you get settled in your new home. A gift from the peoples of the Soviet Union. Now move along quickly. There are others behind you. Kolichenko counted over the notes, frowning. He followed Raya to where the passengers from bus number 828 were now ordered to assemble. The soldier from Pripyat was standing there at the closed bus door, a mug of tea in his hand. He looked more cheerful than before, and he nodded to Kolichenko. Now all of you listen, he ordered. When you get back on the bus, be sensible. The ones in the last rows go first. Take the same seats you had before. Otherwise it will simply be a disorderly mess, and... Then he fell silent as an army captain came up with a clipboard. Reboard now he ordered in a weary voice, punching at the door until it opened. Just a few more hours, comrades. Then you'll be in your new homes. Where? He looked at the clipboard. This is bus number 828? Well, you've got a trip still ahead of you. It's a place called Yuzhevyan. 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 Chapter 16 Sunday, April 27th Radiation kills the cells of living things by spoiling the way the cells grow. And so it is the fastest growing parts of the human body that suffer the most. The lining of the mouth and the digestive tract are quickly damaged. But it is the bone marrow that is most at risk. The marrow of the bones is where the blood cells are manufactured, thousands at a time, to replace those that are always being lost in the body's normal wear and tear. When the bone marrow is damaged by radiation, blood counts drop. The blood loses its ability to fight off infection, to carry oxygen from the lungs, even to clot. It does not much matter whether the harmful radiation comes from nuclear war, from a natural source, or from something like Chernobyl. What matters is how much radiation is received. There are many ways of measuring the damage caused by radiation, but the handiest unit is called the RAD, which is short for Radiation Absorbed Dose. In technical terms, one RAD is defined as that amount of ionizing radiation that deposits 100 ergs of energy in each gram of exposed biological tissue. The number of RADs tells the story. A person who has received no more than 150 RADs is likely to recover completely. Around 300 RADs, his life is in balance. But blood transfusions, antibiotics, and the best of nursing care should pull him through. 500 rads and over means that the bone marrow is destroyed, and without bone marrow, no one can live for long. In the swaying, jolting ambulance en route to hospital number 18 in Kiev, Tamara Sheronchuk wished she had ironed fewer of her husband's shirts and taken more time to look at his books. Perhaps there would have been something in them about these rads and rentkins. She knew very well that such dose numbers were very important. The experts from Moscow's Hospital No. 6 had explained that to all of the Pripyat and Chernobyl doctors in that quick twenty-minute briefing that was all anyone had time for that weekend. Unfortunately, she didn't really know what they meant. Even more unfortunately, the casualties who came to her medic point didn't wear numbers. Some of them didn't wear much of anything at all. Before they got to the medics, they went through radiometric screening. As often as not, the counters squealed the alarm as they sniffed the garments, and then their contaminated outer clothing was taken away from them and added to the heap of condemned goods. They were lucky if they got a smock or a bathrobe from the dwindling stores to cover their underwear. They were luckier still if it was only their clothes that made the detectors squeal. And even the ones who had swallowed or inhaled radioactive material were not as frustrating as those who had merely been exposed to intense radiation. They were the hardest ones to diagnose. There wasn't any visible wound. They were weak. They felt nauseated. They vomited unpredictably. Yes, very well, those were precisely the early symptoms of radiation sickness. 
They were also the symptoms of shock or overexertion or a hundred other things, even simple fatigue. And certainly every human being working to control the damage from the accident had every right to a great deal of fatigue, including Tamata Sheranchuk herself. So what Tamata had been doing, before she was ordered onto an ambulance to accompany four of the seriously wounded to Hospital No. 18 in Kiev, were the simple medical things she had always done for injured people. Poultice and debris, sew and dress. It was not enough. There wasn't really room for four patients in the ambulance, much less for Tamata herself, and the stands that held the plasma and antibiotics that trickled into the bloodstream of two of the patients. There were not enough clamps for so many stands, and so, as the ambulance swayed, Tamata had to have one hand to steady a glucose drip and another to catch a stand of saline solution that was about to topple, and none at all to keep herself from bouncing about. These particular patients had, at least were thought to have had, only light doses of radiation, if any at all. Three of them were seriously burned. Unfortunately, only one of the three was unconscious. The other two could not help moaning and crying out as the ambulance lurched and Tomato fought to stay awake and steady the IV stands. There was a nasty smell in the ambulance, part vomit and part smoke, and part what really smelled most of all like burned meat. The fourth patient was a woman with chest pains, perhaps the beginning of a heart attack. She was elderly and conscious. She lay there without speaking, watching Tamara as she tried to deal with the others. When Tamara sat back for a moment, brushing hair out of her eyes and wishing she dared close them for a moment, the woman spoke. I've seen you before, she said, and when Tamara identified herself, nodded. Yes, to be sure. Don't you remember me? I'm Poroska Kandiba, Deputy Director Smin's secretary. Of course, said Tamara, letting go of the saline stand to reach for her chart. Yes, and they've given you heparin and nitroglycerin. How are you feeling? A headache. Nothing more now. Yes, that is from the nitroglycerin. It is unpleasant, but it's better if I don't give you anything for it until you reach the hospital. I don't want anything. The woman added apologetically, I know it was very foolish of me to try to help out at my age, but in such a terrible thing. Tomorrow saw that the secretary was weeping. Yes, certainly it had been very foolish. Paraska Kondliba had been near the plant all day, begging for the chance to get into the administration block to rescue her boss's papers. And what was the importance of that? But all Tamara said was, It was very brave of you. Paraska raised her head to stare at the doctor. Brave, but not sensible. And Deputy Director Smin is also not sensible. He is not a young man. And yet I saw him in and out of the plant, right with the firemen, until they sent him off to the hospital in Moscow. Oh, he didn't want to go, I can tell you. No, of course not, Tamara soothed, letting go of the chart to rescue the toppling saline stand again. Tell me, Paraska, she ventured, did you by any chance see my husband today? But Paraska Kandiba only shook her head and continued weeping. It was obvious that her tears and her concern were all for Deputy Director Simeon Smin. When they reached Hospital No. 18 in the city of Kiev, Tamara Sheranchuk dragged herself out of the ambulance for the transfer of the patients. She wasn't needed. She stood aside while the hospital's own orderlies took over, efficiently unloading the patients and wheeling them into the receiving room. She was looking forward to the ride back, it would be nearly two hours, two hours in which she could stretch out in the ambulance and sleep. She leaned against the door of the ambulance, dreaming of that wonderful two-hour trip, when she realized the driver had poked her and said, Look at them. Tamara blinked. Look at what? Those people. Look, they're acting as if nothing had happened. It was true. She gazed around the streets of Kiev wonderingly. Here in Kiev, at least, it was, after all, a peaceful Sunday afternoon. People were strolling the wide streets. Children were laughing as they played. A few early blossoms were on the chestnut trees. The bright posters were everywhere for the May Day celebration. How incredible, Tamara marveled, 
that all these people could be going about their normal lives, unaware of the hell that was raging less than 150 kilometers away. They're lucky, grumbled the ambulance driver, and Tamara shook her head. Not really, she said. No one is very lucky today. They simply have not yet found it out. Are we through here? Then let's go back to Chernobyl. As the ambulance driver, who had had no more sleep than Tamara, wearily started to turn the vehicle around, a man came running out begging for a lift. He explained that he was a doctor trained in radiation sickness, called in from his weekend for the emergency. Tamara made herself stay awake. Here was a chance to learn something useful. She asked him about the numbers. Yes, exactly, he said. Above 500 rads, the only hope is to somehow give them living bone marrow. And how is that done? Fetal liver transplants, he said. In some places, they actually transplant bone marrow. This is done in America sometimes. But there are great problems. First of all, the patient's own bone marrow must be destroyed. Otherwise, the transplant will be rejected. Then there must be an exact typing match. And it is not easy to type bone marrow. And if that is wrong, the transplant will still be rejected. Of course, that itself is serious. A patient who might otherwise recover could be killed by the rejection process. And what is the fetal liver procedure? In the embryo, he said, it is the liver cells that perform the functions of the adult bone marrow in manufacturing blood cells. So from aborted fetuses we extract the liver, purify the cells, and inject them into the patient. He hesitated. That, too, has a poor success rate, he admitted. But for patients with more than 500 rads, there is, after all, no choice. Ah, yes, said Tamara. But how do you know what the exposure has been, since not all the victims are thoughtful enough to carry dosimeters? The young specialist said enthusiastically, That is the key, of course. The doctor in hospital number six in Moscow, where I trained, has developed a procedure. We take blood counts at two-hour intervals and compare them with the standard profile. We can see how rapidly the cells deteriorate, and from that we can determine what the exposure has been. But by then Tamara was asleep beside him. Tamara had almost allowed herself to hope that by the time she got back, the fire would be under control, the emergency over. But it seemed it was worse than ever. Pripyat had been evacuated. And where had her son Boris gone? The ambulance was sent on to Chernobyl town, 30 kilometers away from the reactor. It was, it seemed, as near as was really safe. And so now there was talk that everyone, everyone within that 30-kilometer radius of the plant, was to be ordered away. And where would they find places for all these people to stay? There were a dozen villages and nearly 30 collective farms in the area. Where would they all go? It was not just the people now. Half the farms in the area raised livestock, cattle mostly, but any number of sheep, pigs, goats, even a few horses. Many of the animals came from the Kalhozists' private ventures, which made their owners doubly desperate to save them. As they circled around the town of Pripyat and the stricken plant, Tamara looked longingly out of the back of the ambulance. Sharanshuk was there, doing, Tamara was sure, something doggedly heroic and certainly dangerous. If only she could take him and Boris and run away. It did not occur to her that this was almost the first time she had been separated from her husband when her principal worry had not been that he might be with another woman. When they reached the town of Chernobyl, they were directed to the bus station. There Tamara Sheranchuk set up shop. But she had no more than entered the room set aside for the medics than her boss, the chief of surgery from the Pripyat Clinic, wrinkled her nose and scowled. When did you change your clothes last? she barked. Go at once. Shower. Eat something. Get cleaned up. Don't come back for one hour. But there are so many patients. There are plenty of doctors now, too, said the elder woman. Go now. And indeed, when Tamara came back in a clean white gown, her hair still damp but pulled neatly to the back of her head, there were four strange doctors taking their turns with the influx. Two were from Kursk, one from Kiev. The dark, small, oriental-looking woman all the way from Volgograd. But they must have emptied out every hospital in the Soviet Union, said Tamara. The woman from Volgograd said, No, the hospitals are all fully staffed. It is people like us who are off duty. 
Now we give up our Sunday to come here to help. And are the people in Volgograd so concerned about an explosion in the Ukraine? The people in Volgograd know nothing about an explosion in the Ukraine. Neither did I. I was simply told to report to the airport at nine this morning. Some do you know, and here I am. What is holding up the line? Send in the next patient. Even the patients were easier to deal with here. Triage had already been done. Again, by teams of fresh doctors brought in from everywhere, taking their turns at the medic point in the Chernobyl town bus station. The seriously injured ones had already been sorted out and sent off to hospitals elsewhere. The ones that were coming through were lightly injured, or not injured at all. For most of them, all Tamara had to do was a quick physical check. The eyes, the pulse, the blood pressure, the inside of the mouth. A quick questioning about symptoms and a few cc's of blood drawn for a lab somewhere to make a count. Then she passed them on. Most of them went directly onto buses or trains. For those who were able to travel were counted at once as evacuees. Mother, said a voice from the next queue, and when she looked up from her patient, she saw that it was a young boy. His face was filthy, and he wore an outsized army blouse, not his own. It took a moment for her to realize that it was her son. Baris, are you all right? I think so. Only they are sending all the Komsomols away now. And quite time for it, too. But where are you going? she demanded. Oh, to a summer camp, mother. A good one. Maybe Artek, down in the Black Sea. And oh, mother, he said joyfully, it isn't going to cost us a kopeck. Chapter 17 Sunday, April 27th Smoke does not last very long in the air. What makes a column of smoke visible are the tiny particles of soot and other things that it contains, and they are transitory. The larger particles fall fairly quickly to the ground. The others fall more slowly, or are washed out of the air by rain. And in any case, diluted by the air they float in, quite soon they can no longer be seen. The gases that go with the smoke, however, remain. In the gases from the nuclear accident are many which are invisible but not undetectable. Chemical analysis will spot them readily. But if it took a laboratory to detect them, they would not cause much concern. Unfortunately, they announce themselves in a different and much more alarming way. That is by the radiation they give off. The first person to observe anything amiss in the air about him was a Finnish soldier. There was no smoke left by the time the Chernobyl cloud reached the Finnish border, so he saw nothing. His instruments told the story. The soldier's duty was to supervise a radiation detection station on the border between Finland and the USSR, and what his instruments noticed was a small but unexplained increase in the normal background radiation. The soldier reported it at once to his superiors, of course. They puzzled worriedly over the information, but for the time being, they decided to keep it to themselves. There was a political problem they had to take into account. Finland is not part of the Warsaw Pact, but all the same, Finnish leaders have learned a good deal of discretion. It was possible, they thought, that the radiation came from an unannounced Soviet nuclear bomb test. Disturbing reports about nuclear events in their Soviet neighbor are not broadcast indiscriminately in Finland. Finland, however, was not the only foreign country to discover that there was something wrong with the air on that otherwise peaceful Sunday in April. It was only the first of them. At two o'clock that afternoon, in the Swedish nuclear power plant at Forsmark, a worker coming off shift went through a radiation scan. The test was pure routine, but the results were not. The man's shoes were radioactive. Sweden does not take the discovery of unexplained radioactivity lightly. There is a powerful anti-nuclear movement among the Swedish people. Everything that happens at an atomic power plant is scrutinized at every step with great care. So this information was reported on the nationwide alert network at once. It caused immediate concern, multiplied when other stations reported that their air, too, was unexpectedly as radioactive as after a nearby bomb test, or even after a real bomb. The first thought, after they decided that the Swedish plants themselves were innocent, was a terrifying one. Most of Scandinavia's air comes from the west and south. 
It is for that reason that the smoke from England's factories kills Swedish lakes. The British got rid of their pea soup fogs with huge stacks that export the pollution to Scandinavia. So their first thought was that the source of the radiation was in the United Kingdom. Was it possible that England had suffered a nuclear attack? But the English radio stations were still prattling away. Alternatively, could the English, the Germans, or the Dutch have, totally unexpectedly, set off a nuclear bomb test? Then meteorologists traced the recent movements of the air masses over Sweden and informed the nuclear authorities that the patterns were a bit unusual. It was not from the west that the radioactive cloud came. Untypically, the most recent incoming air had originated to the south and east. It had come from the Soviet Union. The Swedes are as conscious of their Soviet neighbor as the Finns, but less careful about Soviet sensibilities. They saw no reason to keep the matter secret. The news services were informed. The report made instant headlines. In an hour, most of the world knew that something big and nuclear had happened in the USSR. Almost all of the world, in fact, except for the USSR itself. Chapter 18 Monday, April 28th The Embassy of the United States of America in Moscow is on the Ring Boulevard in the section of the boulevard named after the composer Tchaikovsky. The embassy isn't a single building. It is a collection of several structures, linked together in a ramshackle red brick compound. At every entrance to the compound, a couple of uniformed KGB guards loiter, smoking cigarettes and chatting to each other, until someone approaches. Then they interpose themselves in front of the door and request U.S. passports or hotel cards. When the documents are found to be in order, the KGB guards then say, or the more polite ones say, Pajalsta, which means please. And perhaps they even touch the visors of their caps as they step out of the way. There have been times when they have been less polite and a very great deal more energetic, especially when, as has now and then happened, some desperate Soviet citizen has tried to hurl himself past them to sanctuary. Really, the American embassy in Moscow is a slum. It should have been abandoned at least a dozen years ago. But the chilly state of U.S.-Soviet relations has caused endless bickering and delays over every detail. And so plans for the splendid modern new embassy building have remained incomplete. Its best feature is its cafeteria. There the American staff can get the only authentic hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes to be found anywhere in Moscow. Its worst feature may well be that of its scores of drivers, telephone operators, translators, kitchen workers, and cleaners. Almost all are locally employed Soviet nationals, and nearly every one of those is known to have a second career, or really a first one, as an officer in the KGB. Warner Borden, the assistant science attaché at the embassy, was yelling at Emmeline Branford, the press and cultural affairs officer, about the fact that the astonishing news was coming in over the open teletypes. Keep the nationals out, he said angrily meaning the translator and the cleaning man. Emmeline Branford looked at him in astonishment. But all we've got here is the open news services, Warner. There isn't anything secret about it. Lowering his voice, Borden hissed, Sometimes we talk in here, don't we? Keep him out till I come back. Are you going to check the code room? Emmeline asked, and Borden gave her a mock frown. See what I mean? he asked, and then... I'm gone. Emmeline sighed as he dashed off toward the secure teletypes in another part of the embassy, with their marine guard always at the door. At least, she reflected, he hadn't patted her bottom this time. Across the narrow hall, her translator, Rima, was bent over her morning pravda, meticulously putting a story about fisheries production goals in the Baltic Sea into her careful English. Rima had a last name, it was Solovyova, but for most of the American embassy staff, most of the Russians had only one name, like plantation hands in Old Dixie. For Emmeline, a black woman, some of whose ancestors had been named Cuffy, Napoleon, or Jezebel, the practice was unpleasing, but the Russians themselves seemed to prefer it that way. Perhaps that was because they didn't enjoy American attempts to pronounce names like Solovyova. Emmeline stopped beside her and said, Look, Rima, we'd better do what he says. Rima said, looking down at her desk, 
It is no problem, Emmeline. If the Russian woman had any interest in this nuclear radiation flat that was burning up the teletypes, she was keeping it to herself. Emmeline tarried for a moment, thinking. She wanted to ask Rima Solovyova if there were anything at all improved about unexplained radioactive emissions. But she already knew there was not. Emmeline herself had already scanned the paper. Although her command of Russian was still a long way from easy, she would not have missed a story like that. Not even in, or actually especially not in, the short paragraphs on an inside page where any kind of bad news was usually to be found. Of course Rima could not have missed hearing something about what was going on. There had been plenty of talk in the teletype room, just as Borden had said. The simplest thing would be to come out and ask her what she'd heard and what she thought. But nothing was that simple in the relations with Soviet nationals. The relations between Emmeline and her translator were friendly enough. Certainly they did friendly things. Emmeline saw no harm in an occasional gift to Rima of a box of American tampons or a shopping bag advertising Macy's or Marshall Fields. And Rima was helpful beyond the call of duty in locating off the books painters, plumbers, and carpenters, and supplying Emmeline with home-makeable recipes to replace the things that even the hard currency stores always seemed to be out of. Roach spray, for instance. Still, Emmeline had not been stationed in Moscow long enough for them to become anything like close enough to bring up politically embarrassing subjects. While she was debating whether or not to try it anyway, Irina Solovyova looked up, her face drawn. Is it possible that I could be excused for an hour, she asked. I do not feel well. Oh, is there anything I can do? Simply that I could lie down for a bit, the translator said apologetically. One hour at the most, then I will be all right. Of course, said Emmeline, and watched the woman put a paperweight on her translation, pick up her imitation leather pocketbook, and depart. Rima didn't look back. Emmeline listened to her modish heels clatter down the narrow staircase until the bang of the outside door informed her that Rima hadn't gone to the little lady's room on the ground floor, but outside the building. It had been Emmeline's assumption that the Russian woman was having the onset of her period. Now she revised it. More likely she was going somewhere outside to make a telephone call, perhaps to ask for instructions on what to do in the light of the unexpected news. Emmeline sighed and remembered the cleaning man. Practicing her Russian, she said, Andre, can you finish this later on, please? After lunch would be good. And went back to the teletype room to see what else was coming in. What else was coming in was scores on yesterday's National League baseball games. Montreal at the Cubs, the Mets at St. Louis. Emmeline waited a moment to see what the Atlanta Braves had done, but it seemed they'd been rained out. She went back to her own desk and opened the folder on the American jazz pianist who was being brought in to tour Moscow, Leningrad, and Volgograd, and the novelist who had a special invitation from the Union of Soviet Writers to follow. Her heart wasn't in it. Clouds of radioactive material coming from the USSR was big news. Emmeline's first thought, of course, had been the same as everybody else's, namely that the Russians were sneaking in a nuclear test in spite of their self-imposed moratorium. But that made so little sense. The United States was going on with testing whenever it chose. There was nothing to prevent the Soviets from doing the same, except if they were stupid enough to lie about it in which case whatever propaganda benefits they had gained from their moratorium would be more than wiped out by the deceit. Then there was the possibility of an accident of some kind. Warner Borden had told her all about the mysterious Kirstein event more than 25 years earlier. It seemed that the Soviets had been storing radioactive wastes in Siberia, near the town of Kirstein, and somehow carelessness had allowed some of them to flow together, reaching critical mass. It had never occurred to Emmeline Branford that waste could turn itself into a little atomic bomb, but Borden assured her that that was the best explanation for the... the whatever it was that had poisoned hundreds of square kilometers of the Siberian landscape, caused the abandonment of a dozen villages and any number of collective farms, poisoned lakes and rivers, and even changed the Soviet maps. Of course the Soviets had staunchly denied that anything of the sort had happened, but of course they would. So when Warner Borden called for her to join him again at the teletypes and said, I talked to one of the Swedes, they fingerprinted the cloud, and it definitely was not a nuclear test. 
Her first response was, something like Kishtim again. No, no, nothing like that. Not a nuclear weapons plant either. Although for a minute I thought that might be it. But the wrong elements were in the gases, according to the Swedes. It's... He looked around and closed the door. It's got to be an accident in a nuclear power plant. It could even be a meltdown. Oh, my God, said Emmeline, thinking of the movie The China Syndrome. But if there were that kind of an explosion, it wouldn't have to be a big explosion. Anyway, that's what the Swedes are saying. They've tested the cloud, and the proportions of radioactive materials match what the Russians would have if a power plant blew up. He was studying the teletypes eagerly, but all they were producing now were weather reports. I've checked the maps, he said. There are two nuclear power plants up on the Baltic. It has to be one of them, maybe both of them. Two power plants blowing up at once. He grinned at her. He seemed almost happy. What are you, one of those no-nuke nuts? These are Russian plants. You have to expect they'll blow up now and then. He leaned cozily over the teletype next to Emmeline, one hand negligently resting on her hip. She moved patiently away, not willing for a fight just then. Why were white Georgia boys so often turned on by a black skin? I'd better get back to work, she said, and return to her office. Rima was back, diligently working away on letters in her own room. She didn't look up. Emmeline paused at the window by her desk, looking out on the broad, traffic-filled Tchaikovsky Boulevard. Didn't those people know that their power plants were blowing up? Shouldn't someone tell them? She sighed and sat down. And there on her desk was an opened copy of a magazine. She had not left it there. She picked it up and discovered it was something called Literaturna Ukraina, Emmeline's Russian was more or less adequate, or at least as good as anyone else's after taking the crash foreign service course. But this magazine was not published in the Russian language. It was in Ukrainian. Most of the words were nearly the same, but with distinctively Ukrainian twists. Emmeline frowned. The article seemed to be about deficiencies in a nuclear power plant, but it wasn't about a plant located on the Baltic. She looked across the hall at Rima Solovyova, but the translator did not look up. Emmeline thought of asking Rima if she had put the magazine there, but if she intended to say so, she would have done it already. But why was Rima, or someone, giving her an article about a place called Chernobyl? Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Chapter 19. Monday, April 28th. Vremya, the nine o'clock television news broadcast, is a Soviet institution. It is watched by tens of millions of people every night, but not very attentively. Generally, it is what would be called in America a talking head show. The real news is read by a man at a desk, briefly and unemotionally, and there is not a great deal of it. The only film clips are generally of collective farmers bringing in a record harvest, or shipyards launching a new icebreaker. Russians joke that one can always tell when the news comes on, because one hears through the thin apartment walls the sounds of neighbors walking about and flushing their toilets as they leave the television set after the night's film or sports event or concert. In just that way, when the news came on that Monday night, Igor Dichuk got up to go to the kitchen for a cold drink of mineral water from the refrigerator, and Oksana would no doubt have done the same if she had not been occupied in finishing the last draw of her knitting. The ballet on television that night had been the Bolshoi Company itself, in a production called The Streets of Paris. Nothing like La Boheme or Gaieté Parisienne, but a sober, stirring dance drama about the French commune of two centuries before. But the dancing was beautiful, Oksana said to her husband as he returned. Of course, he said with pride. The Bolshoi was a Russian company, not Ukrainian, but Zidchuk considered himself a truly internationalist Soviet man. In his view, the Bolshoi troop was Soviet, and one day, just possibly, their own daughter Leah, already getting solo parts in the dance academy where she attended school for two days of each week, might well be the Plisetskaya of the year 2000. Leah was nine, and already sound asleep in her room, actually just an extension of the flat central hall. Oksana's parents were rustling around the living dining area, which was also their bedroom, and it was, after all, time to go to sleep. 
Dietschuk paused to glance at the news broadcast when his wife said, Yura, did I tell you? That Bornitz boy came in today with a temperature of 38. Can you imagine? No, you didn't mention it, he said. And when I made him go to the clinic, he came back with a note saying that the doctor was not in today, called away on some emergency. I suppose, said Dietrich amiably, that she is getting ready for May Day, like everyone else. What did you do? What could I do? I couldn't send him home. His parents would both be at work. So I made him lie down in the teacher's lounge. But really, Yura, that isn't fair to the other teachers. And suppose I brought home some virus to our own family. You look healthy enough to me, he said. Well, let's go to bed. And he was reaching out for the knob on the television set when the announcer put down one sheet of paper, picked up another, and read without change of expression, There has been an accident at the Chernobyl power plant in the Ukraine. People have been injured, and steps are being taken to restore the situation to normal. There is a conversion table that Soviet people apply to government announcements of bad news. If the news is never broadcast but only a subject of rumor, then it is bad but bearable. If the event is publicly described as minor, then it is serious. And if there is no measure assigned to it at all, then it calls for resorting to the voices. The only radio the Dietschuks owned was not in the kitchen with the television set. It was in the other room where the grandparents were preparing for bed. Dietschuk knocked on the door and excused himself. The radio, he said. I think we should listen for a moment. At this hour, his mother-in-law demanded. But when she heard about the news announcement, she said, Yes, I understand now. That Mrs. Smin Saturday morning, it was clear that she was concealing something. But please, not too loud for the voices. Dietschuk didn't need to be told that. He turned on the other quarter 314 radio, the size of a baby's coffin, and waited patiently for the tubes to warm up. The volume he set only to a whisper. It is not exactly illegal to listen to the voice of America and the other foreign broadcasts beamed into the USSR, but it is not something most citizens want to advertise. There did not seem to be anything coming in from abroad in Russian, and most of the other foreign stations, of course, were jammed. All they could find was the broadcast from France. That, for reasons no one had ever explained, was almost never jammed. But it was also in French, and none of the Dichuks spoke that language. But even they were able to pick a few phrases out of the rapid-fire announcements, and those included deux mille de morts and un catastrophe totale. But the Chernobyl power plant is more than a hundred kilometers away, Oksana protested, her face pale. Yes, that's true, her husband agreed somberly. We are very fortunate to be so far. They say that radiation can be very dangerous, not only at once, but over a period of many years. Cancers, birth defects, in children, leukemia. And they looked at each other, and then into the hall, where Leah lay peacefully asleep, with her head on her fist and her lips gently smiling. Lips gently smiling. Chapter 20 Tuesday, April 29th The control point for fighting the disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear power station is no longer at the collective farm. There are far too many people now to be held in a farm village, and so it has been moved to the town of Chernobyl itself, 30 kilometers away. The evacuation of the town of Pripyat has been expanded to include every community within that 30-kilometer ring. Where more than 100,000 people lived 72 hours earlier, there is now no living person except firefighters, emergency workers, and medics. Two squadrons of heavy-lift Soviet Air Force helicopters have joined the damage control forces, and day and night they load up sandbags and nets filled with bars of metal, take them on the five-minute flight to the reactor, dump them into the white-hot glow, and return for another load. The helicopter cabins have been lined with sheets of lead, which seriously cuts down the loads they can carry, and their pilots are working 12-hour days. The crews battling the accident on the ground are allowed only three two-hour shifts out of the 24. Even so, each man is stuck twice a day to yield a blood sample so his white corpuscles can be counted. And when the count is down, he is out of business entirely. 
Sharanchuk understood the reason for the two-hour shifts perfectly. But no one told him what to do in the six-hour stretches when he was forbidden entry to the zone. What he did mostly was try to sleep. When that failed, he ate and smoked feverishly and made a nuisance of himself. He knew that he was being a nuisance because he had been told so when he visited the Chernobyl town hospital to see how his wife was getting along. Well enough, my dear, she told him, but really we're very busy here. And when he tried to call the hospital in far-off Moscow to check on Deputy Director Smin, his condition is being carefully monitored. He is conscious, and please don't tie up our telephone lines at this time. He couldn't help it. He missed Smin. All these new experts and volunteers from all over the USSR were well enough, but after all, the graphite core was still burning, was it not? He was pacing back and forth, scowling at the distant smoke on the horizon, when the armored personnel carrier pulled up outside the Chernobyl town bus station. He jumped in to join the fourteen others ready to take their turns. It was a half-hour ride to the plant, and none of them spoke much. On the way, they all pulled on their radiation coveralls, checked one another's dosimeters, made sure the hoods were fastened. As soon as the personnel carrier came to a stop, Sheranchuk trotted right to the closed-circuit water system to check the board and gauge pressure readings. Overhead, he heard the choppers flutter in and swoop away. One came in just overhead. It looked like an airborne whale, with a rotor on top and the revolving flukes of the tail assembly. He could see someone kicking a bag of something, sand no doubt, out of the door. Then he was at the pipes, and he didn't look up at the helicopters again, not even when he felt a rustly patter of dust on his helmet and knew that one of the bags had come apart as it was dropped. It was only loose sand, after all. If he had been hit by one of the bags or by one of the falling sacks of lead shot, he would not need to look up. He would be dead, as it happened already to at least one of the firemen whose work kept them closer to the drop point. That was the good part of Sheranchuk's immediate task, which was to free the great water valves to the steam system. They were in a sheltered location that kept him out of the direct range of the helicopter dumps, the bad part of the job was that the valves didn't want to be freed. The electric motors that were meant to drive them had shorted and burned themselves out when applied because something inside the valves was jammed. The control wheels outside failed to move the giant leaves within. When Sheranchuk reached the scene, he saw that his relief crews had tried a different tack. They had drained the system of cooling water from the pond in order to attack the valves with crowbars, but that hadn't worked either because the steam system had run so hot that there was little liquid water in the pipes. It was now nearly steam all the way through. No one could work in that heat, and so they had to open the dikes and let the cooling water in again. By the time Sheranchuk got back with the new crew, the action had shifted to the external valve wheels again. Sheranchuk saw that the previous shift chief had rigged up a system of crowbars interlocked in the wheels, and the crew was trying doggedly to move the valves with the added leverage. Sheranchuk saw at once that it was risky. The great danger was not only that it probably wouldn't work, but that if too much force were applied, it might merely snap the shaft, sturdy forged steel though it was. So when Sheranchuk took over, he urged the crew to be gentle. No battering ram stuff now. A steady push. Go. Keep it going. All your weight. And when that effort accomplished nothing, he tried backing the wheel off a little for another attempt. It almost worked. The wheel moved, grudgingly, a few centimeters of a revolution. And back and forth, back and forth, they kept up the hard work, sweating inside their coveralls, in the noise of the helicopters overhead, and the rattle of dropped sand and metal bars, and the rumble of fire pumps and the hoarse cries of the men. Sheranchuk was astonished when someone laid a hand on his shoulder, he blinked up at his relief. Had two hours gone by already? And what had been accomplished? He knew the answer to that one anyway. At least now they were no longer alone. It wasn't just the forces of the Chernobyl power station that were fighting the accident. Not even just those of the region or of the whole Ukraine. Help came in from everywhere, by every means possible. By road, convoys of trucks pounded toward Chernobyl from every quarter of the compass. By air, there were planes to the little field outside the town of Chernobyl and helicopters besides. Barges came into the port at Chernobyl town. Trains chugged into the Yanov railroad station. 
And these were not just ordinary goods trains, with a packet or two for the firefighters. They were dedicated trains, their cargoes reloaded into expendable flat cars at the edge of the evacuated zone, and pulled back to the plant itself by locomotives that would never leave. Doctors, firemen, engineers, militiamen, soldiers. Half the Soviet Union seemed to be descending on the Chernobyl power station in its agony. It was a truly impressive effort. The only question in Sheronchuk's mind was whether it was going to be enough. They were ordered to shower without fail every time they came in off duty, and as often as possible in between times, just to make sure. As soon as Sheronchuk was out of his protective clothing and had allowed another few drops of his blood to be siphoned out, he headed for the showers, rubbing the inside of his elbow. The medics were finding it harder and harder to pick a spot on his arm not already sore from taking the blood samples. They looked tired, too. So was Sheronchuk. He pushed his way through the other tired, naked men waiting their turn and let the cold water pour over him. He soaked well, wondering what load of radioactive poison was in the water itself. But that was a useless worry. They had to shower anyway. And besides, those moments under the shower were the only ones he had to relax and think about his wife and his son. The last word from Tamara was that Boris was already on his way to a Komsomol camp on the Black Sea with twenty other young people from Pripyat. Sheronchuk took consolation in those good thoughts. At least his family was out of danger. If, thinking of the cloud of gases that blew helter-skelter across the face of the earth, anyone in Europe were out of danger, or anyone in the world. The pleasant moment had turned sour. Sheronchuk got out of the shower and dried himself in a pair of his own undershorts. Towels were among the niceties no one had yet thought to truck into the control post. He pulled on a cotton shirt and a pair of work pants and felt slippers. As dressed as he needed to be, he shuffled down the length of the improvised dormitory, past the rows of bunks, some of them with men snoring away, and the tables where other men were talking or playing cards, to a six o'clock conference. That was the bad side of the good fact that so many Soviet citizens had hurried to help. Meetings. With more than two thousand men and women deployed to fight the explosion and its consequences, the people in charge had to keep an almost constant conference to coordinate their efforts. In the meeting room there was a table with an unshaded light hanging over it, and half a dozen men were waiting for his report. He gave it quickly. The valves won't open. They're trying to force them now, but I think they'll just break. Looking around the table, Shiranchuk realized that he was now nearly the highest-ranking person left on the scene from the peacetime. He corrected himself the pre-explosion time of the Chernobyl power station. Smin was in his hospital in Moscow, fighting for his life. After the director had arrived, he had insisted on taking charge of the emergency effort just long enough to be removed from it. Where he was now was easy to guess, and the chief engineer along with him. Others were in hospital number 18 in Kiev, or evacuated with their families, or simply run away. The people around this table now were all from outside the district, from Moscow and Kiev and Novosibirsk and Kursk. Most of them wore military uniforms under their coveralls. The person chairing the meeting, however, was the civilian from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy, Istvili. He was no longer as dapper as when he first arrived, but he was still energetic as he received Cheronchuk's bad news. He did not seem surprised. He only said, the plenum has to be drained. The plenum was the reserve of water under the reactor itself, built there so that in the event of a rupture of a single tube, the steam would bubble through the plenum and cool back down to water instead of bursting the containment shell. Of course, against what had actually happened at the plant, it was useless, worse than useless, a danger. The general of fire brigade stirred restlessly. I don't see why we can't just leave it alone, he said. Because, comrade general, we don't want water down there. We want concrete. We need to isolate that entire core from the world outside, top, bottom, and sides. You're talking about work that will take months. I hope we can do it just in months. In any case, we don't know how much strength there is in the structures that hold the core. If it should fall into the plenum, it would be serious. Serious? It was already serious enough for Sheronchuk, who put in obstinately. Nevertheless, I don't think those valves will open. 
Istvini nodded. Then what do you propose? Attack it from another direction, Sheronchuk said, throwing his cigarette on the floor to free his hands. Here, let me show you. He quickly sketched the outlines of the ruined reactor and the water-filled chamber below it. If we cut into the tank from another side, we can pump it dry. Here, where it approaches the plenum for reactor number three. Pump that one out. Then people can get in to cut through. Istvili studied the sketch, unsurprised. I approve. Also, I think we should try digging another shaft from here. It will be longer, but easier to cut through, perhaps. My men aren't moles, the fire general barked. We won't need your men for that, comrade general. A team of miners from the Donetsk coal fields is already on its way. Now, as to the fire in the graphite itself, the fire brigade commander said, the helicopter drops are helping. Another fifty tons of sand are needed, though, at least. Comrade Colonel? The Air Force officer rapped out, Of course. We have requested another squadron of men and machines. They should be here in the morning. With them we will continue the drops on schedule. Istvili looked at the fire brigade commander, who shrugged. If that is so, then perhaps we ought to have more volunteers to fill the sandbags. Also, my men can't get through the rubble near the reactor building. Have it bulldozed away. To be sure, comrade Istvili, the fireman said mildly. But to where? Some has already been dumped into the pond. Good God, man, Sheronchuk cried. Not the cooling pond. We poisoned enough water already. So I have said, but then where? Since no one else spoke, Sheronchuk said, There's a foundation dug for another reactor on the other side of the station. I doubt it will ever be built now. Can't you shove everything in there? Do it, said Isfidi, turning to gaze at Sheronchuk again. He asked the meeting at large, Is there anything else we need our hydrologist engineer for at this time? Sheronchuk said quickly, There is something I need the meeting for, at least. And what is that? It is simply impossible to accomplish anything in a two-hour shift a couple of times a day. I request permission to work for longer periods. How long? As long as I have to. Four hours at a time at least. Istvili drummed his fingers on the table, looking around. How are your white blood corpuscle readings, comrade Cheronchuk? Who can tell? They simply take it and go away somewhere. At least they have not told me I am in danger. Istvili nodded. Then he sighed. Permission granted, he said. Now let us see how we stand for materiel. 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 Chapter 21. Wednesday, May 1st. Except perhaps for the anniversary of the October Revolution, which occurs in November because of the changed calendar, the paramount public holiday of the Soviet Union is on the first day of May. It is called International Labor Day, or more frequently simply May Day. There is no village in the USSR so small that it does not have at least a celebration on May Day, and in the largest cities the event is an immense production. But we can't watch it on the TV, Candace Garfield told her husband reasonably, because we don't have one in this delightful little toilet you found for us. And they'll just charge us extra if we want to use the one in the living room. And it's in black and white anyway. Well, hell, hon, said her husband, also reasonably. It was only eight in the morning, and they were both still being reasonable. Who wants to watch it on TV? We might as well be home in Beverly Hills if that's all we want to do. We'll go on into town and, and walk to the subway, right? Because those buses don't ever run. They were running all right yesterday, honey. It was only like on Sunday and Monday that we couldn't find one. And today's a holiday, right? So they probably won't be running at all. Garfield opened his mouth to respond a touch less reasonably, because his own temper was beginning to run short after four days on their own in Kiev. They were saved by a knock on the door. Oh, poop, said Candace. That's Abdul for the rent. Wait a minute till I get something on. Abdul was who it was although his name was surely not Abdul. He was some sort of Arab in some sort of diplomatic post at some Arab consulate. For four straight days he had managed to avoid telling them which nation paid his salary. He was a constantly smiling, slim young man, 
no more than thirty. This time, as always, he greeted them with a cheery good morning to the both of you and an outstretched hand. As always, he took Garfield's hundred-dollar traveler's check and returned the change in rubles. He had every reason to smile, Garfield thought. The agreed-on bed and breakfast rate was sixty-five dollars American each day. The thirty-five dollars' worth of rubles Garfield got back in change were always calculated at the official rate, and Garfield was quite certain the man got his own rubles from one of the furtive young men who hung around the tourist hotels at no more than twenty-five cents apiece instead of the official rate of over a dollar and a half. Of course, they hadn't had much choice. It was not really that bad a room. In fact, it was reasonably nice, especially by Soviet standards, even though they didn't have a bath of their own. It was in a new and attractive building. They were in a sort of diplomatic ghetto. You got into it through a gate, and when you arrived in a taxi, a militiaman peered in to make sure no locals were sneaking into the place reserved for foreign residents of Kiev. There did not, unfortunately, seem to be any Americans or even English or Canadians in the compound, and their host had urged them, still smiling but very emphatically, to avoid contact with the neighbors as much as possible. He's not against Soviet law exactly, no, but still as a matter for discreetness, please. That May Day morning, though, when he had carefully paid out Garfield's twenty rubles and some odd kopecks in change, he lost the smile. Looking at them seriously, he said, "I am very sorry to bear ill tidings, but all things must end. Tomorrow must be last day of you to be here. Due to changed circumstances, I am required to leave and must close down my flat." What changed circumstances? Garfield demanded. The man only shrugged. Now come off it," barked Candace from the table. "Where are we supposed to go? You've got to let us stay here just for a couple of nights, anyway." But it isn't possible," he explained, once more smiling broadly. "Your luggage? Yes, if you like, you may leave it here until you call for it. No later than six tomorrow evening. And now I must leave at once to prepare for our May Day reception, and then we must pack for departure. My good wife will now have your breakfast ready. It has been very great pleasure to know you, really. And oh yes, for the extra hours in your room due to leaving the luggage, that will be additionally twenty-five dollars American." Breakfast was like each of the other three mornings they had spent in the diplomatic flat, with the silent, pregnant wife serving them the same soft-boiled eggs, thick slices of bread, and strong tea. Except that this time, while they were still at table, a swarthy man knocked at the door. He and the diplomat's wife talked in low voices for a while. It was not an Arabic language, Garfield thought, but almost certainly not Russian either. Then the man handed her a thick wad of currency. The woman counted it all over twice, then fished a set of car keys out of her apron pocket and gave them to the man. A moment later, the Garfields heard the sound of a car starting in the courtyard below. Through the window, Garfield saw the man driving away in Abdul's huge old canary yellow Mustang convertible. As they walked out of the compound, nodding familiarly to the cop at the gate, Garfield said, "Abdul's not going to come back here at all. He sold his car." So. Asked his wife, peering toward the avenue where there might have been, but was not a bus. So nothing said Garfield cheerfully, deciding on the spot not to press the question of what changed circumstances caused Abdul to flee with his wife. Look, there's no use trying to get a bus, and it's only about a twenty-minute walk to the metro. Next time I go anywhere with you, Cantor said grimly, I pack my Adidas. Dean. This little adventure is beginning to get boring. I think it's time to go home. Honey, you know what they said at Aeroflot: no space available to Moscow until the seventh. So are we going to sleep in the airport for the next week? Garfield winced, but when they got out of the metro station on the far side of the river, even Candace began to show signs of excitement. For one thing, it was a meltingly beautiful spring day. The city was full of roses and chestnut blossoms. And it was in a holiday mood. The streets around the Khreshchatsik were full of people getting ready to parade past the dignitaries on the stands, trade unions, schools, army detachments, government workers. Every group seemed to have a detachment of its own to strut past the great billboard of Lenin, six stories high, 
with his chin thrust resolutely forward to challenge the hostile encircling world. There seemed to be thousands of people crushing toward the route of the parade along with the Garfields. Not just marchers, but no doubt the families of people in the line of march as well. There were children carrying little flags, mothers with string bags, not on this day in the hope of finding something wonderful to buy, but only to hold picnic lunches for the children. There was a barricade at the entrance to the streets nearest the reviewing stands. The Garfields could not hope to enter the square, or even get very close to it, but they could see that it and all the surrounding streets were gay with banners and posters. The face that dominated the event belonged to V.I. Lennon, but Marx and Engels had their huge portraits, too. Candace gazed uneasily at the scores of uniformed militiamen keeping the throngs in order. I keep thinking one of them's going to ask us what we're doing here, she fretted. Garfield grinned. We're doing what everybody else is doing, right? We're watching the parade. Listen, if they were going to give us a hard time, they would have done it long ago. Yes, but I'm getting real itchy. What are we going to do tomorrow? Well, said Garfield slowly, I've been thinking about that. See, today's the holiday, right? So I bet that along about checkout time tomorrow, the hotels are going to empty out pretty fast, and probably we'll be able to get anything we want. Probably, his wife repeated flatly. What do you want from me, he demanded. All right, as soon as the parade's over, we'll go around the hotels and see if they're going to have a room. How's that? His wife only sighed. I wish I could sit down somewhere and watch this, she said. Garfield took her hand. Oh, but honey, he pleaded. How many Americans get to do anything like this? Think about the stories we're going to tell. Think about Comrade Tanya. Why, when we get back... Hey, he cried, pointing to a group of children surrounding their teacher on the far side of the barrier. Girls in cocoa dresses with sparkling white pinafores. Boys in navy blue jackets and caps. Every third child with a banner to pass to the next child in rotation as small arms grew weary. Isn't that what's-her-name? The teacher that speaks English? From Smin's party? Oksana Didshuk didn't see the Americans. Didn't even hear them calling to her or notice the little argument they had with the militiaman when they tried to cross the barricade. Oksana was busy with her class, rehearsing them in the slogans they should chant, reminding them to march in step cajoling, warning, telling them stories to keep them quiet until their turn to march. Look, she said, pointing at the contingent of tall young men in gold-braided black uniforms, swords at their sides as they swung past. Those are cadets from the Kiev Naval Academy. Someday some of you may go there. But the girls were looking at the folk dancers twirling in their bright traditional Ukrainian costumes, and most of the boys were gazing pop-eyed at the huge T-60 tank that was shuffling up the avenue toward them, a trail of smart Soviet army soldiers goose-stepping along behind. Oksana sighed, peering around to see if she could get a glimpse of her own daughter. But there were too many groups of schoolchildren, too many floats and bands and military vehicles, too many people entirely. Oksana Dzitschuk wondered if it could possibly be true that this thing at the Chernobyl power station could be dangerous even to people here in Kiev. What was one to believe? The voices had been more strident than ever that morning. The Dzitschuks had even managed to catch a few minutes of Radio Free Europe before the jammers discovered the wavelength they had switched to, and the warbling twee-wee-wee-weep had drowned it out. But what was one to do? At school the authorities had been quite firm. There is certainly no cause for panic. If any extraordinary measures are required, of course we will be informed at once. And yet the rumors grew. Twenty-five thousand dead and buried in a mass grave on the banks of the Pripyat River, one colleague had whispered. Or so he had heard one of the voices say. Almost certainly that was untrue, Oksana thought staunchly, especially considering the source. No one believed Radio Free Europe. But what a pity that they could not get the calm, trustworthy voice of the BBC. And then the signal came for their unit to begin the march. Oksana gathered up her group, and they took their places in line. What angels they were being this day! Every one of them, little as they were, unruly as sometimes they could be, marched along bravely, and as they passed the reviewing stand, each did a perfect eyes right and shouted together, 
We will defend the motherland of socialism. Her eyes were moist as they passed under the great posters of Marx, the size of the head demonstrating the immense power of the great brain that lay inside it, and of Lenin, sharp gaze ever alert to seek out those who sought refuge in the twin enemies of the working class, God and Vodka. And then at the very edge of the square was a tiny poster of Khrushchev. Oksana stole a quick look around as they passed it to see if any of her class had noticed that a new face had been added this year. None of the children seemed to, so there would be no difficult questions. Although, Oksana told herself, it was, after all, quite proper that the man who had held the city of Kiev together in those terrible days of 1941, while the Germans hammered past it on both sides, should be recognized on Kiev's May Day. One must always remember that it was Khrushchev who, years later, had insisted on adding Kiev to the short but illustrious list of the USSR's hero cities for that desperate resistance. Though, of course, at the time of that resistance, a good many Kievans, listening to the traitorous words of defeatists and saboteurs, had not been nearly as eager for their tasks as the people of Moscow and Stalingrad. Nevertheless, the delay at Kiev had cost many thousands of lives, but it served a purpose. It had slowed the Hitlerite drive toward Moscow just long enough to make it fail. And, of course, one of the little girls was tugging at her sleeve. They were out of the square now, stopped, waiting for the signal to be dismissed. Oksana said sharply, What is it, Lydia? Those people, the girl whispered. They're calling to you. And when Oksana turned, she saw the American couple waving urgently at her from behind a pair of scowling militiamen. Mrs. Ditschuk, the woman cried. Help us, please. It was nearly dark by the time Oksana Ditschuk had finished with her responsibilities and could take the Americans to the apartment house. They found Mrs. Smin and her son with Smin's old mother on the roof, waiting for the fireworks to begin. Are we ever glad to see you, grinned Dean Garfield. We got thrown out of our hotel, and we've been staying at some Arab's apartment ever since, and we're about to get thrown out of that. But he was surprised to see that Selena Smin did not seem really delighted to see them again. The expression on her face as she listened to Oksana Dzidchuk's translation of their adventures was hooded. No worse than that, worried. She was not at all the same gracious hostess who had pressed them to eat just a little more just a few days before. Selena Smin thought for a moment before she spoke. Then she watched the Garfields gravely as Oksana translated. You have heard nothing of the accident at Chernobyl. And when Garfield shook his head, she began to speak rapidly, so rapidly that Oksana could hardly keep up. It was not just that, either. Garfield saw that Oksana Dzitschuk was hearing some of this for the first time herself. As Selena Smin told of the explosion, the radioactive gases that were reported from many parts of Europe, the injuries, the evacuation of the town of Pripyat, the dead. And my own husband, she finished, is now in hospital in Moscow, perhaps gravely ill. They cannot be sure yet. Our son Vasily is to be sent to a Komsomol camp for the summer. But first, first I suppose he will accompany me. I will go to Moscow tomorrow to be with my husband. Oh, my God, whispered Candace gripping her husband's arm. Garfield said thickly, I bet that's the changed circumstances that Arab son of a bitch was talking about. But he wouldn't tell us a word. Candace wasn't listening to him, but to a quick, soft-voiced exchange between Selena and the translator that made Oksana look suddenly pale. What's she saying now? Candace demanded. Oksana hesitated. I only asked her what I should do about my own little girl, she said. She said she didn't know. Selena Smin spoke sharply again. But as for you and your husband, Oksana translated, there is only one thing to do. You must go home quickly. Mrs. Smin or her mother-in-law will arrange everything. You will fly out to Moscow or Warsaw or Bucharest in a few days, and then home. Many foreigners have already left. Vasily Smin had been listening to every word, but now he turned away. Look now, please, he said in English. The, uh, the pyrotechnicals is begun. 
Off toward the skyline of the city, rockets were blossoming over the Dnieper River, red and gold and white. Below, hidden by the buildings between, was a huger, steadier glow. That is a Soyuz spacecraft in pyrotechnicals, said Vasily, carefully rehearsing each word. We cannot view it properly because... because... He fumbled for the words, helped himself out with gestures. Because it's turned to face the city instead of us? Exactly, he said, beaming. It is turned face to the city instead of to us. I think it will be quite beautiful. Candace said gently, And what are you going to do now, Vasily? He said proudly, Tomorrow I fly to Moscow. Then he swallowed and added, It is that my father... He has a failure of the blood, and they think that out of my bones they can get something which will make him better. I'm sure it will, Candace said, pumping confidence into her voice. And then, uh, Vasily, yes, Mrs. Garfield, my husband was so distressed at your news that he forgot to mention it, but we don't have a place to live after tomorrow. So if we could leave with you. One moment, if you please. The boy talked quickly with his mother and grandmother, and then turned to the Americans, smiling happily at being able to oblige them. You will have a hotel room, of course. But there aren't any hotel rooms. What nonsense, the boy scoffed. Believe me, a room will be found. After all, my grandmother is still a Thasya Smin. Still of Tasia Smin. Still of Tasia Smin.